Seven Day Terror by R. A. Lafferty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Seven Day Terror by R. A. Lafferty. Things just vanished. It was simple. As a matter of fact, it was child's play. Is there anything you want to make disappear? Clarence Willoughby asked his mother. A sink full of dishes is all I can think of. How will you do it? I just built a disappear. All you do is cut the other end out of a beer can. Then you take two pieces of red cardboard with peepholes in the middle and fit them in the ends. You look through the peepholes and blink. Whatever you look at will disappear. Oh. But I don't know if I can make them come back. We'd better try it on something else. Dishes cost money. As always, Myra Willoughby had to admire the wisdom of her nine-year-old son. She would not have had such foresight herself. He always did. You can try it on Blanche Manor's cat outside there. Nobody will care if it disappears except Blanche Manor's. All right. He put the disappear to his eye and blinked. The cat disappeared from the sidewalk outside. His mother was interested. I wonder how it works. Do you know how it works? Yes. You take a beer can with both ends cut out and put in two pieces of cardboard. Then you blink. Never mind. Take it outside and play with it. You hadn't better make anything disappear in here till I think about this. But when he had gone, his mother was oddly disturbed. I wonder if I have a precocious child. Why, there's lots of grown people who wouldn't know how to make it disappear that would work. I wonder if Blanche Manners will miss her cat very much. Clarence went down to the plugged nickel, a pot house on the corner. Do you have anything you want to make disappear, Nokomis? Only my paunch. If I make it disappear, it'll leave a hole in you and you'll bleed to death. That's right, I would. Why don't you try it on the fire plug outside? This, in a way, was one of the happiest afternoons ever in the neighborhood. The children came from blocks around to play in the flooded streets and gutters, and if some of them drowned, and we don't say that they did drown in the flood, and brother, it was a flood. Why, you have to expect things like that. The fire engines, whoever heard of calling fire engines to put out a flood, were apparatus deep in the water. The policemen and ambulance men wandered around wet and bewildered. Resuscitator, resuscitator, anybody want a resuscitator? chanted Clarissa Willoughby. Oh, shut up, said the ambulance attendants. The comis, the barman, and the plug nickel called Clarence aside. I don't believe, just for the moment, I'd tell anybody what happened to that fire plug, he said. I won't tell if you won't tell, said Clarence. Officer Comstock was suspicious. There's only seven possible explanations. One of the seven Willoughby kids did it. I don't know how. I'd take a bulldozer to do it, and then there'd be something left of the plug. But however they did it, one of them did it. Officer Comstock had a talent for getting near the truth of dark manners. This is why he was walking a beat out here in the boondocks instead of sitting in a chair downtown. Clarissa, said Officer Comstock in a voice like thunder. Resuscitator, resuscitator, anybody want a resuscitator? Chanted Clarissa. Do you know what happened to that fire plug? Asked Officer C. I have an uncanny suspicion, as yet it is no more than that. When I am better informed, I will advise you. Clarissa was eight years old, and much given to uncanny suspicions. Clementine, Harold, Corinne, Jimmy, Cyril, yes, the five younger Willoughby children, do you know what happened to that fire plug? There was a man around yesterday. I bet he took it, said Clementine. I don't even remember a fire plug there. I think you're making a lot of fuss about nothing, said Harold. City Hall's going to hear about this, said Corinne. Pretty dom sure, said Jimmy, but I won't tell. Cyril, cried Officer Comstock in a terrible voice. Not a terrifying voice, a terrible voice. He felt terrible now. Great green banana, said Cyril. I'm only three years old. I don't see how it's even my responsibility. Clarence, said Officer Comstock. Clarence gulped. Do you know where that fire plug went? Clarence Brighton. No, sir. I don't know where it went. A bunch of smart alecks from the water department came out and shut off the water for a few blocks around and put some kind of cap on in place of the fire plug. This sure is going to be a funny-sounding report, said one of them. Officer Comstock walked away discouraged. Don't bother me, Miss Manners, he said. I don't know where to look for your cat. I don't even know where to look for a fire plug. I have an idea, said Clarissa, that when you find the cat, you will find the fire plug the same place. As yet, it is only an idea. Ozzie Murphy wore a little hat on top of his head. Clarence pointed his weapon and winked. The hat was no longer there, but a little trickle of blood was running down the pate. I don't believe I'd play with that anymore, said Nokomis. Who's playing, said Clarence. This is for real. 
This was the beginning of the seven-day terror in the heretofore obscure neighborhood. Trees disappeared from the parkings. Lamp posts were as though they had never been. Wally Waldorf drove home, got out, slammed the door of his car, and there was no car. As George Mullendorf came up the walk to his house, his dog Pete ran to meet him and took a flying leap into his arms. The dog left the sidewalk, but something happened. The dog was gone, and only a bark lingered for a moment in the puzzled air. But the worst were the fire plugs. The second plug was installed the morning after the disappearance of the first. In eight minutes, it was gone, and the flood waters returned. Another one was in by twelve o'clock. Within three minutes, it had vanished. The next morning, fire plug number four was installed. The water commissioner was there. The city engineer was there. The chief of police was there with a riot squad. The president of the Parent Teachers Association was there. The president of the university was there. The mayor was there. Three gentlemen of the FBI, a newsreel photographer, eminent scientists, and a crowd of honest citizens. Let's see it disappear now, said the city engineer. Let's see it disappear now, said the police chief. Let's see it dis- It did, didn't it, said one of the eminent scientists. And it was gone, and everybody was very wet. At least I have the picture sequence of the year, said the photographer, but his camera and apparatus disappeared from the midst of them. Shut off the water and cap it, said the commissioner, and don't put in another plug yet. That was the last plug in the warehouse. This is too big for me, said the mayor. I wonder that Tass doesn't have it yet. Tass has it, said a little round man. I am Tass. If all of you gentlemen will come into the plug nickel, said Nokomis, and try one of our new fire hydrant highballs, you will all be happier. These are made of good corn whiskey, brown sugar, and hydrant water from this very gutter. You can be the first to drink them. Business was phenomenal at the plug nickel, for it was in front of its very doors that the fire plugs disappeared in floods of gushing water. I know a way we can get rich, said Clarissa several days later to her father, Tom Willoughby. Everybody says they're going to sell their houses for nothing and move out of the neighborhood. Go get a lot of money and buy them all. Then you can sell them again and get rich. I wouldn't buy them for a dollar each. Three of them have disappeared already, and all of the families but us have their furniture moved out in the front yards. There might be nothing but vacant lots in the morning. Good. Then buy the vacant lots. And you can be ready when the houses come back. Come back? Are the houses going to come back? Do you know anything about this young lady? I have a suspicion verging on a certainty. As of now, I can say no more. Three eminent scientists were gathered in an untidy suite that looked as though it belonged to a drunken sultan. This transcends the metaphysical. It impinges on the quantum continuum. It obsoletes boff, said Dr. Velikov Vonk. The contingence on the intrasigents is the most mystifying aspect, said Arpada Arkabaranan. Yes, said Willie McGilly, who would have thought that you could do it with a beer can and two pieces of cardboard. When I was a boy, I used an oatmeal box and a red Crayola. I do not always follow you, said Dr. Vonk. I wish you would speak plainer. So far, no human had been injured or disappeared, except for a little blood on the pate of Ozzie Murphy, on the lobes of Conchita when her gaudy earrings disappeared from her very ears, a clipped finger or so when a house vanished as the front door knob was touched, a lost toe when a neighborhood boy kicked out a can and the can was not, probably not more than a pint of blood and three or four ounces of flesh altogether. Now, however, Mr. Buckle, the grocery store man, disappeared before witnesses. This was serious. Some mean-looking investigators from downtown came out to the Willoughby's. The meanest-looking one was the mayor. In happier days, he had not been a mean man, but the terror had now reigned for seven days. There have been ugly rumors, said one of the mean investigators, that link certain events to this household. Do any of you know anything about them? I started most of them, said Clarissa, but I didn't consider them ugly. Cryptic, rather. But if you want to get to the bottom of this, just ask me a question. Did you make those things disappear, asked the investigator. That isn't the question, said Clarissa. Do you know where they have gone, asked the investigator. That isn't the question either. Can you make them come back? Why, of course I can. Anybody can. Can't you? I cannot. If you can, please do so at once. I need some stuff. Get me a gold watch and a hammer. Then go down to the drugstore and get me this list of chemicals. And I need a yard of black velvet and a pound of rock candy. Shall we? asked one of the investigators. Yes, said the mayor. It's our only hope. Get her anything she wants. And it was all assembled. Why does she get all the attention? asked Clarence. I was the one that made all the things disappear. How does she know how to get them back? I knew it, cried Callista with hate. I knew he was the one that did it. 
He read in my diary how to make it disappear. If I was his mother, I'd whip him for reading his little sister's diary. That's what happens when things like that fall into irresponsible hands. She poised the hammer over the gold watch of the mare on the floor. I have to wait a few seconds. This can't be hurried. It'll be only a little while. The second hand swept around to the point that was preordained for it before the world began. Clarissa suddenly brought down the hammer with all her force on the beautiful gold watch. That's all, she said. Your troubles are over. See, there's Blanche Manor's cat on the sidewalk, just where she was seven days ago. The cat was back. And now let's go down to the plugged nickel and watch the fire plug come back. They had only a few minutes to wait. It came from nowhere and clanged into the street like a sign and a witness. Now I predict, said Clarissa, that every single object will return exactly seven days from the time of its disappearance. The seven-day terror had ended. The objects began to reappear. How? asked the mayor. Did you know that they would come back in seven days? Because it was a seven-day disappearer that Clarence made. I also know how to make a nine-day, a thirteen-day, a twenty-seven-day, and an eleven-year disappearer. I was going to make a thirteen-day one, but for that you have to color the ends with the blood from a little boy's heart, and Cyril cried every time I tried to make a good cut. You really know how to make all of these? Yes, but I shudder if the knowledge should ever come into unauthorized hands. I shudder too, Clarissa. But tell me, why did you want the chemicals? For my chemistry set. And the black velvet? For doll dresses. And the pound of rock candy? How did you ever get to be the mayor of this town if you have to ask questions like that? What do you think I wanted the rock candy for? One last question, said the mayor. Why did you smash my gold watch with the hammer? Oh, said Clarissa. That was for dramatic effect. End of The Seven Day Terror by R.A. Lafferty Read by Cameron Blakely How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Jabberwock Beware by Richard A. Sternbach This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Howarth Jabberwock Beware by Richard A. Sternbach the Security Council was in emergency session. The four delegates would have had easier consciences had more nations been represented, but it was hard to travel now. Only Russia, England and France were able to send their men to New York. Sergei Moskov, USSR, presided unofficially. He wore a harried look and addressed them wearily. To think, gentlemen, that it has taken circumstances like this to bring us into accord. The others said nothing. Overhead, above New York's stone and glass UN building that had been conceived in hope and wrought with faith, they could hear the whine of the patrolling ships. The delegates stared at the table in front of them. Your country, Mr. Conrad, Moskov said to the American representative, is the mother of our last hope. He looked around the table for concurrence. Sir Manley straightened a bit and Monsieur Tourneau's moustache twitched, but they all nodded. What use national pride now? There was not much time, anyway. Tonight. He will be here? Moskov asked. Conrad cleared his throat. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a slip of paper. Joe, I mean Dr. Waters, sent an answer to our request, he read. I take my vorpal sword in hand. Beware, Jabberwock. I come. Joe Waters. The courage of youth, Sir Manley said, but he smiled. Moskov looked at his watch. He should be here then. I am. They all turned at the sound of that voice and rose as Joe Waters strode in. Just thirty years old, athletic, brilliant. He was accompanied by a wizened character in a baggy brown suit and crumpled felt hat. Gentlemen, Joe said, and bowed. They all sat down. A friend, he explained, indicating his companion. Name of Mike. Friend and buddy, 
Mike said in a whiskey hoarse voice. We thought you understood, Dr. Waters, Moskov said, eyeing Mike distastefully, that this was to be a secret conference. Monsieur Tourneau, who had a sensitive nose, shifted his chair slightly away from the bum. Joe said, I met Mike in a bar last night and he's been with me since. I like his unsophisticated point of view. Bar? Sir Manley exclaimed, visibly shaken. Bar, Joe answered. For the same reason I'm here now. He leaned forward. I happened to be looking at the moon with my girl when they blew it up. His eyes narrowed at the memory. She started to cry, and was still at it when we got back to her apartment. That's when I went to a bar to get drunk. It's also one reason I'm here. When they take the moon away from lovers, it's the last straw. Get on hell, kid, Mike rasped. Joe silenced him with a wave of his hand, and Mike slouched down in his chair, looking hurt. Mr. Conrad... Moskov said. Will you be good enough to give Dr. Waters the latest developments? All right, Joe. You know what's happened this past week. Joe nodded. In case you didn't get the overall picture, their ships, he jerked a thumb at the wine passing back and forth above, have completely blanketed the world. They have destroyed every means of defense we've used against them. Atomic anti-aircraft even hasn't phased them in the least. Yesterday they sent for us. The head of their expedition told us who they are, and it accounts perhaps for their anthropoidal appearance. They are from Jupiter, so it's not inconceivable after all that similar forms of life should become dominant in the same solar system. They are easily twice our size, and have ability to learn and speak fluently in a half hour, each of the three languages represented here means anything, they have a proportionate IQ. Their leader, Slan, says his title means he is the crown prince of the royal Jovian family. Slan was nothing if not courteous and chivalrous. He told us yesterday he would give us a sporting chance for survival. <laughs> Why, I can't imagine. Apparently this expedition is like a glorified fox hunt to them. We are to choose a person to represent the world in an intellectual duel with them. If we win, they withdraw completely, never to bother us again. If we lose, then, he said, we're not worth saving and will be completely destroyed, hunted individually, which to them is a great sport. To prove they could do it, he had his ship's guns turn on the moon. You saw what happened. Disintegrated completely. Them crumbs, Mike grated. We'll murder em, Joe. Quiet, Mike. Mike grumbled, pulled out a cigarette paper and tobacco and rolled his own. That's why we've called on you, Conrad said. Waters, Sir Manley said, the world rests on your shoulders. You have every qualification, Monsieur Tourneau put in. Your brilliant theories in symbolic logic and theoretical mathematics, said Sir Manley. Chess champion of the world, Moskov added respectfully. Your contribution to astrophysics, Conrad said. And don't you guys forget, he won the decathlon when he was just a high school kid. He'll murder them bums. Joe smiled. Don't mind my pugnacious friend. You are, so far as we know, the finest representative the world could have. Moskov looked serious, and Joe became aware suddenly of the awful burden involved. What use intellectual ability or athletic prowess compared to Jovian standards? Wasn't there someone, even a science fiction writer perhaps, better qualified to handle a situation as fantastic as this? Apparently not. When's the funeral? Joe asked dryly. Uh, please, monsieur, a little respect for the situation. Monsieur Tourneau looked pained. The contest is to be in Slan's ship at eight o'clock tonight, Moskov answered. They will pick you up here in five hours. You and me both, Joe, Mike said. Yeah, Joe answered, and now he was mentally reeling under the impact of his responsibility. Let's have a drink first. I think we'll need one. Sir so Manley paled. I say. We'll murder them damn Greeks, Mike chortled. 
Hey, I'm not going in that thing, Mike protested. Can't fight them if we don't, Joe answered mournfully. They're big enough, all right, Mike answered respectfully. Wouldn't some football coach like to have one of them on his squad? Come on, let's go. Joe shoved Mike toward the waiting ship, at the door of which a behemoth of a figure waited patiently, watching with some apparent disdain as the two, arms around each other's shoulders, weaved unsteadily inside. Inside the ship, Joe took a long pull at the bottle Mike passed him. Strange, he thought, how an unforeseeable factor, upsetting life's routine equations, produces unguessed mental reactions. Until last night, he'd never had a drink in his life. Then a little thing, like the moon being blown up. Aloud, he quoted, Yet what are all such mysteries to me, whose life is full of indices and surds? X squared plus 7X plus 53 equals 11 thirds. What's that? Lewis Carroll, Joe answered, and wondered greatly at the vast amounts of liquor he had consumed in a short space of time. Beware the Jabberwock, my son! And Joe Waters, the world's most brilliant human, passed out. They left Joe in the ship and dragged Mike before Slam. That gigantic figure sat in regal splendour at the end of a long corridor that ran the length of the vessel. On either side of Mike, as he stumbled toward the throne which seemed miles away, uniformed giants stood at attention. Had he stretched his arm, he might have been able to wrap a belt buckle. The sensation of being a pygmy increased as he approached Slan. Grouped around Slan, whose throne was on a platform several feet high, stood members of what seemed to be a retinue. They sneered and snickered as Mike drew near, and Mike had to strain his neck and blurred eyes to see. "'Are you ready to begin?' Slan asked in a voice that nearly deafened Mike. "'Well, murder you, you bums!' Mike answered belligerently. His whiskey-fogged mind somehow assumed Joe was still by his side. "'Very well, then.' And Slan extended an arm toward Mike, thumb pointed up. Mike promptly repeated the gesture, except that he pointed his thumb down. Slan reached for a huge flagon of red liquid, which he poured slowly onto the floor. Mike stared, then reached into a hip pocket and produced a bottle of whiskey, swallowed some, and vigorously smacked his lips. Then he held the bottle out to Slan, grinning broadly. Slan reached into a bag at his side, took out a handful of coloured pebbles and scattered them on the floor. Mike scrambled after them and stuffed them into his pocket, then strolled erect, panting with the exertion. Slan arose from his throne, stepped off the platform, and towered over Mike. You surprise me, he boomed. You and your little planet are smarter than I expected. Go, and tell your people that they could not have chosen a worthier representative. It was a dazed and confused Mike who was led stumbling, and clutching his bottle, back to the ship which was to take him to a free world. Slan, meanwhile, found himself besieged by annoyed and puzzled followers. He held up his hand for silence, and relapsed into native Jovian. That earthling, he said sarcastically, seems to have fared better than you who are so proud of your intellects. When I held my thumb up, indicating our superiority in size and strength, he pointed his thumb down to show that physical power is really of minor importance. I poured a red liquid onto the floor, dramatizing the effect of conflict on them if that should be my wish. He demonstrated his fearlessness by producing a light-colored liquid and sampling it with enjoyment, as his kind would react to such an encounter. Finally, I flung out a handful of coloured pebbles, displaying the confusing array of languages, races, and ideas their world contains. He scooped them into his pocket, showing that their diversity could still be united into single purpose. Slan looked contemptuously at the crestfallen faces of his men. 
It would be to our benefit if we had half their spirit in proportion to our size, he said. Then he bellowed, Order all ships to withdraw at once. To an aid, he muttered, We'll leave this planet to those worthy of it. Mike and Joe were hiding from a world delirious with joy and anxious to heap glory upon its saviour, whom they thought was Joe Waters. Joe had no intention of deluding the world in this regard, but right now he was plying Mike with whiskey to get from him the story of what had happened. They were in the rear booth of a bar, and Mike kept insisting that Joe knew perfectly well what had happened because he'd been right there. All right, Joe said coaxingly, I know what happened, but tell me how you're going to tell it so we can get our story straight. Can't understand it, Mike said thickly, shaking his head. The guy was nuts. What happened? Joe pleaded. Mike, who apparently had no saturation point, gulped some more whiskey. First thing, he said, the guy sticks his thumb up in the air like he's going to give me the bum's rush. So I point mine down. If he tries to kick me out of there before we even get a chance to talk business, I'll floor him. Yeah, you would. Mike ignored this comment, took yet another drink, and wiped his lips on the back of his hand. Joe watched this display of alcoholic immunity with admiration, and Mike continued. Well, then he takes a bottle of this awful-looking wine and pours it out on the floor. No wonder they've been raising such a rumpus, Joe, with nothing but that stuff to drink. I would, too. So I pulled out my flask and took a swig to show them what we've got, and I offer him some. You know something, Joe? And Mike leaned forward earnestly. When that guy saw the kind of stuff we drink, he got a new respect, cause he takes a handful of jewels and rolls them at me. <laughs> now, I don't look no gift horse in the mouth. I pocket them as fast as I can get my hands on them. I got the rocks with me, here. He pulled out the pebbles Slan had referred to, and jewels they were. Fire shot from diamonds, rubies, emeralds, amethysts. Joe whistled. We can use the money that stuff will bring. Buy a liquor store? Mike asked eagerly. Finance the development and launching of an interplanetary expedition. Ah, what the hell do you want to do that for? They've got eleven moons, Joe said grimly. And all we want is one. End of Jabberwock Beware by Richard A. Sternbach Recording by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia Teething Ring by James Causey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Cameron Blakely Teething Ring by James Causey Half an hour before, while she had been engrossed in the current soap opera and Harry Jr. was screaming at his crib, Melinda would naturally have slammed the front door in the little man's face. However, when the bell rang, she was wearing her new Chinese red house coat, had just lustered her nails to a blinding scarlet, and Harry Jr. was sleeping like an angel. Yawning, Melinda answered the door, and the little man said, beaming, "'Excellent day. I have gigaws for information.' Melinda did not quite recoil. He was perhaps five feet tall, with a gleaming hairless scalp and a young face. He wore a plain gray tunic, and a peddler's tray hung from his thin shoulders. Don't want any, Melinda stated flatly. Please, he had great beseeching amber eyes. They all say that. I haven't much time. I must be back at the university by noon. You working your way through college? He brightened. Yes, I suppose you could call it that. Alien anthropology major. Melinda softened. The initiations those frats pulled nowadays, shaving the poor guy's head, eating goldfish. It was criminal. Well, she asked grudgingly, what's in the tray? Flanglers, said the little man eagerly. Oscilloscopes, portable force field generators, a neural distorter. Melinda's face was blank. The little man frowned. You use them, of course? This is a class four culture. Melinda essayed a weak shrug and the little man sighed with relief. His eyes fled past her to the blank screen of the TV set. Ah, a monitor, he smiled. For a moment, I was afraid. May I come in? Melinda shrugged, opened the door. This might be interesting. 
like a vacuum cleaner salesman who had cleaned her drapes last week for free, and Kitty Kyle Battle's life wouldn't be on for almost an hour. My name is Porteous, said the little man with an eager smile. I'm doing a thematic on class four cultures. He whipped out a stylus, began jotting down notes. The TV set fascinated him. It's turned off right now, Melinda said. Porteous's eyes widened impossibly. You mean, he whispered in horror, that you're exercising class five privileges? This is terribly confusing. I get doors slammed to my face when class fours are supposed to have a splendid Gregorian quotient. You do have atomic power, don't you? Oh, sure, said Melinda uncomfortably. This wasn't going to be much fun. Space travel? The little face was intent. Sure. Well, Melinda yawned, looking at the blank screen. They've got Space Patrol, Space Cadet, Tales of Tomorrow. Excellent. Rocket ships are forest fields. Melinda blink. Does your husband own one? Melinda shook her blonde head helplessly. What are your economic circumstances? Melinda took a deep, rasping breath and said, Listen, mister, is this a demonstration or a quiz program? Oh, my excuse. Demonstration, certainly. You will not mind the questions. Questions? There was an ominous glint in Melinda's blue eyes. Your delightful primitive customs, art forms, personal habits. Look, Melinda said, crimsoning. This is a respectable neighborhood, and I'm not answering any Kinsey report, understand? The little man nodded, scribbling. Personal habits are taboo? I so regret the demonstration. He waved grandly at the tray. Anti-graph sandals? A portable solar converter? Apologizing for this miserable section, but on Capella, they told me. He followed Melinda's entranced gaze, selected a tiny green vial. This is merely a regenerative solution. You appear to have no cuts or bruises. Oh, said Melinda nastily. Cruz warts cancer grows hair, I suppose. Porteous brightened. Of course, I see you can scan. Amazing. He scribbled further with his stylus, glanced up, blinked at the obvious score on Melinda's face. Here, try it. You try it. Now watch him squirm. Porteous hesitated. Would you like me to grow an extra finger? Hair? Grow some hair. Linda tried not to smile. The little man unstopped the vial, poured a shimmering green drop on his wrist, frowning. Must concentrate, he said. Thorium base, suspended solution, really jolts the endocrines. Complete control. See? Melinda's jaw dropped. She stared at the tiny tuft of hair which had sprouted on that bare wrist. She was thinking abruptly, unhappily, about that chignon she had bought yesterday. They had let her buy that for eight dollars, when this stuff she could have a natural one. How much, she inquired cautiously. A half hour of your time only, said Porteous. Belinda grasped the vial firmly, settled down on the sofa with one leg tucked carefully under her. Okay, shoot. But nothing personal. Porteous was delighted. He asked a multitude of questions, most of them pointless, some naive, and Melinda dug into her infinitesimal fund of knowledge and gave. The little man scribbled furiously, clucking like a gravid hen. You mean, he asked in amazement, that you live in these primitive huts of your own volition? It's a GI housing project, Melinda said ashamed. Astonishing, he wrote. Feudal anachronisms and atomic power side by side. Class Fords periodically rough it in back-to-nature movements. Harry Jr. chose that moment to begin screaming for his lunch. Porteous sat, trembling. Is that a security alarm? My son, said Melinda despondently, and went into the nursery. Porteous followed and watched the ululating child with some trepidation. Newborn? Eighteen months, said Melinda, stiffly changing diapers. He's cutting teeth. Porteous shuddered. What a pity. Obviously atavistic. Wouldn't the crutch accept him? You shouldn't have to keep him here. I keep after Harry to get a maid, but he says we can't afford one. Manifestly insecure, muttered the little man, studying Harry Jr. Definite paranoid tendency. He was two weeks premature, volunteered Melinda. He's real sensitive. I know just the thing, Portia said happily. Here. He dipped into the glittering litter on the tray and handed Harry Jr. a translucent prism. A neural distorter. We use it to train regressives on Rigel too. It might be of assistance. Melinda eyed the thing doubtfully. Harry Jr. was peering into the shifting crystal depths with a somewhat strained expression. Speeds up the neural flow, explained the little man proudly. Helps tap the unused 80%. The presymptomatic memory is unaffected due to automatic cerebral lapse in case of overload. I'm afraid it won't do much more than keep his present IQ. An intelligent idiot is still an idiot, but... 
How dare you? Melinda's eyes flashed. My son is not an idiot. You get out of here this minute and take your things with you. As she reached for the prism, Harry Jr. squalled. Melinda relented. Here, she said angrily, fumbling with her purse. How much are they? Medium of exchange? Porteous rubbed his bald skull. Oh, I really shouldn't, but it'll make such a wonderful abendum to the chapter on malignant primitives. What is your smallest denomination? Is a dollar okay? Melinda was hopeful. Porteous was pleased with the picture of George Washington. He turned the bill over and over in his fingers, at last bowed low and formally, apologized for any taboo violations, and left via the front door. Crazy fraternities, muttered Melinda, turning on the TV set. Kitty Kyle was dull that morning. At length, Melinda used some of the liquid in the green bile on her eyelashes, was quite pleased at the results, and hid the rest in the medicine cabinet. Harry Jr. was a model of docility the rest of the day. While Melinda watched TV and munched chocolates, did and redid her hair, Harry Jr. played quietly with the crystal prism. Toward late afternoon, he crawled over to the bookcase, wrestled down the encyclopedia, and pawed through it, gurgling with delight. He definitely, Melinda decided, would make a fine lawyer some day, not a useless putterer like Big Harry, who worked all hours overtime in that damn lab. She scowled as Harry Jr., bored with the encyclopedia, began reaching for one of Big Harry's tomes on nuclear physics. One putterer in the family was enough. But when she tried to take the book away from him, Harry Jr. howled so violently that she let well enough alone. At 6.30, Big Harry called from the lab with the usual despondent message that he would not be home for supper. Melinda said a few resigned things about cheerless dinners eaten alone, hinted darkly what lonesome wives sometimes did for company, and Harry said he was very sorry, but this might be it, and Melinda hung up on him in a temper. Precisely 15 minutes later, the doorbell rang. Melinda opened the door and gaped. The little man could have been Porteous's double, except for the black metallic tunic, the glacial gray eyes. Mrs. Melinda Adams? Even the voice was frigid. Y- yes? Why? Major Nord, Galactic Security, the little man bowed. You were visited early this morning by one Porteous? He spoke the name with a certain disgust. He left a neural distorter here. Correct. Melinda's nod was tremulous. Major Nord came quietly into the living room, shut the door behind him. My apologies, madam, for the intrusion. Porteous mistook your world for a class four culture instead of a class seven. Here. He handed her the crumpled dollar bill. You may check the serial number. The distorter, please. Melinda shrunk limply onto the sofa. I don't understand, she said painfully. Was he a thief? He was... Careless about his spatial coordinates, Major Nord's teeth showed in the faintest of smiles. He has been corrected. Where is it? Now look, said Melinda with some asperity. That thing's keeping Harry Jr. quiet all day. I bought it in good faith, and it's not my fault. Say, have you got a warrant? Madam, said the Major with dignity, I dislike violating local taboos, but must I explain the impact of a neural disorder on a backwater culture? What if your Neanderthal had been given atomic blasters? Where would you have been today? Swinging through trees, no doubt. What if your Hitler had force fields, he exhaled. Where's your son? In the nursery, Harry Jr. was contently playing with his blocks, the prism like glinting in the corner. Major Nord picked it up carefully, scrutinized Harry Jr. His voice was very soft. You said he was playing with it? Some vestigial maternal instinct prompted Melinda to shake her head vigorously. The little man stared hard at Harry Jr. He began whimpering. Trembling, Melinda scooped up Harry Jr. Is that all you have to do? Run around frightening women and children? Take your old distorter and get out. Leave decent people alone. Major Nord frowned. If only he could be sure. He peered stonily at Harry Jr., murmured, Definite egomania. It doesn't seem to have affected him. Strange. Do you want me to scream, Melinda demanded. Major Nord sighed. He bowed to Melinda, went out, closed the door, touched a tiny stud on his tunic, and vanished. The manners of some people, Melinda said to Harry Jr. She was relieved that the Major had not asked for the green vial. Harry Jr. also looked relieved, although for quite a different reason. Big Harry arrived home a little after eleven. There were small worry creases about his mouth and forehead, in the lead and cast of defeat in his eyes. He went into the bedroom, and Melinda sleepily told him about the little man working his way through college by peddling silly goods, and about that rude cop named Nord. 
and Harry said that was simply astonishing, and Melinda said, Harry, you had a drink. I had two drinks, Harry told her owlishly. You married a failure, dear. Part of the experimental model vaporized. Whoosh. Just like that. On paper, it looked so good. Melinda had heard it all before. She asked him to see if Harry Jr. was covered, and Big Harry went unsteadily into the nursery, sat down by his son's crib. Poor little guy, he mused. Your old man's a bum. A useless tinker. He thought he could send man to the stars on a string of helium nuclei. Oh, he was smart. Thought of everything. Auxiliary jets to kick off the negative charge. Bigger mercury vapor banks. A fine straight thrust of positive alpha particles. He hiccuped, put his face in his hands. Didn't you ever stop to think that a few air molecules could defocus the stream? Try a vacuum, stupid? Big Harry stood up. Did you say something, son? Gerful, said Harry Jr. Big Harry reeled into the living room like a somnambulist. He got pencil and paper, began jotting frantic formulae. Presently, he called a cab and raced back to the laboratory. Melinda was dreaming about little bald men with diamond-studded trays. They were chasing her. They kept pelting her with rubies and emeralds. All they wanted was to ask questions, but she kept running. Harry Jr. clasped tightly in her arms. Now they were ringing alarm bells. The bells kept ringing, and she groaned, sat up in bed, and seized the telephone. Darling, Big Harry's voice shook. I've got it. More auxiliary shielding plus a vacuum. We'll be rich. That's just fine, said Melinda crossly. You woke the baby. Harry Jr. was sobbing bitterly into his pillow. He was sick with disappointment. Even the most favorable extrapolation showed that it would take him 19 years to become master of the world. An eternity. 19 years. End of Teething Ring by James Cosley There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Deshawn. There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette. Doctors had given him just one month to live. A month to wonder, what comes afterward? There was one way to find out. Ask a dead man. The amber-brown of the liquor disguised the poison it held, and I watched with a smile on my lips as he drank it. There was no pity in my heart for him. He was a jackal in the jungle of life, and I, I was one of the carnivores. It is the lot of the jackals of life to be devoured by the carnivore. Suddenly the contented look on his face froze into a startled stillness. I knew he was feeling the first savage twinge of the agony that was to come. He turned his head and looked at me, and I saw suddenly that he knew what I had done. "'You murderer!' he cursed me, and then his body arched in the middle and his voice choked off deep in his throat. For a short minute he sat tense, his body stiffened by the agony that rode it, unable to move a muscle. I watched the torment in his eyes build up to a crescendo of pain until the suffering became so great that it filmed his eyes, and I knew that, though he still stared directly at me, he no longer saw me. Then, suddenly, as the spasm had come, the starch went out of his body and his back slid slowly down the chair edge. He landed heavily with his head resting limply against the seat of the chair. His right leg doubled up in a kind of jerk before he was still. I knew the time had come. Where are you? I asked. This moment had cost me sixty thousand dollars. Three weeks ago the best doctors in the state had given me a month to live, and with seven million dollars in the bank I couldn't buy a minute more. I accepted the doctor's decision philosophically, like the gambler that I am. But I had a plan, one which necessity had never forced me to use until now. Several years before, I had read an article about the medicine men of a certain tribe of aborigines living in the jungles at the source of the Amazon River. 
they had discovered a process in which the juice of a certain bush, known only to them, could be used to poison a man. Anyone subjected to this poison died, but for a few minutes after the life left his body, the medicine men could still converse with him. The subject, though ostensibly and actually dead, answered the medicine men's every question. This was their primitive, though reportedly effective, method of catching glimpses of what lay in the world of death. I had conceived my idea at the time I read the article, but I had never had the need to use it until the doctors gave me a month to live. Then I spent my $60,000, and three weeks later I held in my hands a small bottle of the witch doctor's fluid. The next step was to secure my victim, my collaborator, I preferred to call him. The man I chose was a nobody, a homeless, friendless, non-entity picked up off the street. He had once been an educated man, but now he was only a bum, and when he died, he'd never be missed. A perfect man for my experiment. I'm a rich man because I have a system. The system is simple. I never make a move until I know exactly where that move will lead me. My field of operations is the stock market. I spend money unstintingly to secure the information I need before I take each step. I hire the best investigators, bribe employees and persons in position to give me the information I want, and only when I am as certain as humanly possible that I cannot be wrong do I move. And the system never fails. Seven million dollars in the bank is proof of that. Now, knowing that I could not live, I intended to make the system work for me one last time before I died. I'm a firm believer in the adage that any situation can be whipped, given prior knowledge of its coming, and of course its attendant circumstances. For a moment he did not answer, and I began to fear that my experiment has failed. Where are you? I repeated, louder and sharper this time. The small muscles about his eyes puckered with an unnormal tension, while the rest of his face held its death frost. Slowly, slowly, unnaturally, as though energized by some hyper-rational power, his lips and tongue moved. The words he spoke were clear. I am in a, a tunnel he said. It is lighted dimly, but there is nothing for me to see. Blue veins showed through the flesh of his cheeks like watermarks on translucent paper. He paused, and I urged, Go on. I am alone, he said. The realities I knew no longer exist, and I am damp and cold. All about me is a sense of gloom and dejection. It is an apprehension an emanation so deep and real as to be almost a tangible thing. The walls to either side of me seem to be formed not of substance, but rather of the soundless cries of melancholy of spirits I cannot see. I am waiting, waiting in the gloom for something which will come to me. That need to wait is an innate part of my being, and I have no thought of questioning it. His voice died again. What are you waiting for? I asked. I do not know, he said, his voice dreary with the despair of centuries of hopelessness. I only know that I must wait. That compulsion is greater than my strength to combat. The tone of his voice changed slightly. The tunnel about me is widening, and now the walls have receded into invisibility. The tunnel has become a plain, but the plain is as desolate, as forlorn and dreary as was the tunnel. And still I stand and wait. How long must this go on? He fell silent again, and I was about to prompt him with another question. I could not afford to let the time run out in long silences. But abruptly the muscles about his eyes tightened, and subtly a new aspect replaced their hopeless dejection. Now they expressed a black bottomless terror. For a moment I marveled that so small a portion of a facial anatomy could express such horror. There is something coming toward me, he said. Uh, a beast! 
of brutal foulness. Beast is too inadequate a term to describe it, but I know no words to tell its form. It is an intangible and evasive thing, but very real. And it is coming closer. It has no organs of sight as I know them, but I feel that it can see me. Or rather that it is aware of me with a sense sharper than vision itself. It is now very near. Oh, God, the malevolence, the hate, the potentiality of awful, fearsome destructiveness that is its very essence, and still I cannot move. The expression of terrified anticipation centered in his eyes lessened slightly and was replaced instantly by its former deep, deep despair. I am no longer afraid, he said. Why, I interjected, why? I was impatient to learn all that I could before the end came. Because, he paused, because it holds no threat for me. Somehow, some day, I understand, I know, that it too is seeking that for which I wait. What is it doing now? I asked. It has stopped beside me, and we stand together, gazing across the stark, empty plain. Now a second awful entity with the same leashed virulence about it moves up and stands at my other side. We all three wait, myself with a dark fear of this dismal universe, my unnatural companions with patient, malicious menace. Bits of, he faltered, of, I can name it only aura, Go out from the beast like an acid stream and touch me, and the hate and the venom chill my body like a wave of intense cold. Now there are others of the awful breed behind me. We stand waiting, waiting for that which will come. What it is, I do not know. I could see the pallor of death creeping steadily into the last corners of his lips, and I knew that the end was not far away. Suddenly, a black frustration built up within me. What are you waiting for? I screamed, the tenseness and the importance of this moment forcing me to lose the iron self-control upon which I have always prided myself. I knew that the answer held the secret of what I must know. If I could learn that, my experiment would not be in vain, and I could make whatever preparations were necessary for my own death. I had to know the answer. Think! Think, I pleaded. What are you waiting for? I do not know. The dreary despair in his eyes, sightless as they met mine, chilled me with a coldness that I felt in the marrow of my being. I do not know, he repeated. I... Yes, I do know. Abruptly, the plasmatic film cleared from his eyes, and I knew that for the first time since the poison struck, he was seeing me clearly. I sensed that this was the last moment before he left for good. It had to be now. Tell me, I command you, I cried. What are you waiting for? His voice was quiet as he murmured softly, implacably, before he was gone. We are waiting, he said. For you. End of There Is a Reaper by Charles D. DeVett. Recording by Rich Deshawn. LaConnor, Washington. The Perfectionists by Arnold Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Blakely. The Perfectionists by Arnold Castle. Is there something wrong with you? Do you fail to fit in with your group? Nervous, anxious, ill at ease? Happy about it? Lucky you. Frank Pembroke sat behind the desk of his shabby little office over Lamarck's Liqueurs in downtown Los Angeles and waited for his first customer. He had been in business for a week and has yet had no callers. 
Therefore, it was with a mingled sense of excitement and satisfaction that he greeted the tall, dark, and smooth-faced figure that came up the stairs and into the office shortly before noon. "'Good day, sir,' said Pembroke with an amiable smile. "'I see my advertisement has interested you. Please stand in that corner for just a moment.' Opening the desk drawer, which was almost empty, Pembroke removed an automatic pistol fitted with a silencer. Pointing it at the amazed customer, he fired four twenty-two caliber longs into the narrow chest. Then he made a telephone call and sat down to wait. He wondered how long it would be before his next client would arrive. The series of events leading up to Pembroke's present occupation had commenced on a dismal overcast evening in the South Pacific a year earlier. Bound for Sydney, two days out of Valparaiso, the Colombian tramp steamer Elena Mia had encountered a dense greenish fog which seemed vaguely redolent of citrus trees. Standing on the forward deck, Pembroke was one of the first to perceive the peculiar odor and to spot the immense gray hulk wallowing in the murky distance. Then the explosion had come, from far below the waterline, and the decks were awash with frantic crewmen, officers, and a handful of passengers. Only two lifeboats were launched before the Elena Mia went down. Pembroke was in the second. The roar of the sinking ship was the last thing he heard for some time. Pembroke came as close to being a professional adventurer as one can in these days of regimented travel, organized peril, and political restriction. He had made for himself a substantial fortune through speculation in a great variety of properties, real and otherwise. Life had given him much and demanded very little which was perhaps the reason for his restiveness. Loyalty to a person or to people was a trait Pembroke had never recognized in himself, nor did it have ever been expected of him. And yet he greatly envied those staunch patriots and lovers who could find it in themselves to elevate the glory and safety of others above that of themselves. Lacking such loyalties, Pembroke adapted quickly to the situation in which he found himself when he regained consciousness. He woke in a small room which appeared to be a typical modern American hotel. The wallet in his pocket contained exactly what it should, approximately $300. His next thought was of food. He left the room and descended via the elevator to the restaurant. Here he observed that it was early afternoon. Ordering a full dinner, for he was unusually hungry, he began to study the others in the restaurant. Many of the faces seemed familiar, the crew of the ship, probably. He also recognized several of the passengers. However, he made no attempt to speak to them. After his meal, he bought a good corona and went for a walk. His situation could have been any small Western American seacoast city. He heard the hiss of the ocean in the direction the afternoon sun was taking. In his full-gated walk, he was soon approaching the beach. On the sand, he saw a number of sunbathers. One in particular, an attractive woman of about 30, tossed back her long chestnut locks and gazed up intently at Pembroke as he passed. Seldom had he enjoyed so ingenious an invitation. He halted and stared down at her for a few moments. Are you looking for someone? she inquired. Much of the time, said the man. Could it be me? It could be. Yet you seem so unsure, she said. Pembroke smiled uneasily. There was something not entirely normal about her conversation, though the rest of her compensated for that. Tell me what's wrong with me, she went on urgently. I'm not good enough, am I? I mean, there's something wrong with the way I look or act, isn't there? Please help me. Please. You're not casual enough, for one thing, said Pembroke, deciding to play along with her for the moment. You're too tense. Also, you're a bit knock-kneed. Not that it matters. Is that what you wanted to hear? Yes, yes. I mean, I suppose so. I can try to be more casual, but I don't know what to do about my knees, she said wistfully, staring across at the smooth, tan limbs. Do you think I'm okay otherwise? I mean, as a whole, I'm not so bad, am I? Oh, please tell me. How about talking it over at supper tonight, Pembroke proposed. Maybe with less distraction, I'll have a better picture of you, as a whole. Well, that's very generous of you, the woman told him. He scribbled the name and an address on a small piece of paper and handed it to him. Any time after six, she said. Pembroke left the beach and walked through several small specialty shops. He tried to get the woman off his mind, but the oddness of her conversation continued to bother him. She was right about being different, but it was her concern about being different that made her so. How to explain that to her? Then he saw the weird little glass statuette among the usual bric-a-brac. 
It rather resembled a groundhog, had seven fingers on each of its six limbs, and smiled up at him as he stared. "'Can I help you, sir?' a middle-aged saleswoman inquired. "'Oh, good heavens! Whatever is that thing doing there?' Pembroke watched with lifted eyebrows as the clerk whisked the bizarre statuette underneath the counter. "'What the hell was that?' Pembroke demanded. "'Oh, you know. Or don't you?' "'Oh, my,' she concluded. "'Are you one of the strangers? And if I were? Well, I'd certainly appreciate it if you'd tell me how I walk. She came around in front of the counter and strutted back and forth a few times. They tell me I lean too far forward, she confided, but I should think that you'd fall down if you didn't. Don't try to go so fast and you won't fall down, suggested Pembroke. You're in too much of a hurry. Also, those fake flowers on your blouse make you look frumpy. Well, I'm supposed to look frumpy, the woman retorted. That's the type of person I am. But you can look frumpy and still walk natural, can't you? Everyone says you can. Well, they've got a point, said Pembroke. Incidentally, just where are we, anyway? What city is this? Porto Pacifico, she told him. Isn't that a lovely name? It means peaceful port, in Spanish. That was fine. At least he now know where he was. But as he left the shop, he began checking off every West Coast state, city, town, and inlet. None, to the best of his knowledge, was called Porto Pacifico. He headed for the nearest service station and asked for a map. The attendant gave him one which showed the city, but nothing beyond it. "'Which way is it to San Francisco?' asked Pembroke. "'That all depends on where you are,' the boy returned. "'Okay, then, where am I?' "'Pardon me, there's a customer,' the boy said. "'This is Porto Pacifico.' Pembroke watched him hurry off to a service car with the sense of having been given the runaround. To his surprise, the boy came back a few minutes later after servicing the automobile. "'Say, I've just figured out who you are,' the youngster told him. "'I'd sure appreciate it if you'd give me a little help on my lingo. "'Also, you gas up the car first, then try to sell him the oil, right?' "'Right,' said Pembroke warily. "'What's wrong with your lingo, other than the fact that it's not colloquial enough? "'Not enough slang, huh? "'Well, I guess I'll have to concentrate on that. "'How about the smile?' "'Perfect,' Pembroke told him. "'Yeah?' said the boy delightedly. Say, come back again, huh? I sure appreciate the help. Keep the map. Thanks. One more thing, Pembroke said. What's over that way, outside the city? Sand. How about that way, he asked, pointing north. And that way, pointing south. More of the same. Any railroads? That we ain't got. Buses? Airlines? The kid shook his head. Some city. Yeah, it's kind of isolated. A lot of ships dock here, though. All cargo ships, I'll bet. No passengers, said Pembroke. Right, said the attendant, giving with his perfect smile. No getting out of here, is there? That's for sure, the boy said, walking away to wait on another customer. If you don't like the place, you've had it. Pembroke returned to the hotel. Going to the bar, he recognized one of the Elena Mia's paying passengers. He was a short, rectangular little man in his fifties named Spencer. He sat at a booth with three young women, all lovely, all effusive. The topic of the conversation turned out to be precisely what Pembroke had predicted. Well, Louisa, I'd say your only fault is the way you keep wiggling your shoulders up and down. Why don't you try holding them straight? I thought it made me look sexy, the redhead said petulantly. Just be yourself, gal, Spencer drawled, jabbing her intimately with a fat elbow, and you'll qualify. Me, me, the blonde with a feather cut was insisting. What's wrong with me? You're perfect, sweetheart, he told her, taking her hand. Oh, come on, she pleaded. Everyone tells me I chew gum with my mouth open. Don't you hate that? Nah, that's part of your charm, Spencer assured her. How about me, sugar, as the girl with coal black hair? Ah, you're perfect, too. You're all perfect. I've never seen such a collection of dolls as parade around this year's city. Come on, kids. How about another round? But the dolls had apparently lost interest in him. They got up one by one and walked out of the bar. Pembroke took his rum and tonic and moved over to Spencer's booth. Okay, if I join you? Sure, said the fat man. Wonder what the hell got into those babes. You said they were perfect. They know they're not. You've got to be rough with them in this town, said Pembroke. That's all they want from us. Mister, you've been doing some thinking, I can see, said Spencer, peering at him suspiciously. Maybe you've figured out where we are. Your bet's as good as mine, said Pembroke. It's not Wellington, and it's not Brisbane, and it's not Long Beach, and it's not Tahiti. There are a lot of places it's not, but where the hell it is, you tell me. And by the way, he added, I hope you like it in Porto Pacifico. 
because there isn't any place to go from here, and there isn't any way to get there if there were. Pardon me, gentlemen, but I'm Joe Valencia, manager of the hotel. I would be very grateful if you would give me a few minutes of honest criticism. Ah, no, not you too, groaned Spencer. Look, Joe, what's the gag? You are newcomers, Mr. Spencer, Valencia explained. You are therefore in an excellent position to point out our flaws as you see them. Well, so what? demanded Spencer. I've got more important things to do than to worry about your troubles. You look okay to me. Mr. Valencia, said Prenberg, I've noticed that you walk with a very slight limp. If you have a bad leg, I should think you would do better to develop a more pronounced limp. Otherwise, you may appear to be self-conscious about it. Spencer opened his mouth to protest, but saw with amazement that it was exactly this that Valencia was seeking. Pembroke was amused at his companion's reaction, but observed that Spencer still failed to see the point. Also, there is a certain effeminateness in the way which you speak, said Pembroke. Try to be a little more direct, a little more brisk. Speak in a monotone. It will make you more acceptable. Thank you so much, said the manager. There is much food for thought in what you have said, Mr. Pembroke. However, Mr. Spencer... Your value has failed to prove itself. Only yourself to blame. Cooperation is all we require of you. Valencia left. Spencer ordered another martini. Neither he nor Pembroke spoke for several minutes. Somebody's crazy round here, the fat man muttered after a few moments. Is it me, Frank? No, you just don't belong here in this particular place, said Pembroke thoughtfully. You're the wrong type. But they couldn't know that ahead of time. The way they operate, it's pretty hit or miss operation. But they don't care one bit about us, Spencer. Consider the men who went down with this chip. That was just part of the game. What the hell are you saying? asked Spencer in disbelief. You figure they sank the ship? Valencia and the waitress and the three babes? Oh, come on. It's what you think that will determine what you do, Spencer. I suggest you change your attitude. Play along with them for a few days till the picture becomes a little clearer to you. We'll talk about it again then. Pembroke rose and started out of the bar. A policeman entered and walked directly to Spencer's table. Loitering at the jukebox, Pembroke overheard the conversation. You Spencer? That's right, said the fat man sullenly. What don't you like about me? The truth, buddy. Ah, hell. Nothing wrong with you at all, and nothing'll make me say there is, said Spencer. You're the guy, all right. Too bad, Max, said the cop. Pembroke heard the shots as he strolled casually out into the brightness of the hotel lobby. While he waited for the elevator, he saw them carrying the body into the street. How many others, he wondered, had gone out on their backs during their first day in Puerto Pacifico? Pembroke shaved, showered, and put on the new suit and shirt he had bought. Then he took Marianne, the woman he had met on the beach, out to dinner. She would look magnificent even when fully clothed, he decided, and the pale chartreuse gown she wore hardly placed her in that category. Her conversation seemed considerably more normal after the other denizens of Puerto Pacifico Pembroke had listened to that afternoon. After eating, they danced for an hour, had a few more drinks, then went to Pembroke's room. He still knew nothing about her and had almost exhausted his critical capabilities, but not once had she become annoyed with him. She seemed to devour every factual point of imperfection about herself that Pembroke brought to her attention, and fantastically enough, she actually appeared to have overcome every little imperfection he had been able to communicate to her. It was in this privacy of his room that Pembroke became aware of just how perfect physically Marianne was. Too perfect. No freckles or moles anywhere on the visible surface of her brown skin, which was more than a mere sampling. Furthermore, her face and body were meticulously symmetrical, and she seemed to be wholly ambidextrous. With so many beautiful women in Puerto Pacifico, said Pembroke probingly, I find it hard to understand why there are so few children. Yes, children are decorative, aren't they? said Marianne. I do wish there were more of them. Why not have a couple of your own? he asked. Oh, they're only given to maternal types. I'd never get one. Anyway, I won't ever marry, she said. I'm the paramour type. It was obvious that the liquor had been having some effect. Either that or she had a basic flaw of loquacity that no one else had discovered. Pembroke decided he would have to cover his tracks carefully. What type am I? he asked. Silly, you're real. You're not a type at all. Marianne, I love you very much, Pembroke murmured, gambling everything on this one throw. When you go to Earth, I'll miss you terribly. Oh, but you'll be dead by then, she pouted, so I mustn't fall in love with you. I don't want to be miserable. If I pretended I was one of you, if I left on the boat with you, they'd let me go to Earth with you, wouldn't they? 
Oh, yes, I'm sure they would. Marianne, you have two other flaws I feel I should mention. Yes, please tell me. In the first place, said Pembroke, you should be willing to fall in love with me, even if it will make you eventually unhappy. How can you be the paramour type if you refuse to fall in love foolishly? And when you have fallen in love, you should be very loyal. I'll try, she said unsurely. What else? The other thing is that, as my mistress, you must never mention me to anyone. It would place me in great danger. I'll never tell anyone anything about you, she promised. Now try to love me, Pembroke said, drawing her into his arms and kissing with little pleasure the smooth, warm perfection of her tan cheeks. Love me, my sweet, beautiful, affectionate Marianne, my paramour. Making love to Marianne was something short of ecstasy, not for any obvious reason, but because of subtle little factors that make a woman a woman. Marianne had no pulse. Marianne did not perspire. Marianne did not fatigue gradually, but all at once. Marianne breathed regularly under all circumstances. Marianne talked and talked and talked. But then, Marianne was not a human being. When she left the hotel at midnight, Pembroke was quite sure that she had understood his plan and that she was irrevocably in love with him. Tomorrow might bring his death, but it might also ensure his escape. After 42 years of searching for a passion, for a cause, for a loyalty, Frank Pembroke had at last found his. Earth and the human race that peopled it, and Marianne would help him to save it. The next morning, Pembroke talked to Valencia about hunting. He said that he planned to go shooting out on the desert which surrounded the city. Valencia told him that there were no living creatures anywhere but in the city. Pembroke said he was going out anyway. He picked up Marianne at her apartment, and together they went to a sporting goods store. As he guessed, there was a goodly selection of firearms, despite the fact that there was nothing to hunt and only a single target range within the city. Everything, of course, had to be just like Earth. That, after all, was the purpose of Port Pacifico. By noon, they had rented a jeep and were well away from the city. Pembroke and Marianne took turns firing at the paper targets they had purchased. At twilight, they headed back to the city. On the outskirts, where the sand and soil were mixed and no footprints would be left, Pembroke hopped off. Marianne would go straight to the police and report that Pembroke had attacked her and that she had shot him. If necessary, she would conduct the authorities to the place where they had been target shooting, but would be unable to locate the spot where she had buried the body. Why had she buried it? Because at first she was not going to report the incident. She was frightened. It was not airtight, but there would probably be no further investigation, and they certainly would not prosecute Marianne for killing an Earthman. Now Pembroke had himself to worry about. The first step was to enter smoothly into the new life he had planned. It wouldn't be so comfortable as the previous one, but should be considerably safer. He headed slowly for the old part of town, aging his clothes against buildings and fences as he walked. He had already torn the collar of the shirt and discarded his belt, by morning, his beard would grow to black in his face, and he would look weary and hungry and aimless. Only the last would be a deception. Two weeks later, Pembroke phoned Marianne. The police had accepted her story without even checking, and when, when she would be seeing him again, he had aroused her passion and no amount of long-distance love could requite it. Soon, he assured her, soon. Because, after all, you do owe me something, she added. And that was bad, because it sounded as if she had been giving some womanly thought to the situation. A little more of that, and she might go to the police again, this time for vengeance. Twice during his wanderings, Pembroke had seen the corpses of Earthmen being carted out of buildings. They had to be Earthmen because they bled. Marianne had admitted that she did not. There would be very few Earthmen left in Puerto Pacifico, and it would be simple enough to locate him if he were reported as being on the loose. There was no out but to do away with Marianne. Pembroke headed for the beach. He knew she invariably went there in the afternoon. He loitered around the stalls where hot dogs and soft drinks were sold, leaning against a post in the hot sun, hat pulled down over his forehead. Then he noticed that people all about him were talking excitedly. They were discussing a ship. It was leaving that afternoon. Anyone who could pass the interview would be sent to Earth. Pembroke had visited the docks every day without being able to learn when the great exodus would take place, yet he was certain the first lap would be by water rather than by spaceship, since no one he had talked to in the city had ever heard of spaceships. In fact, they knew very little about their masters. Now the ship had arrived and was too 
leave shortly. If there was any but the most superficial examination, Pembroke would no doubt be discovered and exterminated. But since no one seemed concerned about anything but his own speech and behavior, he assumed that they had all qualified in every other respect. The reason for transporting Earth people to this planet was, of course, to apply a corrective to any of the Pacifico's aberrant mannerisms or articulation. This was the polishing up phase. Pembroke began hobbling toward the docks. Almost at once he found himself face to face with Marianne. She smiled happily when she recognized him. That was a good thing. It is a sign of poor breeding to smile at tramps, Pembroke admonished her in a whisper. Walk on ahead. She obeyed. He followed. The crowd grew thicker. They neared the docks, and Pembroke saw that there were now set up on the roped-off wharves small interviewing booths. When it was their turn, he and Marianne each went into separate ones. Pembroke found himself alone in the little room. Then he saw that there was another entity in his presence confined beneath a glass dome. It looked rather like a groundhog and had seven fingers on each of its six limbs, but it was larger and hairier than the glass one he had seen at the gift store. With four of its limbs, it tapped on an intricate keyboard in front of it. "'What is your name?' queried a metallic voice from a speaker on the wall. "'I'm Jerry Newton. Got no middle initial,' Pembroke said in a surly voice. "'Occupation? I work a lot of trades. Fisherman, fruit picker, fight and range fires, vineyards, car washer, anything. You name it. Been out of work for a long time now, though. Going on five months. These here are hard times, no matter what they say.' "'What do you think of the Chinese situation?' the boys inquired. "'What situation's that?' "'Where's Seattle?' "'Seattle? State of Washington.' And so it went for about five minutes. Then he was told he qualified as a satisfactory surrogate for mid-twentieth century American male, itinerant type. "'You understand your mission, Newton?' the boys asked. "'You are to establish yourself on Earth. "'In time you will receive instructions. "'Then you will attack.' You will not see us, your masters, again until the atmosphere has been sufficiently chlorinated. In the meantime, serve us well. He stumbled out toward the docks, then looked out about for a Marianne. He saw her at last beyond the ropes, her lovely face in tears. Then she saw him. Waving frantically, she called his name several times. Pembroke mingled with the crowd moving toward the ship, ignoring her, but still the woman persisted in her shouting. Sidling up to a well-dressed man about town type, Pembroke winked at him and snickered. "'You Frank?' he asked. "'Hell no, but some poor punk sure red in the face, I'll bet,' the man about town said with a chuckle. "'Those high-strung paramour types always raising a ruckus. They never do pass the interview. Don't know why they even make them. Suddenly, Marianne was quiet. "'Ambulance squad,' Pembroke's companion explained. "'They'll take her off to the buggy house for a few days and bring her out fresh and ignorant as the day she was assembled. Don't know why they keep making them, as I say.' "'but I guess there's a call for that type up there on Earth.' "'Yeah, I reckon there is at that,' said Pembroke, snickering again as he moved away from the other. "'And why not? Hey, why not?' Pembroke went right on hating himself, however, till the night he was deposited in a field outside of Ensenada, broke but happy with two other itinerant types. They separated in San Diego, and it was not long before Pembroke was explaining to the police how he had drifted far from the scene of the sinking of the Elena Mia on a piece of wreckage, and had been picked up by a Chilean trawler. How he had then made his way with much suffering up the coast of California. Two days later, his identity established and his circumstances again solvent, he was headed for Los Angeles to begin his Save Earth campaign. Now, seated at his battered desk in the shabby rented office over Lamarck's the Coors, Pembroke gazed without emotion at the two demolished Pacificos that lay sprawled one on top of the other in the corner. His watch said 1.15. The man from the FBI should arrive soon. There were footsteps on the stairs for the third time that day. Not the brisk, efficient steps of a federal official, but the hesitant, self-conscious steps of a junior clerk type. Pembroke rose as the young man appeared at the door. His face was smooth, unpippled, clean-shaven, without sweat on a warm summer afternoon. Are you Dr. Von Schubert? the newcomer asked, peering into the room. You see, I've got a problem. The four shots from Pembroke's pistol solved his problem effectively. Pembroke tossed his third victim onto the pile, then opened a can of lager, quaffing it appreciatively. Sitting himself once more, he leaned back into the chair, both feet upon the desk. He would be out of business soon, once the FBI agent had got there. 
Pembroke was only in it to get the proof he would need to convince people of the truth of his tale. But in the meantime, he allowed himself to admire the clipping of the newspaper ad he had run in all the Los Angeles papers for the past week. The little ad that had saved mankind from gone do what insidious menace. It read, Are you imperfect? Let Dr. Von Schubert point out your flaws. It is his goal to make you the average for your type. Fee, three dollars and seventy-five cents. Money back if not satisfied. End of The Perfectionists by Arnold Castle Export Commodity by Irving Cox, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Molehill Mountain Export Commodity by Irving Cox, Jr. Three of the hairless bipeds stood in front of the frame building talking. Concealed by the brush beyond the road, Hennig studied them carefully. These were the dominant species on this primitive world, unspeakably grotesque things. The pale, white-skinned animals had a culture of sorts. Their language, their buildings, their wheeled vehicles testified to that but an animal society was very different from the rational civilization Hennig knew. He was naked, and he carried no weapons. That was the logic of the computers. But Hennig was a fleet lieutenant, not one of the scientists. He put his faith in arms rather than computer logic. Stripped of his weapons, he had lost a fundamental part of himself. The computers had said he would be safe, but too many things could go wrong. Too many factors might have been left out of the observer data submitted to the machines. Hennig inched cautiously toward the three white things standing near the wooden structure. The telecommunicator, which the surgeons had planted in his skull, caught the sound of alien voices and made a conceptual translation in terms Hennig understood. He could have used the same device to communicate directly with the alien minds, but the scientist general had warned him against that. The hairless bipeds, he told Hennig, are only an animal species. They have no civilization. Make no mistake about that, Lieutenant. And if we decide we need their planet, sir? We'll set up reservations for them so they can't interfere with our operation. They won't have weapons to match ours, Hennig suggested hopefully. If you go in uniform, Lieutenant, even these witless things would recognize you as an alien. It would be foolish to let them know we exist until we have the final report on your physical survey. Sir, are we actually sure? You're questioning the computer logic? The scientist general was very amused. Not that, sir. It's just... You see, I'm a soldier and I don't understand these things. You'll have to take our conclusion on faith, lieutenant. You're the only individual of your particular species aboard, and it would be absurd for us to wait for the center to send out a scientist with your physical qualifications. This planet is too insignificant for us to waste that much time on the survey. The chemistry of the atmosphere and the pressure of gravity approximate what you're accustomed to on your home world, Lieutenant Hennig, and the coincidence of your appearance is the best disguise you could have. Sir, isn't it true that sometimes on these primitive worlds the animal species war against each other? Wouldn't I be likely to get involved? The computers say no, and we can't argue against mechanical logic, can we, Lieutenant? Naturally, the scientists relied on their data, Hennig thought bitterly, but they weren't making the observation. They weren't standing naked and unarmed on an alien world. The miniature recorders set down by the ship were only machines, after all, without a logical sense of judgment. The lieutenant had experienced alien worlds before. Facts were all very well, but the unpredictable quality of emotion was something else again. How could a recorder make note of that? How could feeling be measured or tabulated by the computers? The lieutenant lay in the brush listening to the talk of the three hairless aliens. It was surprisingly trivial, the sort of thing he might have heard on his home world. The rising price of food in the city, the cost of fuel for their wheeled vehicles, obscure references to politics, an amusing remark about the female of their species. The similarity to what he knew gave Hennig confidence. He slid out of his hiding place and moved toward the three bipeds. This was the ultimate test. 
If the computers had been right, the lieutenant would pass them unnoticed. He was nearly across the road when the alien things saw him. They fell silent and backed away from him. He saw terror in their faces a split second before one of them, a female, began to scream. The second male turned and fled into the trees. The other drew out a cylindrical tube, which was a weapon. Hennig tried to read the emotion in their minds, but the only comprehensible thought the telecommunicator picked up was a paralyzing horror. Hennig sprang at the hairless biped who had the weapon, clawing the ugly white face. The female screamed again and beat at him with her forepaws. The weapon exploded as the male went down, his face a torn, beaten pulp. Hennig felt the hot pain of the metal pellet lodged in the flesh of his shoulder. In panic, he fled beyond the frame building. And the scientist general had said he would be safe, without weapons, without the protection of his uniform. The logic of civilization didn't apply on a primitive world of animal emotions. Hennig expected pursuit, but he heard no footsteps behind him. He stopped running and crept back toward the wooden building. The pain in his shoulder wound spread numbly into the rest of his body. His nerves seethed with nausea. Blood oozed from the torn flesh, congealing on his naked chest. He saw the female bend over the animal which had tried to kill him, her mate, Hennig guessed. Logically, she would have fled, since Hennig was still nearby. Even a primitive would have been aware of the danger. But she seemed more concerned for the male. She wiped the blood from his face tenderly and began to drag him toward a four-wheeled vehicle which stood idle inside the frame building. The lieutenant admired her courage. To risk herself so futilely in order to help another of her species? Entirely illogical. No civilized being would be so foolish, yet heroic and noble. Hennig hated himself for what he had to do. Yet he had no alternative. He couldn't let either of them escape to give the alarm. He sprang at the female. She screamed once as he clawed her throat. The blood pulsed through the wound, and she died quickly. Hennig was glad he could finish it so mercifully with so little pain. He took a rock and beat in the skull of the male. The lieutenant stood beside the frame building, blood dripping from his hands, and looked across the road toward the brush-covered hillside where he had hidden his landing shuttle. It was safe, protected by a refraction field which made the metal tube visually transparent. Hennig had to make a decision, but pain pounding in his wounded shoulder made logical thinking difficult. He could return to the ship now and try to make the scientists understand that the computers had been wrong. His physical appearance was not disguise enough on this unknown world. Or he could complete his survey. With luck, that would be finished before dawn. The test area was relatively close to the hills where he had brought down his shuttle. Yet he knew he had no real choice. His experience with the three hairless bipeds, granting that the scientists accepted it all at face value, was not data enough to outweigh the facts which the mechanical observers had previously fed to the computers. This would be considered an isolated episode, not a basis for hypothetical generalization. The computer logic would strip Hennig of his rank and brand him a coward. He had worked too hard for his lieutenancy to give it up so easily. He had to go through with his assignment. He hid the bodies of the two animals he had killed beside the frame building. The third one, which had escaped, might spread the alarm, but Hennig had no way of preventing that. It was a risk he had to take. He examined the four-wheeled vehicle which was inside the building— it was a relatively primitive mechanism powered by an internal combustion engine. The fact that the native vehicle was one Hennig could drive more than counterbalanced the potential risk from the white-faced animal which had escaped. With any luck, he could have his survey done in half the time he had estimated. The fuel from the alien vehicle gave Hennig part of the answer he needed. The mechanical observers had already used it for fuel. It must have been here in recoverable quantities. The lieutenant needed only to take one sample from the test area for the scientists to determine whether or not the oil was worth the expense of exploiting the planet. Hennig fingered the dash, looked for the ignition. The lettered symbols over the various styles meant nothing to him, since his telecommunicator was capable only of translating spoken words. The lieutenant turned one dial, and sound blared out at him. Music of a sort, 
This primitive animal culture had been clever enough to discover a process for radio transmission. For a second time, the lieutenant found himself unconsciously admiring the hairless bipeds. As inventions go, the internal combustion engine and radio were relatively insignificant. Yet this animal world had developed its technology without outside help, and that suggested a brilliant science. Hennig's empire had a vastly superior technology, but the scientists drew upon the ingenuity and inventive skill of a hundred united worlds, and they had the tool of the logic computers. Far more characteristic of a primitive world was the ignition lock. An animal society, trapped by uncontrolled emotion, would have no mutual trust. Their machines would have to be locked against theft. That was the emotional environment Hennig had expected. But then he thought of the female who had stuck by her mate when it meant her own death. One jarring note, one violation of the predictable pattern, the more he considered it, the more it disturbed him. Was it typical of the way they all behaved? The lieutenant began to envy the illogic that made such affection possible. He thought of the mates he had been assigned from time to time by the psychological services. None of them, in a similar situation, would have tried to help him. Personal heroics were not a part of the computer civilization. He was suddenly conscious of the loneliness and the emptiness of scientific logic. These people, these pale, white-faced animals, had something better. And that thought was heresy. In haste, Hennig broke the ignition lock and twisted the loose wires together so he could start the motor. The seat was designed for bipeds, and it was most uncomfortable for him to drive the car. Fortunately, he had only a short distance to go. The oil field selected for the test area was in the foothills on the outskirts of the city. The traffic was heavier as he approached the field, but it was nearly dark by that time, and no one seemed to notice the lieutenant slumped low behind the wheel of the stolen vehicle. Had the computers been right, he wondered? Did he resemble an animal species which lived at peace among the aliens? In that case, what accounted for the reaction of the three hairless things when they first saw him? He had left the radio going, listening to the weird discord of the savage music. Sometimes a voice sang the melody and his telecommunicator gave him a conceptual analysis of the words. All the lyrics revolved around one theme, personal affection. Love was apparently the dominant trend of this culture. According to their music, they died for it, sighed for it, cried for it. No sacrifice was too great if it were made in the name of love. Hennig saw nothing trite in the wording. His logical mind limited his understanding to a strictly literal translation. He knew that an animal society was built upon emotion, but he had never before come across a primitive world where the focal point was love. Hatred, greed, ambition, conflict, envy, those were typical and normal. The emphasis upon affection put this world in a special category. The white-faced bipeds had discovered a bond stronger than all the logic of the Empire. Because he was logical, the lieutenant had to admit that to himself. If the Empire came to exploit the oil resources, it would destroy something magnificent. But Hennig wasn't sure— he had too little specific data, the courage of one female, the chanted songs of a radio program, and, of course, the lonely isolation of the logical life he lived. But to throw that in as a factor was to argue emotionally, on an animal level, himself. As he turned down a side road into the oil field, the program of music ended and Hennig heard a brief news summary. It was predominantly a report of a developing war, now that made sense. That was the sort of emotional behavior Hennig expected from an animal world. But how could they sing love chants while they simultaneously repaired to slaughter each other? At the end of the broadcast, the newscaster mentioned the discovery of two brutally mutilated bodies behind a mountain garage. An alleged eyewitness is held by the police. He claims to have seen a strange animal approach the victim shortly before the murder. The announcer repeated a very accurate description of Hennig, which, he said, tallied with no species known to zoology. To Hennig, that statement was incomprehensible. The computers couldn't be that wrong. They were objective, logical machines, processing the information submitted by the mechanical observers. The computers said that Hennig resembled a native species. 
that much had to be true. The conclusion that he would be able to pass unnoticed on the alien planet might be faulty for lack of emotional data. But the newscaster claimed no such species existed. The lieutenant hid his vehicle in a copse of trees close to the deserted side road. He slid off the seat, glad to escape the cramped position behind the wheel. As he walked toward the oil field, his wound began to pain him again. With his tongue, he worked the small capsule loose from the back of his mouth, the only place where he could conceal it, since the computers had decreed that he come naked to this world. He stood beside a sump and watched the black earth filter slowly through the membrane into the capsule. In his own mind, Hennig had no doubt that the petroleum resources here were economically worth exploitation. He thought, for a moment, of the brutal occupation by the Empire fleet, the slaughter and the destruction before the survivors could be herded into prison reservations. The killing and the burning of their primitive cities didn't disturb him. The aliens were animals. Because of their biological evolution, they would never achieve a higher social level. They were eternally tied to emotion, and a logical civilization was beyond their mentality. To wipe them out meant no more to Hennig than the extermination of a germ colony or a nest of vermin. Still, the particular emotion dominating these bipeds was unique. It was worth preserving, if that emotion actually existed. If he were reading the data correctly. The lieutenant still didn't know. He still couldn't make up his mind. The test earth seeped slowly into the capsule. Hennig raised his eyes and studied the field. It was dark, and the skeletal shafts of the oil derricks were silhouetted against the glow of the city lights. The hairless bipeds had developed the field extensively. Two or three generations ago, Hennig thought enviously, the planet must have been enormously rich in oil if, after so much native exploitation, it was still worth an empire invasion. Two galactic millennia had passed since the empire had reached that same period in technological growth depleting the petroleum resources of a hundred worlds. The Empire had to have oil, not for fuel, atomic energy had been harnessed long ago, but for lubrication. All the scientists, all the logical computers which governed the Empire, had never come up with a satisfactory substitute. The sample capsule was full. Hennig stood up, sealing the vial against the back of his mouth. And as he turned toward the road, he saw one of the aliens watching him. Behind the biped, a pipe was burning gas exhausted from the field. The flame lit the animal face, and Hennig saw the crushing weight of terror. The animal turned and ran, blowing on a whistle which was suspended around its neck. Hennig sprang after him and caught the white thing with a blow that split the fragile neck bone. But one blast of the alarm whistle had been enough— Hennig saw other animals pouring out of the low-roofed stone building nestled among the oil derricks. Bright lights blazed up, sweeping the field with a deadly glare. Hennig ran toward the trees where he had hidden his vehicle. He saw the lights of other cars on the side road, and he heard the nervous scream of sirens. He swung aside, running in the direction of the suburban cottages in the foothills. Unless he found another vehicle unguarded, he had to return to the shuttle on foot, and that would give the aliens too much time to spread the alarm. As he crossed the main highway, he saw two bipeds walking together, arm in arm. The female began to scream. Hennig had to silence her. He sprang for her throat. Without his customary weapons, that was the only self-defense he had. The male should have turned and fled, since he was not armed. That was sensible, and that was logical. But once more the lieutenant tangled with the unique emotional reactions of this planet. The male held his ground and tried to protect the female. Hennig's first slash missed her throat, and she fought back too. The male's forepaw doubled into a hammer shape, struck Hennig's wounded shoulder, and blood oozed down his naked chest again. The nausea of pain sapped Hennig's strength. He staggered toward the shadows beyond the road. If the two aliens came after him now, he was lost. He was too weak to defend himself. He collapsed, panting and retching. But he heard no footsteps. When he was able, he looked back toward the road. He saw the male holding the female in his arms and mopping blood from the gash Hennig had torn in her cheek. These inexplicable aliens and their affection for each other, 
It defied all logic and reason. Their behavior was absurd, yet somehow sublime, too. From the arid emptiness of his logical mind, Hennig, for a moment, had a vision of something great, a new world which fused the intellect of the computer civilization and the warmth of this animal emotion. These ugly, white-faced animals had a resource far more valuable than petroleum to export to the Empire. Then he heard the sirens coming closer, and he began to run. He saw a brightly lighted street, where bipeds crowded the walks. He turned in panic down a dark alley. The sirens were behind him. He saw savages at both ends of the alley, and he pushed his way blindly into a dark warehouse. He fell across a pile of sacks filled with a soft, grainy substance. A narrow shaft of moonlight made a sharp angle on the floor. He tried to examine his wound in the light. It was still bleeding. The skin was puffy and inflamed. A kind of dull haze crowded the periphery of his mind. The lieutenant knew the symptoms. He had been wounded twice before when the fleet occupied primitive worlds. He would be all right when he reached the shuttle. He had an emergency kit there, and he could sterilize the wound. He heard footsteps and muffled voices in the alley. He shrank closer to the sacks. Unconsciously, he clawed a rent in the cloth and the grain spilled out, making a tiny pyramid in the moonlight. There was a scurrying of tiny feet, a shrill squeal, and a rodent came from the darkness to nibble at the food. It was the smallest rat Hennig had ever seen, no larger than his hand. Instinctively, his mouth began to water. The rat would make a tasty, delicate morsel, and it was a long time since he had eaten— but before he could pounce on it, another animal shot out of the shadows and caught the rat in its claws. Then Hennig knew the truth. He knew why the computers had been wrong, and he knew what data the mechanical observers had failed to transmit. For the small animal, which was torturing the rat with its forepaws, was a physical duplicate of himself, in miniature. No wonder the radio newscaster had said this world had no zoological species like Hennig's. It was a question of relative size, and the error might have amused him, if he had been safely back aboard the exploration ship. Hennig was aware of minor physical differences. The small green-eyed miniature of himself did not walk erect. Its bare feet had not yet evolved the necessary alteration in joint structure. And its claws were still only cutting tools, incapable of more delicate manipulation. Tentatively, Hennig used the telecommunicator to explore the animal mind, he found no indication of a cerebral cortex. But the animal apparently felt the transmission, for it arched its back and every hair on its body stood on end. It dropped the rat and swung toward Hennig, hissing and spitting into the darkness. The lieutenant grinned and purred. This little creature was like a newborn child lying in the family nest. It was the first familiar thing he had found on this alien world of hairless bipeds but his purring frightened the animal. It dropped its rat and fled, screaming. The sound brought the feet running back to the alley door. Hennig heard the pounding fists beating upon the wooden panels. He clawed his way to the top of the pile of sacks where he saw a window. As he broke it open, the door gave and the hairless animals tumbled into the darkness. A weapon flashed and a metal pellet split the wood close to Hennig's head. He leaped through the window. The jar, when he landed, sent pain spiraling through his body. He staggered along a dark street. Behind him, he heard footsteps and hysterical voices. He couldn't outrun them, he knew that. When he saw a garden gate, he pushed it open. He fell exhausted onto a bed of blooming flowers. He didn't quite lose consciousness. He heard the animals when they ran past the garden gate. In the sullen silence, he began to breathe more easily. The terrified pounding of his heart slowed. He tried to push himself to his feet, and he found that his arm below the shoulder wound was paralyzed with pain. He turned on his back and rolled against the legs of a female who stood above him, looking straight ahead toward the street. He waited for her to scream and call the others. Instead, she said in a whisper, "'Poor thing, you're hurt.' Hennig's mind soared with hope. Was it possible that the love these animals felt for each other could be extended to include himself? She knelt beside him, gently feeling his wound with her hairless fingers. Her head was still erect. She did not look at him. 
He winced when she touched him. I'm sorry, she said. I'll have to put something on it for you. She went very slowly to a dilapidated garden shed. She moved by shuffling her feet along the gravel walk, occasionally reaching out to brush her hands against the larger shrubs growing beside the path. When she returned, she poured a liquid over Hennig's wound. The new pain was like fire, but he knew she had used a primitive remedy to burn out the infection. There was no doubt in his mind after that. While some of her species searched the streets for him and tried to kill him, she was ready to give him help. Although the scientist general had warned Hennig against it, he decided to use the telecommunicator. If she would help him, he had a chance of getting back to his shuttle. It was the only way he could escape. He took one risk in using the device. The female might become aware of every concept in Hennig's mind, but that was a small risk. Only an intellectual equal with the heightened perception of the computer civilization would read the full context of his communication. I need help, he conveyed to her. I have a place of safety in the mountains. Will you take me to it? With a sudden, indrawn breath, like the hissing of a small child, the female stiffened beside him. Had he frightened her? He tried to explore her mind, but her cerebral pattern was amazingly complex. He couldn't evaluate the interlocked emotion, shock, sorrow, a sympathetic loneliness, and finally, understanding. How much of his thinking, how much of himself, she had seen, he did not know. Her rational logic was subordinate to the emotion. Her most surprising reaction was pity. Pity for him because of the computer civilization that had shaped his mind. Of course you must go back, she said. So she had dredged that much out of his mind during the brief openness of the telecommunication. And you, you have found a resource that your unfortunate people need. The petroleum? Did she understand about that, too? Then why would she help him escape since it meant the invasion and destruction of her world? She told him she would persuade her brother to drive his truck up the mountain road. She had learned from the telecommunication where Hennig wanted to stop. You'll be hidden in back. Open the door and slip out when we stop. It won't be far to your shuttle. So she had understood that, too. Hennig realized he had grossly underestimated the mental abilities of these emotional animals. Very gently, she put a salve and a bandage on his wound. She helped him into a small panel truck, which was sheltered in a frame building open to the street. Before she closed the door, she handed him a packet of nut meats. This will help you with your other problem. Give them to your scientists. We call these nuts peanuts. They make an excellent oil. You may have the soil on one of your worlds to grow them for yourselves. If not, we might be able to produce the oil for you. She closed the door. Hennig felt a tight constriction in his throat. This hairless female had read every thought in his mind. There was no question of that. And she was letting him go home unharmed. She was helping him escape. To Hennig, this was the final demonstration of the emotion of her species, the quality of love that the computer civilization had never found. He would not let her world be invaded and exploited. The oil resources were not that important. Very carefully, he removed the sample capsule from his mouth and emptied it. With his unhurt arm, he clawed loose dirt together from the floor of the truck and pushed it through the membrane. When the scientists analyzed that sample, they would leave her world in peace. The motor hummed and the truck began to move. In the darkness, Hedig opened the package of peanuts and crushed one between his teeth. As a food, it was very unpalatable. Perhaps the hairless bipeds enjoyed it. From her mind, the telecommunicator had picked up the fact that they looked upon it as a food, but nothing like this was of any value to the Empire. The various species in the computer civilization were not vegetable eaters. Hennig was sure the nut was not a source of oil. The female, of course, had underestimated his mentality, just as he had misjudged hers. The purpose of her gift was forlornly obvious. She wanted to buy off the invasion she had read in his mind, and presumably the nut meat was their favorite food, which they produced in quantity. The lieutenant grinned over her emotional foolishness. Her world needed no subterfuge to protect it. The bipeds had something better. They would be safe. 
Hennig would make sure of that. After a time, the truck came to a stop. Hennig opened the rear door and dropped to the road. He recognized the garage where he had killed the two aliens that afternoon. He knew where he was. The lieutenant leaned for a moment against the open truck door, adjusting to the new pain in his wound. In the front of the vehicle, he saw the girl and her brother. A pale light from the dash fell on their faces. Hennig saw the girl's eyes for the first time, and he suddenly realized that she was blind. No wonder she had helped him then. She hadn't known he was an alien. That accounted, too, for her quick understanding of his telecommunication. Sightlessness had heightened her other perceptions. The radio in the truck was on. The girl and her brother were listening to a newscast reporting the diplomatic maneuvers of something referred to as the Cold War. Impatiently, the blind female snapped off the broadcast. Hennig heard her say softly, Have you ever wondered, Fred, what another race might think of us? They'd call us fools, I suppose. We have the ability to build so much, but instead we're using our science to destroy ourselves. But you know, Fred, I don't think that would seem important to an outsider. Perhaps he wouldn't even be aware of the conflict. Simply because we're human beings, Fred, we have something far more significant. We have it because men and women have to live together, because... Love? Her brother laughed. We take that for granted. <laughs> It's a pity we can't see ourselves just once, as strangers might. We would be able to understand our own greatness then. But Henning didn't know that, for he wasn't conscious of how much of a change the impact of love had made in himself. He was thinking about the last mate the psychological services had assigned him. He wanted to see her again. He wanted to see her litter of young hissing and purring in the family nest. It was the first time in his life he had felt the need to go back, and the feeling was a factor no computer could measure. He would have clawed the throat of any scientist who told him such thinking was illogical, for Hennig had found what he considered to be the higher logic of emotion. Silently, Hennig scurried through the forest toward his shuttle, carrying with him a useless sample of dust fastened at the back of his mouth, and an idea that would one day overthrow his computer civilization. An emotion marked for export from an anthropoid world. The Exportable Commodity of Man End of Export Commodity by Irving Cox, Jr. Least to Doomsday by Lee Archer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Blakely. Least to Doomsday by Lee Archer. It was the lack of sense in the ad that made him go back to it again. He was having his breakfast coffee in the cafeteria next to the Midtown Hotel where he lived. The classified section of the New York Times was spread before him. Wanted. Live wire real estate broker. No selling. 3040. Room 657. Silver's Building. 9 to 12. Monday morning. The ad made no sense for several reasons. One, you just don't go around advertising the brokers with four pages of them in a classified film book. Two, how can one be a live wire broker without having to sell? Kevin Muldoon shook his head. Just no damn sense. The Silvers Building. Hmm. Not too far off. He looked at his strap watch, 15 minutes of nine. He could walk it in that time. Don't be a fool, he said to himself. It's obviously a come on of some kind. He got up, paid the check, and went out. It wasn't until he was on 3rd Avenue that he was conscious he had started to go cross town when his office was in the opposite direction. He smiled wryly. Might as well investigate, he thought. Can't do any harm, and it won't take long. There were four others waiting in the small anteroom. The outer door bore no legend other than the other room number, and the inner door was blank altogether. Muldoon made a quick appraisal of those waiting. Three were obviously past middle age, the fourth about Muldoon's age. The inner door opened and Muldoon looked up. A tall man came out first, a man in his early sixties perhaps. Immediately behind him came a slightly shorter man, but very heavy and with a head that was bald as a billiard ball. The older man marched straight to the door, opened it, and went out without a second look back. The fat man looked around, his face beaming in a wide smile. 
eyes almost closed behind fleshy lids. And now, who's next? he asked. The one who was about Muldoon's age stepped forward. The fat man motioned for the other to precede him. The door closed. Not more than a minute went by, and the door opened again, and the same act as before with the older man was gone through. And now, who's next? the fat man asked. Muldoon noted even the inflection was the same. So it went with the three who were left, until it was Muldoon's turn, and now there were six others beside himself, also waiting to be interviewed. It was a squarish room, simply furnished, with a couple of desks set side by side with a narrow space between them. A chair was set up facing the desks, obviously meant for the one to be interviewed. Seated behind one of the desks was the twin of the man now coming to seat himself at the other desk. Their smiles were identical as they waited for Muldoon to make himself comfortable. For a moment, there was a blank silence. Muldoon studied them, and they, smiling still, studied him. Muldoon broke the silence. You know, Muldoon said, your ad didn't make sense to me. The twins hunched forward slightly at their desks. Their eyes brightened in anticipation. No, said the one who had been waiting for Muldoon. Why? With some four pages of brokers in the classified directory, you don't have to advertise for one. And a live wire broker gets that reputation as a salesman. Without selling, the wire is dead. The twins beamed at each other. Evan, said the one to the left, I think we found our man. Will you go out and tell those waiting? They waited for the twin to return. I am Robert Rieger, my brother Evan, said the first twin. Muldoon introduced himself. There was no handshaking. You are right about the ad, Robert Rieger said. We worded it that way for a reason. We wanted a man of quick intelligence. Mind you now, we do want a broker, and one who will do no selling. The live wire part was my brother Evan's thought. He does sometimes have clever ideas. Robert stopped to beam at his twin. Just now, Robert returned to Muldoon. I won't go into full discussion of our plans. Briefly, however, we are buyers, buyers, we hope, of a particular area. Because of what we have in mind to do, we would rather it was done quietly and without any publicity. Had we engaged the services of a large agency, this would not be possible, for if I may coin a phrase, the trumpet must blow strongly to announce the coming of genius. He smiled, stroked his chin, looked up at the ceiling, and his lips moved silently as if he enjoyed repeating the phrase. I like that, Robert, Evan said. Yes, I thought it was good, Robert said. They both looked to Muldoon. Muldoon said nothing. The twins sighed audibly, in unison. Robert's lips came forward in a pout. The look of a pouting cherub, Muldoon thought. One trying to look stern and only succeeding in looking naughty childish. Muldoon suddenly knew of whom the twins reminded him. Twin Charles Lawton's, without hair. You are free to work for us, Robert asked. With you? Muldoon said. I have the license. He gave them a quick smile as if to lessen the sharpness of the tone he had used. A broker acts for a client in the purchase or sale of property. He can't be employed by them. Of course, Robert said quickly. I did not mean to imply any other action. Now suppose you tell us briefly about yourself. Muldoon gave them a thumbnail sketch of his career. He noted their pleased look that he was a one-man agency. At the conclusion, Robert stood up and came round the desk. He thrust a hand at Muldoon. Like shaking hands with a piece of warm dough, Muldoon thought. I do believe, Robert said as he placed a heavy arm around Muldoon's shoulder and walked him to the door, that we shall have a mutually happy relationship. You will not be unrewarded money-wise. He opened the door, paused, still with his arm around Muldoon, and looked steadily into Muldoon's eyes. Yes, I think there will be mutual benefits in our relationship. Now, in conclusion, will you pick us up at this office tomorrow morning at nine? Muldoon nodded. Good! Then bye now, Mr. Muldoon, and thanks so much for coming by in an answer to our ad. The answer to an irritating thought came to Muldoon while he was waiting for an elevator to take him to the ground floor. He knew where he had seen the same kind of look as was in Robert Rieger's eyes when they had parted. In the eyes of a cat Muldoon had once seen toying with the mouse the cat had caught. Dina Savory was a redhead, a green-eyed redhead with a kind of patrician look about her face that came off very well in the photographs they took of her. Dina was a model, and made three times the money Kevin Muldoon made. It had always been a sore point between them, and more than once the reason for their worst quarrels. She was also the worst cook in New York. Monday evenings were spent in Dina's small apartment on East 56th Street, and she usually cooked dinner for Muldoon. Invariably, it was steak. Dina had no imagination when it came to food. Even in restaurants, she ordered one or another kind of steak. They were together on the couch, the stretch fold leg, her head in Muldoon's lap. He was telling her about the Rieger twins and what had happened that morning. 
His hands caressed her lightly as she spoke, now across her cheeks, now more intimately. I don't dig them, honey, he said, as if in recapitulation. The Robert twin, for instance. You will not be unrewarded money-wise. Madison Avenue and Ninth Century English. She gently took his hand from where he seemed to find most comfort and put it up to her cheek. What's the difference, she asked, so long as there's money in it? Broker's commission, he said. No more or less. You've been getting so much of that lately. N no. Okay, then. Stop fighting it. What do you care what kind of English they use? Or whether they use sign language? The buck, kid. The buck. Dina, Muldoon said gravely, you have the grubbing soul of a pawnbroker. Or real estate broker, he added. He bent his head and kissed her lips. Her lips opened to his with that familiar warmth, a hunger for him which never failed to thrill. This time, she did not remove his hand when it returned. Kevy, baby. Darling. Oh, my darling, she whispered. Strange, he thought, that at a moment like this, I should be thinking of those fat twins. Muldoon hated the pirate prices of midtown parking lots, and so was late. It had taken him ten minutes to find parking space for the Plymouth. As he started to open the door of room 657, he heard the voice of one of the twins. The words or sounds were in a language completely foreign to him. He thought to knock, but changed his mind. To knock would have made it obvious he had been listening. He barged right in. The twins were in the ante room. Muldoon got the impression they knew he had heard them, and an even stronger impression that the fact was of no importance. That bothered him, for some reason. Ah, there you are, the twin to the left said. Evan was wondering whether you would show up, but I told him he was putting himself to useless aggravation. That damn mix-up phrasing again, Muldoon thought. Took a little time to find parking space, he said. Shall we be off then? Robert asked. All right with me, Muldoon replied. There was another odd thing. Evan Rieger seemed to have so very little to say. Their destination was a place halfway down the island. Muldoon's brow had lifted when they gave him the area. So far as he knew, there hasn't been any development in the area. It was just a bit too far up the highways and rail lines for housing developments, and even more badly located for industrial requirements. He wondered what the devil they had in mind out there. Traffic was light, and the drive took little more than an hour and a half on the main highway and another 15 minutes of blacktop side road before Evan told him to turn left here, onto a red path of the blacktop. The path had led through some scrub growth that ended on the edge of an acre or so of dump heap. Rusted heaps of broken cars were scattered about. A foul odor came from the left as though garbage, too, had been dumped and left to rot. There was a flat, one-storied wooden shack close by to which Evan directed him to drive up to. Evan produced a key and opened the door to the shack. There was a partition separating the place neatly into two sections. There were a couple of straight-backed wooden chairs and a leather sofa to the near room. The door to the other room was closed. Sit down, Muldoon, Robert Eager said. He waited for Muldoon to make himself comfortable on the sofa, then continued. First time we've ever been out here during the day, but Evan's sense of direction is unfailing. He shook his head, smiled brightly. Ah, uh, well, we m must each have some factor to make for validity of existence, eh? I don't follow, Muldoon said. No matter. Now to the business at hand. I wanted you to see the area involved. Evan, the plot plan, please? To Muldoon's surprise, Evan Ricker went into the next room and returned after a moment with the plot plan of the lower third of the island. He gave it to Muldoon, who spread it at his feet. The red-penciled area I've marked off, Robert Rieger said, is what we'll be concerned with. As you notice, the dump and the shack are at the proximate center. What I have in mind to do is buy all the land in the marked off area. Buy it? You seem surprised. Shocked would be the better word. Have you any idea what this could cost? You've marked off an area of approximately a square mile. Even out here, that would run into millions. And once news got around that someone was buying parcels of this size, well, you'd have more publicity than you might want. About the cost, we won't worry. There will be enough money. But the attendant publicity could mean not being able to get the land we want. Is that correct? Could be. Suppose we get options, or leases on these pieces. That was a good phrase, Evan broke in unexpectedly. Don't you think so, Robert? Yes, Robert said sharply. He seemed to have suddenly lost his smile. He gave Evan a hard look from under down-drawn brows. He turned to Muldoon. We are renting this, this tumble-down structure. A two-year lease. Hmm. I see your point. Spending millions in a sudden buying move would make unneeded difficulties. No. Options to buy, but lease for the present. Evan, the list of names, please. 
Evan didn't have to go anywhere for the list. He had had it with him. Muldoon looked it over. There were 33 names, including the county and state. Well, Robert said, I'll have to know what you want to lease it for. The name or names of corporations, and so forth. Will my own name do? It will, but you can go into the county court and register a business name under your own, what they call a DBA name, doing business as name. Register as many as you wish. Doesn't cost a great deal. Or form a corporation, you and your brother. No. Let the leases come under my own name. As for what I intend doing, well, I intend to concrete service the entire area. A square mile of concrete? Yes, there is a government plan to use this end of the island for a huge missile depot. They will have to come to me. Pretty shrewd, Muldoon thought. That is, if it's true. All right, Muldoon said. When do you want me to start? Right now. That was one reason for bringing you out here. Evan, will you get the briefcase, please? Once more, Evan Rieger went into the other room and closed the door carefully behind him when he came out. He handed the briefcase to Muldoon. You may open it, Robert said. Muldoon's fingers became suddenly nerveless, and he dropped the briefcase. It was crammed with money, packets of $100 bills. There are 50 packets of $100 bills, totaling a million dollars, Robert said. What the hell do you want me to do, carry the case around with me? Muldoon asked. No, it will remain here. I merely want to show you I will be able to stand behind any price you may have to meet. From now on, report here, no matter what time. And, since time has a definite value in this matter, do not stand upon it. I like that, Evan said suddenly. That was good, Robert. Muldoon nodded. Evan had a value, too. The same value any guest man has. But it bothered Muldoon. This just wasn't the way of twins. At least none he knew. Well, one thing was certain. The Riegers had the ready cash. This may take some time, Muldoon said. Weeks. Certainly. Maybe months. The county and state alone. We don't have that much time, Robert broke in. Evan must return in ten days. Return? Where? Muldoon asked. It was as if Robert hadn't heard. The state and county properties are small areas, and on the very edge. Suppose we forget about them for the time being. Work on the private parties. Anything you say. But it may still take weeks. Then don't quibble. Lease at any price. If a show of cash is necessary, let me know. No, I think you'd better start. Good luck, Muldoon. It was Wednesday night before Muldoon saw Dita Savory again. Nor had he seen the Rieger twins since leaving them Monday morning. Dina and Muldoon seldom saw each other during the middle of the week. They were her busy days, and she needed the nights for complete rest. But he had called her and asked to see her. They were at dinner in a small Italian place close to her apartment. He had briefly brought her up to a date on what had happened since she had seen him last, and was at the moment finishing the last of the lasagna he had ordered. They're phonies, honey, real phonies, he said. I'll bet my last buck on that. He was looking at the last piece of steak on her plate. With an almost defiant gesture, she speared it and put it in her mouth. At a girl, he said. Mind your own business, she said. How do you mean they're phonies? I spent all Monday investigating them. A fine way to make a dollar, she said. What do you care who they are? He gave her a knowing smile. That's my fat-headed girl. Like to visit me in a nice jail, wouldn't you? One with prestige address, of course. Let me tell you, they rented that shack and the dump heap next to it for a pretty fancy figure. Robert Rieger said they were going to do printing in that shack. They paid in full for the two years' rental and nice crisp hundred-dollar bills. I get it. They were phony, she exulted. How can you be so stupid? I know. For you, it's easy. Of course the bills were genuine. But the printing business? What were they going to print with? Typewriters? Another thing. There's no business record I can find on them. They're not listed. So how did they get a million dollars? And Robert said more. Report here, no matter what the time. I don't get it. I drove them out. There was no garage, no car I could see, and the place is miles from food. How did they live out there? Maybe they have friends who pick them up, Dina said. Maybe. Robert also said there was a rumor or something about the government going to use the area for a missile depot. I tried to run it down. Nothing. Which proves nothing, she said. True, but I couldn't even smell smoke. No, the whole thing just smells bad. So I think I'm going back there and tell them to forget it. Oh, don't be an idiot, she said. This is your big chance to make some real money, get a reputation, and because you're chicken, you're going to throw it up. I won't get into anything crooked, his voice rose. The way you're thinking, you couldn't follow a straight line. They can't draw a straight line. Well, you do what you want. Only, the next time I have to pay for a dinner, don't give me that martyred look. Okay, okay, what do you want for dessert? Supermoni? After this, bicarbonate. Very funny. 
and for the first time in several years, she did not kiss him goodnight when they parted. He turned off the blacktop and started down the rutted path. He switched the headlights off about halfway to the shack and parked it a hundred or so yards away from it and walked the rest. The shack was dark. Instead of knocking, Muldoon walked around to the back and peered through the single window at the rear. He could see nothing. Now isn't this just dandy, he thought. Drive all the way out here and nobody's at home. Damn. He went around to the front and started back to his car. His attention was caught by a greenish glow of light from the far end of the dump heap. His curiosity aroused. Muldoon warily made his way through the metal litter until he was close enough to make out the source of the light. It came from the center of a shallow area that had been cleared of rubble. A rusted, misshapen mass of metal lay in the center of the cleared space. The greenish glow was coming from an opening in the mass. Muldoon crept closer until he was able to make out details. Not too many, but enough to give him an idea of the size and general shape of the thing. But what really held him were the figures of Robert and Evan Reeker. He saw them quite distinctly. One of the twins was bent over a machine of some sort. There were levers, gears, and rollers mounted on a wedge platform no larger than a rather oversized typewriter. Muldoon's eyes went wide at the sight of the green backs coming in a steady stream from the interior of the machine and falling into a box at the side. He could see very little else that was in the room other than the brother of the twin at the machine. He was on the far side of it, fiddling with something hidden. Muldoon stared in fascination for another minute, then carefully made his way back to the car. He had parked it within the growth of scrub trees and bushes. He started it, turned the headlights on, and drove slowly out into the open and up to the shack. He bonked his horn loudly a couple times and got out of the car and walked up to the shack and tried the door. It was close. Presently, the figures of Evan and Robert Rieger came into view from the direction of the dump heap. Muldoon's figure was outlined in the glow of the headlights. Muldoon noticed the briefcase one of them was carrying. Ah, there, Muldoon. Muldoon had recognized Robert's voice. Hello, Mr. Rieger. Thought I'd come by and let you know how I've been doing. Evan, who was carrying the briefcase, unlocked the door and switched on the light. The other two followed him into the room. Robert Rieger motioned for Muldoon to take the sofa. Evan went into the other room. Well, my boy, Robert said heartily, how is it going? Slowly, Muldoon said casually. But the first of this sort of operation has to go that way, kind of feeling things out, if you know what I mean. Of course. How does it look? I think it's going to go all right. I've got plans. Splendid. Do you need money? Yes. About 10000 Evan, do bring the case out, Robert called loudly. In a couple seconds, Evan Rieger appeared. He brought the briefcase to his brother, turned, and went back into the other room without saying anything. He walked slowly and stiffly, his feet slapping heavily on the bare boards. What's wrong with him? Muldoon asked. Robert Rieger was pulling money from the briefcase. He looked up with an expression on his face. Nothing. You said 10000 Yes. Rieger passed two of the packets to Muldoon. Sure you won't need more? Muldoon put the money away, got up from the sofa, and started to the door. No, just what I need. Uh, I'll see you Friday night. Fine, and don't forget, we must get all this done quickly. I won't forget. Robert Rieger waited till the sound of the Plymouth was no longer heard. Then he went into the other room. Other than for two army cots, the room was empty. Evan was stretched full length on one of the cots. You're certain he knows, Evan asked. Yes, I saw him on the Vizio. But he couldn't see all the interior? No, just the duplicating machine. We must get rid of it tonight. What do you think he will do? What can he do? He knows nothing. The money is genuine, and with the destruction of the machine, he can't prove anything. Nevertheless, it might be the wisest course to get rid of him. We might have been too clever with that advertisement. Possibly. But we must move quickly, then. I must leave this planet in seven days now, and we must have this area under lease by then. Three musts. Robert smiled thinly. We will. If not through Muldoon, then through another means. When you return in a year with the space fleet, you will find the landing area we need. And after that? They smiled at each other. We said we would not fail. This planet will fall to our weapons like ripe fruit from a tree. But first I must return to tell them, Evan said. If I do not return, they will know we have failed, and we will seek another planet. We won't fail, Robert reiterated. Right now, let's get back to the spaceship and the duplicating machine. Muldoon spent a busy Thursday. A news brief in the Times financial section, which told of a public utility wanting island property, gave him an idea for one thing. He spent all morning bringing the idea to a head after he had verified the truth of the item. Then, after a late lunch, he went to the Treasury Department's headquarters and spent a couple of hours with the head of the local investigation department. 
He was quite pleased with himself by nightfall. As he headed out to the island, this time he parked the car at a considerable distance from the shack. There were lights on, this night. He walked boldly up and knocked at the door. It opened wide, and the thick figure of one of the twins darkened the opening. Well, Mr. Muldoon, I did not think to see you till Friday. I thought I'd come and see you tonight, Muldoon said as he stepped into the room. I didn't hear the car. Oh, parked it back a bit, Muldoon said. He turned toward the other twin as the inner door opened. Hello. Hello. You know Evan, Robert said. I'm rather glad Muldoon stopped by tonight. We might as well conclude our business with him now. An excellent idea, Robert. Excellent. What do you mean, Muldoon asked. I no longer am acting for you? Not for us. For yourself. I'm afraid your services, in any capacity, will no longer be needed. Muldoon caught the undercurrent of menace in Robert's voice. It told him they were not only suspicious, but ready to act on it. He started to edge toward the door, but Robert suddenly reached out and took his arm. There was power in the fat man's grip. Evan moved swiftly for his size and took up a position before the door, which he kicked shut. Muldoon twisted sharply and was freed the other's grip. He stepped back a couple of paces. What the hell's this all about? Come on now, Muldoon, Robert said softly. You didn't think your prying went unobserved last night? So I was nosy, but what's this rough stuff you're trying to pull? Merely making sure your curiosity will end tonight. Muldoon took a couple of more retreating paces. You mean you're trying to get rid of me? Well, maybe you will, and maybe you won't. But even if you do, a smile broke through the grim lips of the twin threatening Muldoon. You mean the duplicating machine? Just another piece of rusted scrap among the rest of the junk. Muldoon paled. The evidence he was going to need. Gone. And of course the money is genuine. We made sure of it. Ink, paper, everything. We made sure of it long ago. It will be a pity you won't be here to see how efficient we can really be. But the rest of the planet will know, as soon as Evan returns. Muldoon's mind was working swiftly. You got rid of the machine, but what about the junk shop it was in? I'll bet there are more important things there. Indeed there are, but no one will find it. It will be just another rusted piece of large junk to them. It was then Muldoon made his move. He lashed out with a fist. The blow staggered Robert, and Muldoon was crashing his shoulder against the inner door. It burst inward, but before he could get through, Robert grabbed him. The whole side of Muldoon's face went numb as Robert crashed his fat fist against his jaw. Muldoon knew he didn't stand a chance in a straight-up fight, not with these two. Robert's hands were reaching for him now. Muldoon grabbed one of the hands with both of his, twisted outward as he grasped two fingers in each hand. Robert's face went putty gray as the bones snapped. Muldoon no longer cared about fair play. His knee came up where it could do most damage, and Robert sank grovelly to the floor. Muldoon whirled. Too late. The world exploded in a thousand flashes of pain-filled lights. He went crashing backward into the wall. Evan hit him again before he stumbled blindly away from the terrible fist. Let me kill him, Robert groaned. Muldoon pulled himself up from the pain-filled world he had been sent into. There seemed to be two Evans facing him. There was only one. A twisted grin came to Muldoon's lips. Come ahead, you rat, he mumbled. Evan came forward, and as swift as an adder, Muldoon kicked him just below the kneecap. Evan screamed and collapsed. Muldoon staggered out of the way of the falling body, only to fall into the clutches of Robert's sudden reaching fingers. He fell to the floor. Robert tried to get his good hand up to Muldoon's throat. Muldoon beat at the thick face with both hands, but the other seemed not to feel the pounding fists. Slowly, the fingers managed to reach their goal. Muldoon felt the darkness of death closing over him as his breath became a tortured, dying gasp. His hand found Robert's face, came gently over it until his thumb pressed on one eyeball, and Robert screamed as the thumb became a hooked instrument to blind him. Muldoon rolled away from the other, staggered somehow erect, but knew his strength was gone. He couldn't make it to the door, and now Evan had him. And the door burst open, and men poured into the room. Muldoon recognized only one, the head of the Treasury's investigation department, before he blacked out. Dina Savory stroked his forehead gently. Does it hurt much, baby? The nurse had left them alone when Dina came into the hospital room. Not now, Muldoon said. What are they going to do to those men, she asked. Oh, twenty years, according to Phillips. Counterfeiting, you know, carries heavy penalties. But I thought the money was good. After all, they had paid rent with C-notes. A slip-up on the bank's part. You see, they made one mistake. The machine they had turned out perfect bills, every one with the same serial number. Dina's eyes widened. 
in the junk shop or whatever it was, she said. I thought I'd let well enough alone. You see, I took care of that during the day. The twins being criminals had automatically broken their lease. They also made it possible for me to change clients. Well, there's going to be a huge tank covering that dump and shack. A tank holding an awful lot of natural gas. I got together with the owner of the property and the utility people yesterday afternoon and worked at a deal. They're going to dump all that junk into the ocean. I'm sorry about the other night, she said suddenly. Is that how you say you're sorry, he asked. Uh-uh, she said as he reached for her. There's a time and place for that. Promise? Her lips agreed. End of Least to Doomsday by Lee Archer Not in the Script by Arnold Marmer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Julius Barnes' assignment was to write a play that would save Earth from an invasion. He wrote well. And yet the crucial scene was not in the script by Arnold Marmer. Colin Schratt studied his image in the silver-framed mirror. His mustache was neatly clipped. His face was clean-shaven and well-talcumed. His captain's uniform, light blue, was pressed and looked as if it had just been bought. He was fastidious in everything he did. He looked away from the mirror as the valet approached. Mr. Barnes is ready to see you, sir, the valet said. Good. Captain Schratt was ushered into the study, where Jules Barnes was waiting. Won't you be seated, Barnes invited. The captain sat, laid his cap on his knee. A drink? No, thank you. Mind if I have one? Of course not. Barnes fixed himself a drink. He seated himself on the sofa, leaning back, and said, Now, what's it all about? What would an intelligence officer want with me? I'm not only representing the Americas at this moment, Mr. Barnes, but all of Earth as well. I'm here to ask you to do a service for the world. A service? Barnes sipped at his drink. You must be mistaken about me, Captain. I'm just a playwright. But I haven't made a mistake, Mr. Barnes, and you can save the world just by writing a play. Oh, come on now. Mr. Barnes, within two months we shall have a visitor from Mars. Julius Barnes finished his drink. You don't say. I do say. Are you sure you wouldn't have a drink? Or have you had too many? Mind if I use your phone? Go right ahead. The captain dialed a number, said into the mouthpiece, General, Schratt, I'm at Barnes's. Yes, of course. Have the president put on, will you? The captain turned to Barnes. You'd recognize the voice of William Livingston, the President of the Americas, wouldn't you? Barnes nodded his head silently. He took the receiver from Schratt and listened gravely. The captain watched the playwright put down the receiver. Well, he said. Barnes sat down, gulped noisily. I'm listening. We're going to have a visitor from the planet Mars. Now supposedly they will be here on a friendly mission. But that will not be so. Their purpose is to determine our strength. If they decide we are ahead in nuclear physics and rocket ship expansion, we will be attacked. If they decide we are behind in experiments, then we will be safe. I don't understand. Why shouldn't they attack us if they know we are weak? They're not in any great hurry. If they believe we are strong and ready to launch rocket ships into space, then they will stop us, determined that we should never leave our planet to conquer space. If they believe we are weak and backward, they will let us alone for the time being. As long as we aren't a threat, then they'll feel safe, ready to conquer us at their own sweet time. 
They move when they think we're strong, ready to blast ships into space, ready to conquer the stars. Till then, they'll let us alone, knowing we're weak and ineffectual. How do you know all this? Barnes asked, moving to make himself and Shrat drinks. This time the captain accepted his drink. How can you possibly know their plans? We've picked up their ship by radar. We've been listening in on their conversations with Mars through the new IBM machine. And Germany has sent their best code experts to give a hand. They broke down the language, and the messages between Mars and their ship was in code. So the experts did a double job, and well, too, I might add. All the governments of the world have been alerted. They're all ready to cooperate. Well, where do I come in? We want you to write a play. A play? Yes, a play. And every industry on Earth will be a participant. You will write and direct. The world will be the stage. Don't you see? You will write and direct every move that will convince the Martians we are backward. We are nothing. We are insignificant. They must be convinced our industry doesn't compare with theirs. Our brains are childish to theirs. Our leaders are weak and ineffectual. Our weapons mere toys. You must write this play before they get here. It will be your greatest triumph. It will be the play of all plays. It will be the play that will save the world from destruction. It must be written within a month. That's what we want you to do. Within a month? That's impossible! A month to write the play, a month to rehearse. Not even a month to rehearse. You have to get busy on it right away. But how far are you advanced? Can you conquer space tomorrow? Of course not. Then why are we going to all this trouble? Just let them see for themselves the way things really are. We can't possibly hurt them now. Why bother putting on an act for them? We are advanced to some degree, of course. Progress can't be stopped. But we don't want them to know exactly how advanced we are. They are our enemies. You must remember that. We have to show them we are weaker than we really are. I see your logic. Good. You will cooperate with us then? Of course. You realize it must be a silent triumph for you if we are successful. Of course. I'm at your service. You will start immediately. I'll keep in touch with you daily. You'll need facts and figures, of course. You'll get a list of industry heads, scientists, and military men. They'll all be meeting our Martians. They must have their lines to read, their every movement that will convince the Martians of our stupidity. It's going to be some political football at the next election. You can't keep the politicians silent. Oh, yes, we can. This will be more like a project than a play. I'll have to take my leave now, Mr. Barnes. The captain stood up. I have many matters to attend to. Of course. Good day, Captain. Julius Barnes worked on his play every waking hour. His eyes grew tired. His fingers grew stiff. His brain grew weary. The play was finished in twenty-five days. He handed it to Captain Shratt and went to sleep five minutes later. Captain Shratt shrugged off all suggestion of getting a top Broadway director to handle the second assignment, that of directing the participants in the play. So Julius Barnes directed the military, the industry, the sciences, in their performances, which would take place when the adversary would come face to face with the Earth's genius. Barnes and Shratt went from government to government by jet, meeting the brains of each power, directing and coaching. Finished, Captain Shratt said, leaning back in his seat as the jet took off for Washington. 
What if it doesn't come off? Barnes said. Don't think about it. Barnes felt his stomach jump toward his back as the ship hummed its way towards the heavens. He still hadn't got used to the jets. When the plane leveled off, he said, We could always capture the Martians, hold them as hostages. Do you possibly think they hold as great a price on life as we do? Their philosophy is as different from ours as night and day. You seem to know an awful lot about them. Our men are listening in on every conversation that passes between their ship and Mars. We've learned a lot. I'm beginning to think you're more advanced than you're letting on. In many matters, Mr. Barnes, you're still an outsider. Security, you must understand. Especially now. You've done the Earth a great service, but I'm still under orders. There are many things I can't let you in on. If you were a soldier, you'd readily understand. So a certain wall, not too high, though, must always remain between us. I'm not a soldier, true, but I do understand. You may be interested to know that the ship will be landing within a week. Really? I guess I'd better stay out of the way. Oh, you'll be on hand in case something goes wrong and a new line must be written into the script fast. There must be no blunders. If there are, then we must cover up. So you'll be close by, ready to write, ready to coach. I wonder what they'll look like. You'll be finding out soon enough. In order to avert panic, the world was alerted to the coming of the Martians four days before the strange arrival. They came. Tall and thin, with translucent skin, and eyes that were almost invisible, they were that small. There were four, two men and two women. The women's hair was as short as the men's. Their breasts made slight bulges under their tunics. It seemed they had listened in to radio broadcasts, and spoke English, French, Italian, Polish, and Spanish very well. They knew the Americas was the strongest of the world governments, and so had landed there. The year, 1968, became a memorable year, the year when contact was made with another planet. Julius Barnes remained on the sidelines. During the three weeks the Martians remained, there was no need for him. But he stayed by, ready to act in any way he was needed. The Martians went from government to government, inspecting industry, meeting scientists and military men. Everything was as friendly as could be. When the Martians retired to their rooms, they had hurried conversations. We were behind the times. Our scientists were incredibly stupid. Our military men were old ladies. And our industry was only fit to make children's toys. Hidden microphones revealed all this. Everything has gone according to plan, Captain Schratt told Barnes the day the Martians blasted off for their home planet. We've nothing to worry about. I'm glad. I've been on the edge the whole time they were here. I've got reports to make out, so I'll have to leave now. But we'll get together again sometime. Certainly. Barnes shook hands, and Shrat left the playwright's apartment. Hello, General, Captain Shrat said, entering his office. He took off his cap tossed it on the leather chair, and went behind his desk. "'I've come from the President,' the General said. "'He says the time has come.' "'Good,' Shrat sat down. "'I wish I was coming along.' "'You're needed here. "'What about this fellow Barnes? "'He knows an awful lot.' "'We've nothing to worry from him. "'Besides,' Once we've started, there's nothing anyone can do. 
Our fleet of spaceships is ready to take off within hours. It's best to wait until the Martian ship was well on its way. Then we could start operations. When we get to Mars, they'll be unprepared. Earth will be supreme. Captain Shrat lit a cigarette. Only Mars could have stopped us if they'd decided to attack us. Now that threat is gone. They won't know what hit them. Thanks to a playwright and his sense of devotion to Earth. The end of Not in the Script by Arnold Marmor Accidental Death by Peter Bailey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Blakely Accidental Death by Peter Bailey The most dangerous of weapons is the one you don't know is loaded. The wind howled out of the northwest, blind with snow and barbed with ice crystals. All the way up the half-mile precipice, it fingered and retched away at groaning ice slabs. It screamed over the top, whirled snow in a dervish dance around the hollow there, piled snow into the long furrow plowed ruler straight through streamlined hummocks of snow. The sun glinted on black rock glazed by ice, chasms and ridges and bridges of ice. It lit the snow slope to a frozen glare, penciled black shadowed down the long furrow, and flashed at the furrow's end on a thing of metal and plastics, an artifact thrown down in the dead wilderness. Nothing grew, nothing flew, nothing walked, nothing talked. But the thing in the hollow was stirring in stiff jerks like a snake with its back broken or a clockwork toy running down. When the movement stopped, there was a click and a strange sound began. Thin, scratchy, inaudible more than a yard away, weary but still cocky. There leaked from the shape in the hollow the sound of a human voice. I've tried my hands and arms and they seem to work, it began. I've wiggled my toes with entire success. It's well on the cards that I'm all in one piece and not broken up at all, although I don't see how it could happen. Right now, I don't feel like struggling up and finding out. I'm fine where I am. I'll just lie here for a while and relax and get some of the story on tape. This suit's got a built-in recorder. I might as well use it. The way, even if I'm not as well as I feel, I'll leave a message. You probably know we're back and wonder what went wrong. I suppose I'm in a state of shock. That's why I can't seem to get up. Who wouldn't be shocked after a look like that? I've always been lucky, I guess. Luck got me a place in the whale. Sure, I'm a good astronomer, but so are lots of other guys. If I were ten years older, it would have been an honor, being picked for the first long jump in the first starship ever. At my age, it was luck. You'll want to know if the ship worked. Well, she did. Went like a bomb. We got lined up between Earth and Mars, you'll remember, and James pushed the button marked jump. Took his finger off the button, and there we were. Alpha Centauri. Two months later, your time. One second later by us. We covered our whole survey assignment like that. Smooth as a pint of old and mild, which right now I could certainly use. Better yet would be a pint of hot black coffee with sugar in it. Failing that, I could even go for a long drink of cold water. There was never anything wrong with the whale till right at the end, and even then I doubt if it was the ship itself that piled things up. That was one survey assignment. We astronomers really lived. Wait till you see, but of course you won't. I could weep when I think of those miles of lovely color film, all gone up in smoke. I'm shocked, all right. I never said who I was. Matt Hennessy, from Farsight Observatory, back of the moon. Just back from proving flight come a astronomical survey in the starship whale. Whoever you are who finds this tape, you're made. Take it to any radio station or newspaper office. You'll find you can name your price and don't take any wooden nickels. Where had I got to? I told you how we happened to find Chang, hadn't I? That's what the natives called it. Walking, talking natives on a blue sky planet with 1.1 grams of gravity in a 20% oxygen atmosphere at 15 psi. The odds against finding Chang on a six sun survey on the first star jump ever must be up in the Googles. We certainly were lucky. The Chang natives aren't very technical. Haven't got space travel, for instance. They're good astronomers, though. We were able to show them our sun and their telescopes. In their way, they're a highly civilized people. Look more like cats than people. But they're people, all right. If you doubt it, chew these facts over. 
One, they learned our language in four weeks. When I say they, I mean a ten-man team of them. Two, they brew a near beer that's a lot nearer than the canned stuff we had aboard the whale. Three, they've got a great sense of humor. Ran rather to silly practical jokes, but still. Can't say I care for that hot foot and belly laugh stuff myself, but tastes stiffer. Four, the ten-men language team also learned chess and table tennis. But why go on? People who talk English, drink beer, like jokes, and beat me at chess or table tennis are people for my money, even if they look like tigers in trousers. It was funny the way they won all the time at table tennis. They certainly weren't so hot at it. Maybe that 10% extra gravity put us off our strokes. As for chess, Sven Love was our champion. He won sometimes. The rest of us seemed to lose whichever chunk she we played. There again, it wasn't so much that they were good. How could they be, in the time? It was more that we all seemed to make silly mistakes when we played them, and that's fatal in chess. Of course, it's a screwy situation. Playing chess with something that grows in its own fur coat, has yellow eyes an inch and a half long and long white whiskers, could you have kept your mind on the game? And don't think I fell victim to their feline charm. The children were pets, but you didn't feel like patting the adults on their big grinning heads. Personally, I didn't like the one I knew best. He was called, well, we called him Charlie, and he was the ethnologist, ambassador, contact man, or whatever you would like to call him, who came back with us. Why I disliked him was because he was always trying to get the edge on you. All the time, he had to be top. Great sense of humor, of course. I nearly broke my neck on that butter slide he fixed up in the metal alleyway to the whale's engine room. Charlie laughed fit to bust. Everyone laughed. I even laughed myself, though doing it hurt me more than the tumble had. Yes, life and soul of the party, old Charlie. My last sight of the minnow was a cabin full of dead and dying men, the Swedish stink of burned flesh and the choking reek of scorching insulation, the bolt jolting and shuddering and beginning to break up, and in the middle of the flames, still unhurt, was Charlie. He was laughing. My God, it's dark out here. Wonder how high I am. Must be all of 50 miles, and doing 800 miles an hour at least. I'll be doing more than that when I land. What's final velocity for a 50-mile fall? Same as a 50,000-mile fall, I suppose. Same as escape, 24,000 miles an hour. I'll make a mess. That's better. Why didn't I close my eyes before? Those star streaks made me dizzy. I'll make a nice shooting star when I hit air. Come to think of it, I must be deep in air now. Let's take a look. It's getting lighter. Look at those peaks down there, like great knives. I don't seem to be falling as fast as I expected, though. Almost seem to be floating. Let's switch on the radio and tell the world hello. Hello, Earth. Hello again. And goodbye. Sorry about that. I passed out. I don't know what I said, if anything, and the suit recorder has no playback or eraser. What must have happened is that the suit ran out of oxygen, and I lost consciousness due to anoxia. I dreamed I switched on the radio, but I actually switched on the emergency tank, thank the Lord, and that brought me around. Come to think of it, why not crack the suit and breathe fresh air instead of bottled? No, I'd have to get up to do that. I think I'll just lie here a little bit longer and get properly rested up before I try anything big like standing up. I was telling about the return journey, wasn't I? The long jump back home, which should have dumped us between the orbits of Earth and Mars, instead of which, when James took his finger off the button... The mass detector showed nothing except the noise level of the universe. We were out in that no place for a day. We astronomers had to establish our exact position relative to the solar system. The crew had to find out exactly what went wrong. The physicists had to make mystic passes in front of meters and mutter about residual folds in stress free space. Our task was easy, because we were about a half a light year from the sun. The crew's job was also easy. They found what went wrong in less than half an hour. It still seems incredible. To program the ship for a star jump, you merely told it where you were and where you wanted to go. In practical terms, that entailed first a series of exact measurements which had to be translated into the somewhat abstruse coordinate system we used based on the topological order of mass points in the galaxy. Then you cut a tape on the computer and hit the button. Nothing was wrong with the computer. Nothing was wrong with the engines. We'd hit the right button and we'd gone to the place we'd aimed for. All we'd done was aiming for the wrong place. It hurts me to tell you this, and I'm just attached personnel with no spaceflight tradition. In practical terms, one highly trained crew member had punched a wrong pattern of holes on the tape. Another equally skilled had failed to notice this when reading back. A childish error. Highly improbable. Twice repeated. 
thus scoring the improbability. Incredible, but that's what happened. Anyway, we took good care with the next lot of measurements. That's why we were out there so long. They were cross-checked about five times. I got sick, so I climbed into a spacesuit and went outside and took some photographs of the sun, which I hoped would help to determine hydrogen density in the outer regions. When I got back, everything was ready. We disposed to ourselves about the control room and relaxed for all we were worth. We were all praying that this time nothing would go wrong, and all looking forward to seeing Earth again after four months' subjective time away, except for Charlie, who was still chuckling and shaking his head and Captain James, who was glaring at Charlie, and obviously wishing human dignity permitted him to tear Charlie limb from limb. Then James pressed the button. Everything twanged like a bowstring. I felt myself turned inside out, passed through a small sieve, and poured back into shape. The entire bow wall screen was full of earth. Something was wrong all right, and this time it was much, much worse. We'd come out of the jump about 200 miles above the Pacific, pointed straight down, traveling at a relative speed of about 2,000 miles an hour. It was a fantastic situation. Here was the whale, the most powerful ship ever built, which could cover 50 light years in a subjective time of one second, and it was helpless. For, as of course you know, the star drive couldn't be used again for at least two hours. The whale also had ion rockets, of course, the standard deuterium fusion thing with direct conversion. As again you know, this is good for interplanetary flight because you can run it continuously and it has extremely high exhaust velocity. But in our situation, it was no good because it has rather low thrust. It would have taken more time than we had to deflect us enough to avoid a smash. We had five minutes to abandon ship. James got us all into the minnow at a dead run. There was no time to take anything at all except the clothes we stood in. The minnow was meant for short heavy hops to planets or asteroids. In addition to the ion drive, it had emergency atomic rockets, using steam for reaction mass. We thank God for that when Kazamian canceled our downwards velocity with them in a few seconds. We curved away over China, and from about 50 miles high, we saw the whale hit the Pacific. 600 tons of mass at well over 2,000 miles an hour make an almighty splash. By now you'll have divers down, but I, but I doubt they'll salvage much you can use. I wonder why James went down with the ship, as the saying is. Not that it made any difference. It must have broken his heart to know that his lovely ship was getting the chopper. Or did he suspect another human error? We didn't have time to think about that, or even to get the radio working. The steam rockets blew up. Poor Kazamian was burnt to a crisp. Only thing that saved me was the spacesuit I was still wearing. I snapped the faceplate down because the cabin was filling with fumes. I saw Charlie coming out of the toilet... That's how he'd escaped, and I saw him beginning to laugh. Then the port side collapsed, and I fell out. I saw the launch spinning away, glowing red against a purplish-black sky. I tumbled head over heels toward the huge curved shield of Earth fifty miles below. I shut my eyes, and that's about all I remember. I don't see how any of us could have survived. I think we're all dead. I'll have to get up and crack this suit and let some air in, but I can't. I fell fifty miles without a parachute. I'm dead, so I can't stand up. There was a silence for a while except for the vicious howl of the wind. Then snow began to shift on the ledge. A man crawled stiffly out and came shakily to his feet. He moved slowly around for some time. After about two hours, he returned to the hollow, squatted down, and switched on the recorder. The voice began again, considerably warier. Hello there. I'm in the blinkest wilderness I've ever seen. This place makes the moon look cozy. There's precipice around me every way but one and that's up, so it's up will have to go till I find a way to go down. I've been chewing snow to quench my thirst, but I could eat a horse. I picked up a short-weight broadcast on my suit but couldn't understand a word. Not English, not French, and there I stick. Listen to it for 15 minutes just to hear a human voice again. I haven't much hope of reaching anyone with my 5 milliwatt suit transmitter, but I'll keep trying. Just before I start the climb, there are two things I want to get on tape. The first is how I got here. I've remembered something from my military training when I did some parachute jumps. Terminal velocity for a human body falling through air is about 120 mph. Falling 50 miles is no worse than falling 500 feet. You'd be lucky to live through a 500-foot fall, true, but I've been lucky. The suit is bulky but light and probably slowed my fall. I hit a 60-mile-an-hour updraft this side of the mountain, skidded downhill through about half a mile of snow, and fetched up in a drift. The suit is part-worn, but still operational. 
I'm fine. The second thing I want to say is about the chinksy, and here it is. Watch out for them. Those jokes are dangerous. I'm not telling how because I've got a scientific reputation to watch. You'll have to figure it out for yourselves. Here are the clues. 1. The chinksy talk and laugh, but after all, they aren't human. On an alien world a hundred light years away, why shouldn't alien talents develop? A talent that's so uncertain and rudimentary here that most people don't believe it might be highly developed out there. 2. The whale expedition did fine till it found Chang. Then it hit a scene of bad luck. Real stinking bad luck that went on and on till it looks fishy. We lost the ship, we lost the launch, and all but one of us lost our lives. We couldn't even win a game of ping pong. So what is luck? Good or bad? Scientifically speaking, future chance events are by definition chance. They can turn out favorable or not. When a preponderance of chance events has occurred unfavorably, you've got bad luck. It's a fancy name for a lot of chance results that didn't go your way. But the gambler defines it differently. For him, luck refers to the future. And you've got bad luck when future chance events won't go your way. Scientific investigations into this have been inconclusive. But everyone knows that some people are lucky and others aren't. All we've got are hints and glimmers, the fumbling touch of a rudimentary talent. There's the evil eye legend and the Jonah, bad luck bringers. Superstition? Maybe. But ask the insurance companies about accidental prones. What's in a name? Call a man unlucky and you're superstitious. Call him accident prone and that's sound business sense. I've said enough. All the same, search the space flight records, talk to the actuaries. When a ship is working perfectly and is operated by a hand-picked crew of highly trained men in perfect condition, how often is it wrecked by a series of silly errors happening one after another in defiance of probability? I'll sign off with two thoughts, one depressing and one cheering. A single chinksy wrecked our ship and our launch. What could a whole planet full of them do? On the other hand, a talent that manipulates chance events is bound to be chancy. No matter how highly developed it can be surefire, the proof is that I've survived to tell the tale. At 20 below zero and 50 miles an hour, the wind ravaged the mountain. Peering through his polarized visor at the white waste and the snow-filled air hollowing over it, sliding and stumbling with every step on a slope that got gradually steeper and seemed to go on forever, Matt Hennessy began to inch his way up the north face of Mount Everest. End of Accidental Death by Peter Bailey Birthday Present by Arnold Marmer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Diane's husband spent most of his time on Mars, and I spent most of mine with Diane. It was a nice arrangement, much too nice to last. Birthday Present by Arnold Marmer It's tonight or never, Diane said. Yes, I said. I watched her as she walked back and forth across my bedroom floor. She had on a sheer plasto dress that clung to her round white breasts and full milky thighs. I'm picking him up at the spaceway, she said. We're supposed to go dining and dancing tonight. She stopped pacing. It's my birthday. I'm thirty today. And I was twenty-four and in love. Six years between us. So what? I didn't give a damn. I wanted to marry her, to live with her. I'm thirty, she said again. Do you mind? I know your age. Why do you bring it up? Some day you'll find out you married an old woman. If we ever do marry. Stop it. I got off the bed and went to her. Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Do you love me? She looked up at me. You know I do. Say it. I love you. Never stop saying that. She put up her face and I kissed her. A long, hard kiss. She broke away. You'll be in back of the racer. Just crouch low. 
As soon as we're away from the spaceway, you hit him with the wrench. It has to be quick and sure. Then we carry him up to the apartment and drop him out the window. I shuddered a little as she talked. She was so calm about the whole thing. You'll have plenty of time to get out. It'll be listed as suicide. He's been sick for a long time. His doctor will testify to that. He was so sick and worried, he jumped to his death. She stared at me hard. Is it all clear? Yes, I looked at her. Her long blonde hair, her oval face, the slim white column that was her throat. It's all clear, like glass. I poured myself a drink. I needed it. I was going to need a lot more. We won't be able to see each other for a long time, she said. She watched me drink. We don't want to give our friends something to talk about. I won't like not seeing you. She patted my face. I put down my drink, caged her slender hand in mine, and kissed her wrist. I saw the light blue veins crisscross under the delicate skin. I brought her close to me. I kissed her warm lips. Baby, I breathed. Diane, baby. Paul, well, listen to me. We haven't much time. All right, sweet. I kissed her again. Come on, we can't afford to get there late. I crouched low in the back of the racer. I heard the street noises, the gab of the night crowd, the not-so-mild cursings of the taxi-jet drivers. It all seemed so unreal. Back there, on my haunches, a wrench gripped tightly in my sweaty hand. I was going to kill a man, a man I knew, a man I respected, and for a woman, all for a woman. I thought about getting up and telling Diane to go to hell and get herself another stooge. I thought about a lot of things. Then I thought of Diane, her sweet white body, the way she sighed when I kissed her hard, and I knew I was going through with it. The racer stopped, its jets cut off. I heard the hum as the door opened, and she got out. This was it. I sweated. It dripped down in an endless stream. The seconds went by. Then the minutes. They got in, and the door hummed shut, and I heard their laughter blending together. They settled back, and the jets roared. The racer woke up to new life, and it shot away. How was the trip? I heard Diane asking. Cold, but I'm not sure it was worth it. Those Martians drive a hard bargain, he coughed. Diane, you're not too set on going out tonight, are you? Why? she asked. I thought how nice it would be if we spent the evening at home. Just as you say, Roger. You don't care? Of course not. She was so calm. So damn calm. There would never be another like Diane. You won't regret it, Roger promised. My, but this boulevard is deserted, she said. Not a soul in sight. That was for my benefit. It was my cue. I sat up silently. He saw me in the rearview mirror. What the hell? He started to turn. My arm sprang alive. The wrench thudded against his skull. A half-cry spilled from his lips. Then his head fell forward on his chest. Hit him again, Diane urged. But do as I say. I hit him again. Hard. It was done. I settled back. The wrench was still in my hand. I looked at it. Then let it fall. Are you all right? Diane asked. Yes, I said. Shouldn't I be? You're not going to be sick, are you? 
No, you think I'm a kid? You did it for an old woman. Stop it. Today is my birthday, don't you know? I'm thirty. Shut up. I wonder what he got me for my birthday. Please. I'm sorry. I really am. I feel like talking. If I don't, I think I'd scream. So I let her talk. I didn't answer her. She babbled away like she was crazy. She kept it up until we got to their apartment. Diane got out first and made sure the way was clear. We'll use the back stairs, she said when she got back. We both can manage him. It was dark, and it was late, and we didn't see anybody. We went through the service entrance. It was too heavy a load for me to do it alone. Two flights up. Diane helped me with him. I breathed easier when we were in the marble hall outside the apartment. She quickly unlocked the heavy plastic door, and we got him inside. She fumbled for the inner light switch. Happy birthday, they shouted. Now I knew why Roger wanted to spend the evening at home. We stood there, Diane and myself, with Roger between us. Then they stopped shouting and stared at us. I thought they would never stop staring. The End of Birthday Present by Arnold Marmore The Beasts in the Void by Paul W. Fairman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Blakely The Beasts in the Void by Paul W. Fairman Holloway was used to big game hunters and their expeditions to other worlds, but this trip was sheer madness, a spaceship stalking among. The examiner looked doubtful and said, But Mr. Holloway, regulations require that I read your log before I take verbal testimony. Holloway's face was drawn and ravaged. His bloodshot eyes sat in black pits. They were trained on the examiner, but looked through him rather than at him. Holloway said, But I must talk. I've got to tell you about it. I have to keep talking. But Holloway's words tumbled out. It started in the control cabin there in deep space. When Mrs. Kelvey came in, she was the blonde one. I turned around and she said, Captain, there's a great big tiger in the companionway. The desperate Holloway, fearful of being stopped or running out of words, went into minute detail. She made the statement as a pouting complaint, almost casually. Then, before I could speak, she realized what she'd said and her face changed. A kind of horrified double-take. A tiger? In the companionway of a spaceship? This last was an incredulous question she asked herself. Then she fainted. I looked outside. I thought I saw something blurred and indistinct, but it vanished quickly if it was really there at all. The companionway was empty. No tiger. No animal of any kind. The examiner, holding up a hand of protest, looked like a man directing traffic. Please, Mr. Holloway. Please, we must remember regulations. Holloway's eyes closed for a moment, but he resolutely forced them open as though afraid of something. The scene was Holloway's two-room suite in Spaceport Hotel. There were three men present. Holloway, Skipper of the Space King, John Mason, Port Resident, and Merle Kennedy, Section Examiner for the Space Authority people. Kennedy regarded Holloway with frank concern. Good heavens, the man was a complete mess. Looked ready to collapse. Kennedy turned to Mason. This can be postponed, you know. Mason was regarding Holloway also. Strange, he thought. Holloway had left in a fanfare of publicity. Now it appeared his return would be even more dramatic. Maybe Holloway was that kind of a chap, the kind things just happened to. He was quite young, though he certainly didn't look it now. He'd been known as a playboy ever since his father struck it big in Venusian oil. But good-looking, personable, he had worn the label well. He'd been good copy because the public regarded him with patronizing affection. To them, he'd been a nice kid having fun, not a young Westra wasting his father's money. Naturally, he would pick a glamour girl to play the romantic feminine role, and Melody Hayden had filled the bill perfectly. Together, they had enchanted the public. 
Princess and Prince Charming stuff. Then tragedy. Disaster in a rocketing sports car. Melody's coffin sealed before the funeral. Young Holloway coming off without a scratch. Melody's death was a bombshell, and everyone asks, What will he do now? Expecting, of course, something sensational. He didn't let them down. Dramatically, he announced a completely new life. He bought a spaceship and forswore his old ways. He had quite a reputation as a big game hunter. He'd stalked the vicious Plutonian ice bears and lain in Venusian swamps waiting for the ten-ton lizards to rise out of the slime. He had knocked over the wiliest of animals, a telepathic Uranian mountain wolf, and had dropped in a flight of Martian radar bat, a feat duplicated by only three other marksmen of record. So what more natural occupation than guiding hunting parties in deep space? Holloway had been obviously torn by Melody's tragic death. Perhaps out among the stars he could forget. There had been some trouble, Mason recalled, in clearing Holloway's first cruise. A party of five. Not to any established hunting ground, but a D.U. thing. Destination unknown, and they were always trouble. Clearance had been made, though, and now here was Holloway back again, dramatically, of course, with one of his party dead and the other four in trance-like stupors. Strange. And stranger still, Holloway's reason for wanting to talk immediately, no rest, no medical attention. It will help keep me awake. I mustn't go to sleep. Can I make you understand? I've got to stay awake. Mason pitied the man. He turned to Kennedy. I have the log here, sir. Perhaps you could go over it now? Holloway leaned forward. I'll tell you what's in the log. Every word of it, if I just sit here waiting. Mason laid a hand on his knee. That's all right, old chap. I won't let you go to sleep. You and I will talk while Mr. Kennedy goes through the log. It won't take long. Mason handed the book to Kennedy. He was almost apologetic. It's a strange log, sir. It... Strange? Kennedy frowned. Logs had no right to be strange. There were regulations. Rules stating exactly how a log should be kept. Well, sir, the lad is young. His first trip. I just meant there's perhaps a little more in the log that should appear there. We'll see, Kennedy said. There was a slight frost on his words. If disciplinary measures were in the offing, it would pay not to get too cozy with Holloway and the resident. Kennedy opened the log. The first entry was dated June 3rd, 4.10 p.m., Earth time. Kennedy frowned. Permissible, of course, but sloppy, very sloppy. The better skippers commuted from Orion immediately after blastoff. Kennedy sat back and began to read. June 3rd, 4.10 p.m. We blasted at 2.18 p.m. A good getaway. Course 58.329 by the polar angle. No blast sickness among the passengers. They are old hands. I put the automatic board into control at 3.50 p.m. I check the tubes. Pressure's balanced and equal. I don't like this cruise. I don't like Murdo. He's a domineering slob. The other four, well, Keebler's an alcoholic. Kelvin an empty-headed opportunist. I don't particularly dislike them. They're just a worthless pair who would rather fawn on Murdo and take his insults than work for a living. The two wives are both young. Martha Keebler has a child's mind and a woman's body. Jane Kelvey is an oversexed witch with an indecent exposure complex. I may have trouble with her. Already she's a parading around in skimpy shorts and a bra. Evidently, Murdo doesn't care for women. He pays no attention to her. Money and power are his dish, and a terrible restlessness. Melody, baby. I wish you were here. June 4th, 3 p.m. I had a talk with Murdo about this silly cruise. Tried to swing him onto something that makes a little more sense. Pluto, Venus, Ganymede, some hunting ground I'm familiar with. No good. Even a suggestion and he thinks you're crossing him and snorts like a bull. Still demands to go to this place where big game prowls in space. Where elephants and leopards and snakes and anything you can name fly around your ship and look in your ports. Where do you do your hunting in spacesuits right out in the void? Why in hell did I fall for this idiocy? Guess I just didn't care. Maybe I thought it was a good idea because it sounded like a cruise you could get killed on without much trouble. No, I shouldn't say that. Melody wouldn't like me to say that. She was so wonderful. So level-headed. How wrong they all were about us. About her. Because she was so beautiful, I guess. I tried to tell them I'd married an angel, and they took bets among themselves on how long it would last. The answer to that would have been forever. It still is. 
I've lost so much and learned so much in a very short time. The hell with Murdo and his four puppets. I'll take them out and bring them back. Then I'll go somewhere alone and I won't come back at all. Melody. Course 28.493 by the Polar Angle went through small asteroid field. Kennedy looked up sharply. He frowned. This log is unacceptable. Holloway was pacing the floor, his eyes blank and terrible. Unacceptable? Course and position should be noted within each 24-hour period. You missed June 5th entirely. You... Kennedy leafed through the pages. Why at times you missed three and four days in sequence? Sometimes I didn't have time to write. Mason tried to hide his disgust. How did men like Kennedy get into positions they weren't fitted for? The ass. Couldn't he see this man was suffering? Mason said. Why not reserve a comment until you finished, Mr. Kennedy? Kennedy's eyes widened at the sharp tone of Mason's voice. Really? When residents start dictating to examiners, Kennedy saw the stiffness in Mason's face, and something more. He went quickly back to his reading. June 6th, 1 p.m. I talked some more with Murdo about this fool cruise. He got wind of our destination, wherever it is, from some rich idiot in Paris. And I don't use idiot figuratively. His informant was in some kind of private nuthouse, an exclusive insane asylum of idiots with lots of money, and he had lucid intervals. At one of those times, he told Murdo where he'd been and what had happened. I don't think Murdo believes all, all of it because he wants to see for himself. Well, if he wants to spend his money chasing meteorites, it's his business. Keebler got drunk as a goat, strapped him in his bunk, and left him there. Murdo spent a few hours explaining guns to Mrs. Keebler. I think he enjoys the look of wonder on her face. Makes him feel very superior knowledge-wise. Her face is just built that way, and so far as she's concerned, he could be talking Greek. He thinks she's very beautiful. I wonder if he ever saw Melody's picture. Course 36.829 by the Orion Angle. All clear. June 9th, 1 a.m. Course 36.841 by the Orion Angle. Small asteroids. Jane Kelby is bored and has started taking it out on me. When I passed her door, it was open. She was taking a sponge back, stark naked in the middle of the cabin. She turned around to face me and did a very bad job of acting flustered, trying to cover herself up with a small sponge. How crude can a female get? She was hoping I'd come in. If I had, it would have been to slap her face. I got away as fast as I could. June 10th, 7 p.m. Course 41.864 by the Orion Angle brushed a small asteroid. I've been noting the time wrong. It should be figured on a 24-hour cycle, midnight to midnight. The hell with it. Had a fight with Murdo. He wanted to take over the ship. His words were, let's get some speed out of this slot bucket. I reminded him I was captain. He reminded me he was footing the bills. I asked him how he would like to be locked in his cabin for the remainder of the cruise. He didn't say, but I guess he wouldn't have liked it because he quieted down. Keebler has been quietly drunk for the last two days. Lucky Keebler. June 13th, 18 hours. Course 26.932, by the Virgo angle, went four degrees off course to avoid small planetoid. Jane Kelvey came to my cabin an hour ago. The rest were asleep. She wore a blue dressing gown with nothing under it. I want to set down what happened in case there's ever a kickback, although I don't think there ever will be. I was sitting in a chair, and she came up behind me, and it was very unfortunate because I saw the blue dressing gown first. By sheer chance, it was almost exactly like the one Melody wore that first night. I was thinking of Melody. Melody was all around me and inside me, in my mind, in my heart, and all my aching regrets. So when that dressing gown brushed me, something electric happened inside, and I got up and took Jane Kelvey in my arms. It wasn't more than three or four seconds, but in that time, the gown had brushed outside. Then I came to my senses and pushed her away. The dressing gown stayed parted. She stepped back, confused. She said, What's the matter? Are you scared? I'm disgusted. Button your gown. Get out of here. What are you? Not one of those noble creatures, I hope, who wouldn't touch a man's wife. I said, get out. I wouldn't touch you regardless. But you just did. It was a mistake. I... Look... I'm a woman, you're a man, I think. We're alone in space and life is short. 
Let's have fun and then forget about it. I slapped her across the mouth. A skipper can be jailed for life for striking a passenger, even with cause, but I slapped her and I'm setting it down in the log. Kennedy looked up from his reading. Jane Kelvey. Is she the dead one? Mason nodded. Kennedy looked at Holloway with marked severity. Are you sure you only slapped her? Mason exploded. Good God, man. Did you see the body? You're not implying he did that to her, are you? I'm not implying anything, Kennedy said with a restrained grimness that infuriated Mason. Why don't you finish the log before you start passing judgment? Kennedy leafed through the pages. I... Wait a minute. This log doesn't cover the whole cruise. It breaks off in the middle of a sentence. Read what's there, man. Read what's there. Very serious. Very serious, Kennedy muttered. Not completing a log. No license should have been issued this man. Lax. Very lax. He sat back to make himself more comfortable and prepared to go on with his reading. June 30th. Three hours. Course 29.341. By the Virgo Angle. I think that's the course. The instruments are acting funny. In fact, a lot of things seem to be wrong. Some of the constellations aren't in the right places anymore. I began noticing these things a couple of days ago and spoke to Murdo. I suggested we turn back. I told him it was my duty as a skipper to look out for the welfare of my passengers, and that included not continuing if vital instruments showed signs of failure. He sneered at me and said, I thought you were big game, Hunter Holloway. I told him I'd hunted big game, yes. It doesn't sound like it. You sound like a timid old woman. So you've made some miscalculations. The course is still right. It's on the flight pattern in the automatic control board, and I know it's correct because I gave it to you. But if instruments fail, nothing stays right. Okay, you're the skipper. Have you turned yellow and want to show your tail? I guess there's nothing I can do about it. He almost got his jaw broken, but I was able to hold myself. Then, suddenly, I didn't care. I didn't care whether Murdo stayed alive or got killed. As to the others, they'd come on the cruise with their eyes open. They deserved whatever they got, and I certainly didn't give a damn about myself. Guess I wasn't cut out to skipper a ship. A skipper should care. That's all he should do. Just care. I'd rather dream about Melody. I don't know what the date is. The chronometer stopped, so I don't even know what time it is. But what does it matter about the time if you don't even know what day it is? We just go on and on. Murdo, I can't figure out. Windbag or not. Braggart or no. He has an iron will. I think he's scared, but he won't admit it. And some stubborn streak inside him won't let him turn tail and run. He hides his fear behind long accounts of his hunting trips. He describes the vicious animals he's killed. He bores us with accounts of his skill as a great hunter. The rest listen because they have to. I go to my cabin and remember Melody. The rest are scared, too, but they're too scared of Murdo to let him know it. That's an odd one. Scared for your life, but afraid to tell the big man because he might kill you. Would Murdo kill in a fit of rage? I don't know. Keebler stays drunk, so none of it bothers him. Keebler's wife, I think, is in love with Murdo, but it's kind of a little girl love. She never quite grew up. Kelvy glues himself to Murdo and sticks like a plaster. He seems to consider Murdo a haven, as though Murdo's book will make everything all right. Jane Kelvy hasn't quit making passes at me, but they're half-hearted. She bothers me. I'm uneasy when she's around. I get the feeling that any minute she might drop to her knees and beg. What do you do with a woman on her knees before you, begging? Maybe before long her husband will look good to her. Maybe she'll be able to get away from Murdo's side for a while. I look at both these women and realize what I lost. Melody. Jane Kelvey came to my cabin. It's hit her that things aren't right. She's scared. She asked, Why did you tell Murdo you wanted to turn back? Because I thought we'd come too far. Do you still think so? Everything will be all right. The instruments. Are they working again? I lied to her. They're working. Do you think it's really as Murdo says? That there are animals out in space? I don't know. She looked wan and forlorn, and I was sorry for her. She said, I've only been on one hunting trip in my life. Is that so? In India. A boy carried my gun for me. When the tiger came, the boy handed me the gun and told me where to point. I fired, but I didn't hit the tiger. Somebody else shot it. That was too bad. No, 
It was all right. He was such a big, beautiful animal, so sleek and powerful. I saw her body tremble as she closed her eyes. I said, you better get some rest. She passed a hand over her eyes and then gave me an odd, wistful smile. Animals are smarter, I think. We do make awful messes out of our lives, don't we? I'm afraid we do. But is it our fault? God makes us this way. We can't help that. No, I guess we can't. Why did God make us like we are? I don't know, Jane. Let's hope he does. Isn't that sacrilege or something? Doubting him? I guess it is. She reached out suddenly and touched my face. You're a nice guy. I don't blame you for slapping me. I'm sorry. You're pretty nice yourself. The smile faded. I'm not, she said miserably and left the cabin. Poor kid. I forgot her and thought of Melody. Something's wrong with everything. Not a very scientific statement for a skipper to make, but that's how it is. The stars have disappeared. The instruments jumped around as though they had minds of their own. The dial needles spin around like crazy. And something else. Something even worse. Space has changed. I mean, there's something out there in space. First I just felt it. A raw uneasiness. Then I trained a light through the port and I could see it. Stuff that looks like dust but isn't. It's hazy and yet it sparkles and you have a sense of being on a ship that's pushing its way through a fog so thick that friction holds you back. And there's something more about this sparkling fog. You look out at it and it seems to be looking back at you. Or maybe I'm losing my mind. Anyhow, that's the way it seems. As though if it's waiting for you to speak to it. Say hello or something. I guess I'm going crazy. The sparkling fog is affecting the others, too. They've all quieted down, and they slip along the bulkheads as though they were being followed. Only Murdo blusters back. He says, What the hell? We expected something different, didn't we? Well, this is sure different enough, isn't it? I turn back, but I don't know how. I have nothing to go by. The instruments make no sense. I am going crazy. I looked out the port just now and saw a water buffalo. It was standing right out there in space with its head down looking at the ship. I had a light turned on it, and suddenly it charged and hit the port head on. I bounced off and went staggering away and disappeared. But it left a big white scratch on the quartz outside. At least I think it did. Wait. I'll look again. Yes, a big white scratch. It's still there. So how can I be mad? Maybe it's a new kind of madness. Some of the sparkling fog has penetrated the ship. Turn out the light and you can see it in the cabin. Not as thick as out in the void, but thick enough to see. Thick enough to stand there and ask you to talk to it. Murdo was ready to turn back. He came to the control room and said, I saw it out there. You saw what? His face was pale and his hands twitched. A boa constrictor. Exactly like the one I killed four years ago in the Amazon. It came to the port and looked in at me. It must be your imagination. No, it was there. Let's turn back. Get out of this. I wish we could. You mean, I don't know where Beck is. We might as well just go as we are. Changing course doesn't help if you don't know your directions. Our only hope is to drive on out of this cloud. If I turned, I might go right back into it. Then one direction is as good as another? That's right. His mind wandered as he turned away. I didn't know it would be like this, he muttered. I thought it would be fun. Sport. I thought we'd put on spacesuits and go out and make a kill. I thought... The spacesuits are ready. Do you want to try it? He shuddered, his hanging jowls almost flapping. You couldn't drag me out there. The stuff is getting thicker in the ship. Jane came into my cabin. She had an odd look on her face. She said, There's a big tiger in the companionway. I got up from my bunk, and suddenly she seemed to realize what she said. She repeated it. Then she fell down in a faint. I put her in my bunk and looked out into the companionway. A sparkling fog glittered, but there was no tiger. When she came to, she didn't seem to know where she was. Then she smiled. I must have been drinking too much, she said. Then she realized where she was. But look where it got me, into your bunk. Do you feel all right now? I guess so. I can get up now. I do have to get up, don't I? I think you'd better. After she left, I did some thinking. The sparkling haze had been outside the ship, and I'd see a water buffalo through the port. Murdo had seen a boa constrictor. Then the haze penetrated the hole and got inside the ship. 
and Jane had seated Tiger in the companionway. Were they phantoms? Was Jane's tiger a tiger of the mind? Murdo swore his snake had been real, and my buffalo left a mark on the port. I sat there trying to think. With the sparkling fog drifting around me, it seemed to be trying to tell me something. Things grow worse. Today at mess, Murdo was holding forth about a plutonian ice bear he'd killed. I think he was trying to cover the gloom that has settled over us. Anyhow, he just got to the point where the bear was charging down on him when we heard the roar of a thunder outside. Maybe I'd better repeat that for the record. We heard a roaring through the walls of the spaceship, in the void. Nothing goes through the walls of a spaceship in the void, but we all heard it and jumped to the port. And we all saw it. An ice bear as big as ten of the largest that ever lived in the Plutonian ice flows. A huge ravening beast that rushed to the void at the ship and tried to tear the port out of its metal seat with teeth as big as the height of a man. The women fell back, screaming. Keebler, in his usual stupor, stared blankly as though not realizing what was going on. Kelvy looked to Murdo for guidance. When none came, he crouched behind a chair. Murdo fell back slowly, step by step, as though his eyes were fastened to the quartz and it was hard to pull away. I don't remember what I did. Murdo was saying, My God, my God, my God, although chanting a ritual. He tore his eyes from the sight and looked at me. You wanted a big game, Buster, I croaked. There it is. But it can't be real. It can't. Maybe not. But if that port gives, I'll bet it won't be from vacuum pressure. Vacuum draws. It doesn't press. Kelvy babbled innately. But nobody paid any attention to him. The beast made two more charges on the ship, then drew back screaming in rage from a snap tooth. And all around us, there in the ship, the sparkling fog glittered and tried to talk. Two hours. The beast still rages in the void outside our ship. Jane is dead. She was horribly mangled. I put her in her bunk and laid a blanket over her, and now the blanket is soaked in her blood. No one could have helped her. It happened in the lounge. She was in there alone. I was in the control room. I don't know where the rest were. I was working uselessly with the controls when I heard a terrible scream mixed with a hideous snarling. I ran into the companionway and stared toward the lounge. Murdo appeared from somewhere, and we were shouldering each other on the companion ladder. Murdo fell heavily. Then we were both looking into the lounge. It was too late to help Jane. We saw her there, still and bloody. A shiny black leopard was crouching gory mouth over her body with its paws on her breast. Its eyes were black magnets, holding mine. I said, get a gun, trying to speak without moving my lips. But... Damn you, get a gun! Murdo staggered away. It seemed a year before he came back with a Henzi special 442. The leopard was tight, ready to spring. I didn't dare move a muscle. I said, over my shoulder, get him. Don't miss. The last was a little silly. How could a man miss with a Henzi at ten feet? Murdo fired and tore the leopard's head off. It was down already, so it didn't move. It sat there headless his tail twitching slightly. Then it was still. I didn't hesitate this time. I said, Come on, we've got to get this out of here before the others show. We put the dead leopard into the forward storage bunker. Then I picked up poor Jane and carried her to her room. Murdo helped me up the ladder. The others were in the companionway, and they pressed back in horror to let me pass. For the first time since we'd started, Keebler was sober. Ashen, shaking, stone sober. He broke screamed and ran for his bottle, the world of reality too terrible for him to bear. There was no huddle, no conference, no meeting of the minds. Everyone else went to the galley and sat staring into space, stared at the dancing little sparkles in the air. I went to my cabin. When confronted by a reality, no matter how crazy and improbable, a man must not turn from it. He cannot carry the mangled body of a woman in his arms and then say to himself, this isn't real, because it doesn't make sense. It does make sense. Some kind of sense or it would not exist. A man must say, rather, I don't understand this, and maybe I never will, but God gave me a brain, and I must try. I can't sit back and deny reality. I must try to understand it. I cleared my mind and tried to rationalize the things around us. Out in the darkness, there was a terrible roaring and yammering, the thuds and bellows of violence. I went to the port. There, in the light from the ship, the ice bear and the water buffalo were fighting. 
It was a terrible and magnificent thing, but to me it was anticlimax. A sideshow of almost casual interest. The ice bear outsized the water buff by too much to be in any danger, but the buff fought savagely and the ice bear had no easy time. The buff opened a long, deep gash in the bear's throat when the bear missed a lunge and the plutonian mammal fell back with a roar of pain and fury. They came together again, and this time the bear got the buff in a hug and it was all over. The buff's spine broke and the bear bent the body double, then tore it to pieces. I wondered if the others were watching. I went back to pacing, back to my thinking. I have been thinking, 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 racking my brain. And of one thing I am sure. Some invisible intelligence is trying to help me, trying to give me knowledge. The sparkling fog? A great and wonderful thing has happened. And I know. Do you realize what that means? To know in a situation like this? And to be wonderfully and wildly happy? The knowledge was not all given me. There was a thought process of my own developing. The thing given me was the basic knowledge upon which to build, and proof of this knowledge, absolute and indisputable proof. The sparkling fog is mind stuff. I will not defend that statement. I will not rationalize it. But I will seek explanations, consider possibilities. Known. The sparkling fog through which we drift is intelligent matter, the stuff of thoughts, the basic material from which consciousness springs. It is consciousness itself, supposed. It is probably electronuclear in composition, and appears to be completely innocent. By that I mean it has no intention to harm, perhaps because it does not understand the difference between good and evil, harm and help, pain and pleasure. It has only one urge, the basic urge of all creation, to evolve, to develop. As the tree has but one basic urge, to grow and greaten, the flower but one desire, to bloom, to improve, to assert itself through evolution and become better. Perhaps, and who can successfully deny it, this great space cloud could be a storage place of the creator himself, a storage place for mind stuff. When an infant or an animal or a plant is touched with the magic thing called life, where does that magic come from? Is it created at that very moment, or does it come somehow from a source pile? Is this cloud a source pile of life itself? No one can say, but I think I've hit a l on a limitation of this mind stuff. I'm going to try an experiment and pray to God it works. I'm going to find Murdo and knock him unconscious. I have solved the mind stuff. What just happened is the last bit of proof I need. I went to the galley. Murdo had wandered away. I found him in the lounge. I stepped casually in front of him, set myself, and drove a straight right to his jaw. He went down like a log. I closed my eyes and counted to twenty, praying to God to make me right in my belief, in the crazy theory I evolved. I opened my eyes and turned to the storage locker. I looked inside. The dead leopard was gone. I went to the port and looked out. The huge ice bear had been ravening insanely among the shreds of the water buffalo's body. As I watched, both bear and buff began fading. Before my eyes, they disappeared, evolved back into the stuff of the sparkling fog. I had proved my theory. Now all the parts dropped into place. The mind stuff has only the ability and the urge to evolve. Nothing else. No imagination. It can evolve only if given something to reproduce. This it can only get from a human mind. It is able to see an image pictured in the human memory and reproduce it in a state of absolute reality. Witness. Jane saw a tiger in the companion way. Clear in her memory was the image of the tiger she had shot in India. The mind stuff saw it and reproduced it in reality. The water buffalo came from my own mind. I killed one exactly like it a year ago. The ice bear was out of Murdo's memory, as with the black leopard and the snake. Witness. The three animals created inside the ship did not appear until the mind stuff from outside penetrated the hole and entered the ship. They were of normal size, but the animals created outside the ship were far out of proportion. The ice bear especially. Why? because I believe the mind stuff is denser in the void. There it has more strength. My defense against the mind stuff was formulated almost accidentally. I remembered the sequence of Jane's tiger. She saw it, entered my cabin, realized its significance, and fainted. I looked into the companionway and saw the tiger fading. So I knocked out Murdo for a find of proof and got it. As soon as he lapsed into unconsciousness, the recreations from his mind turned back into sparkling fog. 
Obviously, in a heaven-sent phenomenon it is, the mind stuff immediately loses its subject image, when the mind from which it came goes unconscious. The mind stuff has no memory of its own, and cannot hold its recreated image in the evolved form under conditions of unconsciousness. The answer now becomes simple. I drugged Murdo before he regained consciousness. I drugged the other three by means of whiskey and food. They have been unconscious for twelve hours. Nothing has happened. I shall keep them that way. The mind stuff is trying to complain to me, almost petulantly, as a child. I sense it sharply. It does not understand the wrong it has done and feels it has deprived of its right. I have no time for the mind stuff. I guard myself against it and ignore it. There are other things on my mind. Shall I go back if we ever escape from the sparkling fog? I don't know. I don't want to go back. I want to go on and on forever, just like this. But the others cannot go on like this. It would be murder. I don't know. I don't know. I must keep awake. I use drugs. I must not sleep. Not sleep. We have cleared the fog. The instruments are working again. Again the stars glow. What shall I do? Melody. Kennedy looked up from his reading. As I said, and he spoke severely, you break off at an abrupt point. You would not complete the log. Holloway's red eyes were glazed. I had other things to do. I was tired of keeping a log. Mason sought to draw Kennedy off his quarry. There's an odd point, he said, looking at Holloway. Only animals were recreated. Do you think the mind stuff was capable only of recreating animals? Holloway spoke in an exhausted monotone. It took the clearest image from the strongest minds. Murdo thought mainly of hunting. He pondered on his more spectacular kills. Thus, the mind stuff used his images. I see. Holloway seemed to sag to shrink, he said. The mind stuff could recreate anything. It brought Melody back to me. Kennedy sprang to his feet. There's no reference in this log to... Mason turned on him. Shut up, you fool! He laid a gentle hand on Holloway's shoulder. Tell us about it, old chap. Holloway turned his burning eyes on the closed door to the next room. She's in there. I wanted to get rid of you. I was afraid you would take her away from me. But it's no use. I can't hold my consciousness much longer. Then she will vanish. Holloway tried weakly to rise from his chair. He called, Melody! Melody, baby! Door opened. A beautiful girl in a blue dressing gown came gracefully into the room. She walked straight to Holloway and took his tortured head into her soft hands. Her eyes pleaded with the men. He suffers so. He will not sleep. I can't make him sleep. I, I don't understand. Holloway's head dropped suddenly onto his chest. He slumped down in his chair, and as he did so, a change took place. The two men stood rooted, staring. As Melody began to fade, slowly, slowly into a transparent image, into a mist, into a handful of sparkling fog. Then she was gone. Mason knelt by the bone-thin body in the chair. He made a quick examination and got warily to his feet. Holloway is dead, he murmured. Drugs of that nature would kill an elephant. I can't understand how we lived so long. Kennedy blinked and seemed to come out of a trance. He frowned, and the investigation hardly started. Mason shook his head and looked pityingly at Kennedy. It was just no use with a man like him, Mason said. There's a one point entirely apparent without an investigation. What's that? Mason's voice was sharp and cold. That our little playboy, for all his reputation of frivolity, was a better man than you and I put together. Does that register, Mr. Kennedy? Kennedy flared. Now, see here, I'm only doing my job. Oh, shut up, Mason said, and strode out of the room. End of The Beasts in the Void by Paul W. Fairman Selling Point by Norman Arkway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman A new industry blossomed when U.S. Robot Company put their perfected models on the market. Perfected? 
nobody had considered the one defect. Selling Point by Norman Arkaway Good morning, madam, Iris said. I represent... We don't want any, said the woman, easing the door shut. With the time-tested finesse of door-to-door -door salesman, Ira slipped his size 12 shoe between the swinging door and the jam. But, madam, if you'll give me a few moments of your time... The woman shook her head. It won't do you any good, she said, trying to squeeze the door shut over his foot. Whatever it is, we don't want any. I represent U.S. Robot Company, Ira persisted. He smiled pleasantly. His unyielding foot maintained a six-inch-wide avenue of communication between himself and the woman in the house. Long the leader in commercial and industrial mechanicals, U.S. Robot is now introducing a new line of home servants, designed to assist the housewife in every possible task about the house. You're wasting your time, the woman said wearily. Ira used his professional smile to indicate that he enjoyed wasting his time. When you've seen the demonstration, he said, I'm sure you'll agree that no home should be without a Model I household robot. The woman looked out at him silently, patiently, resigned. She was pretty and petite and very young, and, from her appearance, had never done a day's work in her life. A typical newlywed, Ira thought. A perfect prospect, he decided. As you undoubtedly know, the outstanding characteristics of U.S. robot mechanicals have always been ability, durability, and reliability. Their performance in the industry has earned for United States Robot Company the enviable reputation it is proud to possess. Leader in the art. Artist of the trade. If it's U.S. robot, it's perfect. The woman smiled and allowed the door to swing open slightly. What about amalgamated androids? she asked. I understand they've got some pretty good models, too. Well, Ira admitted, some of their models are pretty good. Adequate, perhaps. But why take anything but the best? And, of course, our robots... I've seen some of the AA models that are perfect, the woman said. A suggestion of a smile tugged at the corner of her mouth. How can yours be any better than perfect? Ira's voice took on a confident complexion. Some of their models are beautiful, he conceded, and they may seem to work well when they're new. But they're not built to last like ours. Why, I think, the woman tried to interrupt, that some of... How can you compare them to U.S. Robot? Ira ran on. We have had 47 years of experience in producing mechanicals for the most difficult jobs imaginable. Amalgamated androids, while producing an adequate household model, does not have the valuable know-how to build into their mechanicals the strength and quality that is taken for granted in every machine bearing the U.S. robot label. The woman was skeptical. Maybe your company does make the best factory hands, she argued. But household robots must be aesthetic as well as rugged. And amalgamated androids are specialists in building humanoid robots, while your company... But, madam, Ira said, grinning, our household models are perfectly human in appearance. I should say imperfectly human, because we even gave them tiny blemishes to make them seem more natural. The woman was obviously unconvinced. Ira applied the clincher. What greater proof could you have than this? He held up his left hand, bearing his wrist, so that she could read his identification stamp. Model I, M-A-S-C. Serial number 27146, 12 volt. U.S. Robot Company, Incorporated. The woman's eyes widened. Her face took on an expression of delighted surprise. 
What better proof could you want? Ira repeated. Do I look like a robot? Am I not a perfect humanoid? Here, he said, extending his hand. Feel my skin, and see if it isn't just like a man's. The woman gingerly touched his hand. Her eyes mirrored her satisfaction. Ira pressed his advantage. Model I robots come in both masculine and feminine designs, built to your individual specifications, as to size, coloring, strength, personality traits, apparent age, and so forth. For example, lonely people can have companionship built in, if they like. You can have an Ira or an Inez possessing an almost human intelligence and free choice. Or you can get one that is blindly servile, and which will never volunteer advice or information. You can get an elderly, refined butler, or a handsome young man around the house. You can get a pretty, petite parlor maid, or a buxom cook. Ira paused to observe his customer. She was looking at him in a peculiar way. Knowing that he was a robot, she seemed to be appraising him, as she would a man. Ira noted her odd reaction, and puzzled over it. It usually went the other way. Women lost interest in him when they learned that he was not a man. "'Why don't you come inside?' the woman suggested suddenly, opening the door for him. Ira smiled at her graciousness, and went into the house. Her reaction was not so puzzling, after all, he decided. A young and virtuous wife would feel the conventional fears that were built into her by society. She had been careful. It was conceivably dangerous to be alone in the house with a handsome man. But if he's a robot, she has nothing to fear from him or herself. Sit down, the woman said, and rest a while. Thank you, ma'am, he sat. But, of course, I don't need to rest. Model eyes can do strenuous work for twenty-three out of every twenty-four hours. In fact, in laboratory tests, they've been run for one hundred and eighty-six hours continuously, without a breakdown. He was back in his sales pitch. Work is the basic function of all U.S. robot company robots. With all their aesthetic perfection, the household models are no exception to this rule. They are unequaled in efficient performance. Power is the keynote of the Model I. He opened his demonstration case and removed a steel bar, three inches in diameter. Placing one hand on each end, he bent the metal into a V. The heart of the mechanism, he went on, is a powerful 12-volt A battery perfectly shielded, and guaranteed to give trouble-free service for at least forty years. Sixteen motor centers are fed by the central power plant, all coordinated and synchronized by the best fluid electronic brain ever devised. Sturdy T.S. steel alloy construction overall gives the Model I its phenomenal strength and durability. And the surface tissue made of the new patented miracle material, combines the best features of aesthetic and functional performance. The woman was obviously impressed. Lips slightly parted, she watched Ira attentively and listened breathlessly to everything he said. Instinctively, he felt that he had made a sale. But the woman said nothing, only gazed at him in a way that might have been covetous, might have been adoring, or might have been merely symptomatic of hypnosis. May I demonstrate the eye's power and versatility in practical performance? Ira asked. Taking her silence to be consent, he swung into his demonstration. Swiftly, surely, he went about the room cleaning. Effortlessly, he lifted large pieces of furniture, and holding them aloft with his right hand, he cleaned under them with his left. He talked as he worked. Notice the quiet efficiency of the self-cleansing electrostatic duster we have built in. We also have attachments for waxing, 
washing, spraying, painting, ironing, soldering. You're wonderful, the woman sighed. And let me point out, he pursued, eager to clinch the sail, that the Model I is so lifelike that in normal operation it is almost completely silent. Only a faint throbbing, like that of a human heart, is noticeable. The woman cocked her head to the side. I don't hear anything, she said. Ira smiled triumphantly. Of course you don't. Come here, he said. Put your ear to my chest, and you'll be able to make it out. She rested her head on his chest and listened. The delicate fragrance of her perfume mingled with that of sweet human scent that not even the Model I robots could imitate. Ira bent his head and brushed his sensitized cheek against her hair. He felt emotions that no robot should feel. Silently, he cursed his makers and the wonderful human brain they had given him. Their theory was that a salesman, to be effective, should think exactly like a human being. To better satisfy the customers, he should appreciate every human drive and desire. But it was wrong to feel like a man, to desire like a man, to hurt like a man, and be unable to ease the pain because he was not a man. For once, U.S. Robot had gone too far. The woman looked up at him with eyes that broadcast adoration. You're wonderful, she repeated. Do you think? She hesitated, looking away. Could I be in love with you? She asked with childlike innocence. Is it possible? Ira felt flustered, giddy, lightheaded, exultant, confused, miserable, and weak. Damn U.S. robots and their perfect fluid electronics. But, madam, he protested, I'm not a man, I'm a... Please call me Emma, the woman said. You see, I'm not Mrs. Bartlett. I tried to tell you, madam is not at home. I only work here. Gone was his exalted feeling. Gone the lightheadedness. Only the misery and weakness remained in the realization that his yearning was impossible of fulfillment, and that, to top it off, he had wasted his time trying to sell himself to a servant. "'Do you think I could?' the maid repeated. "'Could what?' "'Be in love with you.' "'But, miss, don't you understand? I'm not—' "'My name is Emma,' she said softly. She smiled, and he fought down the overwhelming urge to touch her, to kiss her pink, inviting lips. He stood rigid. He wanted to cry out in his torment. Her hand reached out to him, and he felt her fingers touch his. Electricity tingled up his arm and through his chest. Automatically, he repeated his cursed disavowal of humanness. Vaguely, he heard his own words, sounding like an echo in his ears. I'm a robot. I know, Emma said quietly. Then she held up her right hand, revealing the identification stamp on her wrist. Model M. Female. Serial number 6139, 12 volt. Amalgamated Androids Incorporated. A moment later, the android was in his arms. He held her close, dizzy with the sensation of this new emotion, with one of his own kind. Several moments later, he pushed her gently away from him. "'Pack your bag, Emma,' he said. She looked at him starry-eyed, but quizzically. "'But my work! Madam will be furious!' "'Pack your bag, Emma,' he repeated. When our companies built us, they made us as near human as possible, perhaps too much so. If we can work for humans, we could also live like them. U.S. robots and amalgamated androids have just lost two of their employees. Your bag. Being an android, she could work faster than any human counterpart. Her bag was packed in nothing flat.
The End of Selling Point by Norman Arkaway Disqualified by Charles L. Fontenay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Humphreys. Disqualified by Charles L. Fontenay. Epigraph. If Saranta wished to qualify as one who loved his fellow man, he should have known that often the most secret of things are the most obvious. After the morning inspection tour, Tardo, the Solar Council's planetary aid agent, and his companion Pio were taken to the castle which stood on a hill overlooking the area. Tardo and Pio were entertained royally at luncheon by Saranta, their host, who appeared to be the wealthy overlord of this portion of the planet. The meal was delicious, tender, inch-thick steaks served with delicate wine sauce, and half a dozen of the planet's exotic vegetables, topped off by a cool fruit dessert. "'My recommendation will be of considerable importance to you,' said Tardo as they ate. "'If it is favorable, there is certain technical aid aboard ship which will be made available to you at once. "'Of course,' You will not receive advanced equipment from the Solar Council until there is a more thorough investigation. I'm afraid our culture is too simple and agrarian to win your approval, said Sorrento modestly. That isn't a major consideration. The Council understands the difficulties that have faced colonies and other star systems. There are certain fundamental requirements, of course. No abnormal religious practices, no slavery. Well, you understand what I mean. We really feel that we have done well since we, our ancestors, that is, colonized our world a thousand years ago, said Saranta, toying with a wine glass. A smiling servant filled the glasses of Tardo and Pio. You see, there was no fuel for the ship to explore other planets in the system, and the ship just rusted away. Since we are some distance from the solar system, Yours is the first ship that has landed here since colonization. You seem to have been lucky, though, said Pio. He was navigator of the council ship, and had asked to accompany Tardo on the brief inspection trip. You could have landed on a barren planet. Well, no, the colonizers knew it was livable from the first exploration expedition, said Saranta. There were difficulties, of course. Luxuriant vegetation, but no animal life, so we had no animals to domesticate. Pulling a plow is hard work for a man. But you were able to solve the situation in a humanitarian way, asked Tardo, peering at him keenly. That is to say, you didn't resort to slavery? Saranta smiled and spread his hands slightly. Does this look like a slave society to you? he countered. The colonists were anxious to cooperate to make the planet livable. No one objected to work. It's true we've seen no slaves that we know about, said Tardo. But two days is a short time for inspection. I must draw most of my conclusions from the attitudes of you and the others who are our hosts. How about the servants here? They are paid, answered Sorrento, and added ruefully. There are those of us who think they are paid too well. They have a union, you know. Tardo laughed. A carryover from Earth, no doubt, he commented. An unusual one, too, for a culture without technology. When the meal was over, the two men from the ship were conducted on a tour of the area. There was a neat agricultural community with broad fields, well-constructed buildings, and, a short distance from Saranta's castle-like home, a village in which artisans and craftsmen plied their peaceful trades. Pio tried to notice what he thought Tardo would look for in such a short inspection. The council agent he knew had had intensive training and many years of experience. It was hard for Pio to judge what factors Tardo would consider significant. Probably very minor ones that the average man would not notice, he thought. Tardo had seemed most intent on the question of slavery and Pio looked for signs of it. He could see none. The people of the planet had had time to conceal some things, of course, 
but the people they saw in the village wore a proud air of independence no slave could assume. Saranta apologized for their having to walk, explaining that there was no other means of transportation on the planet. And without transportation, you can understand why we have not been able to develop a technology, he added. We hope transport will be included in the first assistance you will give us. Tardo asked about the fields. I see there is no one working them, he said. Is that done by the villagers? Our labor supply is transient, answered Sorrento after a moment's hesitation. The laborers who will work our fields, for a wage, of course, are probably in the next town or the one beyond it now. Alpha Perse was sinking in the western sky when Tardo and Pio took their leave of Saranta and made their way down the road toward their planetary landing craft. It looks like a good world to me, said Pio. If tomorrow's inspection is as satisfactory, I suppose you will recommend the beginning of technical aid? There will be no inspection tour tomorrow, and I shall recommend a gain state at this time, replied Tardo. I've seen enough. Why? asked Pio, surprised. There are two classes of people on this planet, and we've seen only one, said Tardo. Those we have seen are freemen. The others are no better than animals. We give no aid that helps men tighten their hold over their fellows. If you haven't seen them, how do you know there is another class? demanded Pio. There is no evidence of any such situation. The evidence is well hidden. But if you think your stomach can take it now, I'll tell you. If you remember your history, colonizing ships 1,000 years ago had no space to carry animals along. They had to depend on native animal life of the planet, and this planet had none. Sorrent has said that, but I don't see... Those were delicious steaks, weren't they? remarked Tardo, quietly. End of Disqualified by Charles L. Fontenay Recording by Jason Humphreys, Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia Vanishing Point by Charles Clarence Beck This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Victor Sheremet Vanishing Point by Charles Clarence Beck In perspective, theoretically, the vanishing point is at infinity and therefore unattainable, but reality is different. Vanishment occurs a lot sooner than theory suggests. That? Oh, that's a perspective machine. Well, not exactly, but that's what I call it. No, I don't know how it works. Too complicated for me. Carter could make it go. But after he made it, he never used it. Too bad. He thought he'd make a lot of money with it there for a while, while he was working it out. Almost had me convinced, but I told him, get it to working first, Carter, and then show me what you can do with it better than I can do without it. I'm doing pretty well as is uh, pictures selling good, even if I do make them um, all by guesswork as you call it. That's what I told him. I see, Carter was one of them artists that think they can work everything out by formulas and stuff. Me, I just paint things as I see them. Never worry about perspective and all that kinda mechanical aids. Never even went to art school, but I do all right. Carter now was a different sort of artist. Well, he wasn't really an artist more of a draftsman. I first got him in to help me with a series of real estate paintings I'd got an order for. Big aerial views of land developments and drawings of buildings, roads and causeways, that kind of stuff. Was a little too much for me to handle alone, cause I never studied that kind of things, you know. I thought he'd do the mechanical drawings, which should have been simple for anybody trained that way and I'd throw in the colors, figures, and the trees, and so on. He did fine. Job came out good. Client was really happy. We made a pretty good amount on the job, enough to keep us for a couple of months without working afterwards. I took it easy, fishing and so on, but Carter stayed here in the studio working on his own stuff. 
I let him keep an eye on things for me around the place, and just dropped in now and then to check up. The guy was nuts on the subject of perspective. I thought he knew all there was to know about it already, but he claimed nobody knew anything about it, really. Said he'd been studying it for years, and the more he learned about it, the more there was to learn. He used to cover big sheets of paper with complicated diagrams trying to prove something or other to himself. I'd come into the studio and find him with thumbtacks and strings and stuff all over the place. He'd get big long rulers and draw lines to various points all over the room and end up with a little drawing of a cube about an inch square that anybody could have made in a half a minute without all the apparatus. Seemed pretty silly to me. Then he brought in some books on mathematics and physics and other things, and a bunch of slide rules, calculators and junk. He must have been a pretty smart guy to know how to handle all those things, even if he was kinda dopey about other things. You know, women and fishing and sports and drinking, he was lousy at everything except working those perspective problems. Personally, I couldn't see much sense to what he was doing. The guy could draw all right already, so I asked him what more did he want. Let me see if I can remember what he said. I'm trying to get at things as they really are, not as they appear, he said. I think those were his words. Art is an illusion, a bag of tricks. Reality is something else, not what we think it is. Drawings are two-dimensional projections of a world that is not merely three, but four-dimensional, if not more, he said. Yeah, kind of crackpot Carter was. Just on that one subject, though. Nice enough guy otherwise. Here, look at some of the drawings he made, working out his formulas. Nice designs, huh? Might make good wallpaper or fabric patterns. Really abstract. That's what people seem to like. See all those little letters scattered around among the lines? Different kinds of vanishing points they are. Carter claimed the whole world was full of vanishing points. You don't know what a vanishing point is? Let me see if I can explain. Come over to the window here. You see how that road out there gets smaller and smaller in the distance? Of course, the road doesn't really get smaller. It just looks that way. That's what we call a vanishing point in drawing. Simple, isn't it? Never could understand why Carter went to so much trouble working out all those ways to locate vanishing points. Me, I just throw them in wherever I need them. But Carter claimed that was wrong. Said they were all connected together some way. And he was gonna work out a method to prove it. Here... Here's a little gadget he made up to help his calculations. Bunch of disks all pivoted together at the center. You are supposed to turn them around so the arrows point to the different figures and things. Here's the square root sign. I remember Carter telling me that. This one is the tangent function, whatever that means. Log there is short of logarithm. Oh, he had a bunch of that scientific stuff in his head all the time. Don't know whether he understood it all himself. He built this thing just before he put together the perspective machine there. Silly looking gadget, huh? All them pipes and wires and that little cube in the center. Don't try to touch it. It ain't really there. You just think it is. It's what Carter called a tetaract or cataract. No, that ain't the right word. Something like that, Tess or something or other. There's a picture like it on one of Carter's books. Hurts your eyes to look at it, don't it? That's what Carter thought was going to make him a lot of fame and money, that perspective machine. I told him nobody ever made that drawing machine yet that worked. But he said it wasn't supposed to make drawings. It was just supposed to give people a view of what reality really is instead of what they think it is. I don't know whether he expected to charge money to look through it or whether he was gonna look through it himself and make some new kind of drawings and sell them. No, I can't tell you how it works. I said before I don't know. Carter only used it once himself. I came in here the day he finished it. 
just as he was ready to turn it on. He was just putting the finishing touches on it. In a few minutes, he told me, I'll have the answer to a question that may never have been answered before. What is reality? Is the world a thing by itself and all the no illusion? Why do things grow smaller the farther away from us they appear? Why can't we see more than one side of anything at a time? What happens to the far side of an object? Does it cease to exist just because we can't see it? Are objects not present non-existent? Because artists draw things vanishing to points. Does that mean that they really vanish? A walk, that's what he was. Nice guy, but sort of screwy. He kept saying more goofy things while he was finishing up the machine, about how he'd figure out that all we knew about vision and drawing was so and must be wrong, and that once he got a look at the real world, he'd prove it. How about cameras? I asked him. Take a picture with a camera, and it looks just about the same as a drawing, don't it? That's because cameras are built to take pictures like we are used to seeing them, he said. Flat two-dimensional slices of reality, without depth or motion. Even 3D moving pictures, I asked. They are closer to reality, he admitted. But there are still only cross-sections of it. The shutter of a movie camera is closed as much of the time as it is open. What happens in between the times it's open? You know, he went on. People used to think matter and motion were continuous, but scientists have proved that they are discontinuous. Now some of them think time may be, too. Maybe everything is just imaginary and appears to our senses in whatever way we want it to appear. We are so well trained that we see everything just as we are taught to see it by generations of artists, writers and other symbol makers. If we could see things as they really are, what might happen? We'd probably all go nuts, I told him. He just smiled. Well, here goes, he said. It's finished. Now to find out who is right, the scientists and philosophers who say reality is forever unreachable, or the artists who say there isn't any reality, that we make the whole thing up to suit ourselves. He moved one of those pointers you see there and squinted around at the different scales and dials and then stepped back. That little Tessie thing appeared real small at first. Just a point, you could hardly see it. I couldn't see anything else happening, and thought he was gonna do something else to the machine. I turned to look at Carter and saw his face was white as a sheet. Good God, he says. Just like that, good God, that's all. Well, I says to him, who was right, the scientists or the artists? The artists. He sort of screeches. The artists were right all the time. There is no reality. It's all a fabric of illusion we've created ourselves. And now I've ripped a hole in that. He gives a strangle hood and goes hightailing out of here like something was after him. Jumps in his car and roars off down the road and disappears. Now, I don't mean he really disappeared. Are you nuts? Just roared on down the road till he got so small I couldn't see him no more. You know, the way things do when they go farther and farther away. Happens every day. That's what us artists mean by perspective. The machine? Well, I don't know what to do with it. If Carter ever comes back, he might not like my getting rid of it. I was thinking maybe I'd put it in the hobby show at the county fair next week, though. Yeah, notice how that funny-looking cube inside there gets bigger every time you look at it? There, it just doubled its size again. See? People at the fair ought to get a big kick out of that. No telling how big it'll get with all those people looking at it. But come on, let's go fishing. With better hurry, or it'll be too late. End of Vanishing Point by Charles Clarence Beck. Recording by Victor Sheremet, Bucharest. Site victorsheremet.com. The Sound of Silence by Barbara Constant. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Cameron Blakely. The Sound of Silence by Barbara Constant. Most people, when asked to define the ultimate in loneliness, say it's being alone in a crowd, and it takes only one slight difference to make one forever alone in the crowd. Nobody at Hoskins, Haskell, and Chapman, Incorporated knew just why Lucilla Brown, Gigi Hoskins' secretary, came to work half an hour early every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Even Gigi, had he been asked, would have had trouble explaining how his occasional exasperated wish that just once somebody would reach the office ahead of him could have caused his attractive young secretary to start doing so three times a week, or kept her at it all the months since that first gloomy March day. Nobody asked Gigi, however, not even Paul Chapman, the very junior partner in the advertising firm, who had displayed more than a little interest in Lucilla all fall and winter, but very little interest in anything all spring and summer. Nobody asked Lucilla why she left early on the day she arrived early, after all, eight hours is long enough, and certainly nobody knew where Lucilla went at 4.30 on those three days, nor would anybody in the office have believed it, had he known. Lucky Brown? Seeing a psychiatrist? The typist would have giggled, the office boy would have snorted, and every salesman on the force would have guffawed. Even Paul Chapman might have managed a wry smile. A real laugh had been beyond him for several months. Ever since he asked Lucilla confidently, Will you marry me? And she answered, I'm sorry, Paul. Thanks, but no thanks. Not that seeing a psychiatrist was anything to laugh at in itself. After all, the year was 1962, and there were almost as many serious articles about mental health as there were cartoons about psychoanalysts, even in the magazines that specialized in poking fun. In certain cities, including Los Angeles, in certain industries, especially advertising, I have an appointment with my psychiatrist was a perfectly acceptable excuse for leaving work early. The idea of a secretary employed by almost the largest advertising firm in one of the best-known suburbs in the sprawling city of the Angels doing so should not, therefore, have seemed particularly odd. Not what it have if the person involved had been anyone at all except Lucilla Brown. The idea that she might need aid of any kind, particularly psychiatric, was ridiculous. She had been born 22 years earlier in the undisputed possession of a sizable silver spoon, and she was, in addition, bright, beautiful, and charming, with 20-20 vision, perfect teeth, a father and mother who adored her, friends who did likewise, and the kind of luck you'd have to see to believe. Other people entered contests. Lucilla won them. Other people drove five miles over the legal speed limit and got caught doing it. Lucilla outdistanced them but virtuously slowed down just before the highway patrol appeared from nowhere. Other people waited in the wrong line at the bank while the woman ahead of them learned how to roll pennies. Lucilla was always in the line that moved right up to the teller's window. Lucky was not, in other words, just a happenstance abbreviation of Lucilla. It was an exceedingly apt nickname, and Lucky Brown's co-workers would have been quite justified in laughing at the very idea of her being unhappy about anything, to spend three precious hours a week stretched out on a brown leather couch, staring miserably at a pale blue ceiling and fumbling for words that refused to come. There were a good many days when Lucilla felt like laughing at the idea herself, and there were other days when she didn't even feel like smiling. Wednesday, the 25th of July, was one of the days when she didn't feel like smiling, or talking, or moving. It had started out badly when she opened her eyes and found herself staring at a familiar blue ceiling. I don't know, she said irritably. I tell you, I simply don't know what happens. I'll start to answer someone and the words will be right on the tip of my tongue, ready to be spoken. Then I'll say something altogether different. Or I'll start to cross the street and, for no reason at all, be unable to even step off the curb. For no reason at all, Dr. Andrews asked. Are you sure you aren't withholding something you might ought to tell me? She shifted a little, suddenly uncomfortable, and then she was fully awake and the ceiling was ivory, not blue. She stared at it for a long moment, completely disoriented, before she realized that she was in her own bed, not on Dr. Andrew's brown leather couch, and that the conversation had been another of the interminable imaginary dialogues she found herself carrying on with the psychiatrist, day and night, awake and asleep. Get out of my dream, she ordered crossly, summoning up a quick mental picture of Dr. Andrew's expressive face, level gray eyes, and silvering temples, the better to banish him from her thoughts. She was immediately sorry she had done so, for the image remained fixed in her mind. 
She could almost feel his eyes as she heard his voice ask again. For no reason at all, Lucilla? The weather man had promised a scorcher, and the heat that already lay like a blanket over the room made it seem probable the promise would be fulfilled. She moved listlessly, showering, patting herself dry, lingering over the choice of a dress until her mother called urgently from the kitchen. She was long minutes behind schedule when she left the house. Usually, she rather enjoyed easing her small car into the stream of automobiles pouring down Sepulveda toward the San Diego freeway, jockeying for position, shifting expertly from one lane to another to take advantage of every break in the traffic. This morning, she felt only angry impatience. She choked back on the irritated impulse to drive directly into the side of a car that cut across in front of her, held her horn button down furiously when a slow t starting truck hesitated, fractionally after the light turned green. When she finally edged her Renault up on the on-ramp and the freeway stretched straight and unobstructed ahead, she stepped down on the accelerator and watched the needle climb up and pass the legal 65-mile limit. The sound of her tires on the smooth concrete was soothing, and the rush of wind outside gave the morning an illusion of coolness. She edged away from the tangle of cars that had pulled onto the freeway with her and momentarily was alone on the road. With her rearview mirror blank, the oncoming lanes bare, and a small rise shutting off the world ahead. That was when it happened. Get out of the way, a voice shrieked. Out of the way, out of the way, out of the way! Her heart lurched, her stomach twisted convulsively, and there was a brassy taste in her mouth. Instinctively, she stamped down on the brake pedal, swerved sharply on to the outer lane. By the time she had topped the rise, she was going a cautious fifty miles an hour and hugging the far edge of the freeway. Then, and only then, she heard the squeal of agonized tires and saw the cumbersome semi-trailer coming from the opposite direction rocking dangerously. Jackknife into the dividing post that separated north and southbound traffic, crunched ponderously through them and crashed to a stop several hundred feet ahead of her and squarely athwart the lane down which she had been speeding only seconds earlier. The highway patrol materialized within minutes. Even so, it was after eight by the time Lucilla gave them her statement, agreed for the upteenth time with the shaken but uninjured truck driver that it was indeed fortunate she hadn't been in the center lane, and drove slowly the remaining miles to the office. The gray mood of early morning had changed to black. Now there were two voices in her mind, competing for attention. I knew it was going to happen, the truck driver said. I couldn't see her over the top of that hill. All I could do was fight the wheel and pray that if anybody was coming, he'd get out of the way. She could almost hear him repeating the words, Get out of the way, out of the way. And right on the heel of his cry came Dr. Andrew's soft query. For no reason at all, Lucilla? She pulled into the company parking lot, jerked the wheel savagely to the left, jammed on the brakes. Shut up, she said. Shut up, both of you. She started into the building, then hesitated. She was already late, but there was something. Get out of the way, the way, for no reason at all, at all. She yielded the impulse and walked hurriedly downstairs to the basement library. That stuff I asked you to get together for me by tomorrow, Ruthie, she said to the gray-haired librarian. You wouldn't by any chance have already done it, would you? Funny you should ask, the elderly woman bobbed down behind the counter and popped back up with an armload of magazines and newspapers. Just happened to have some free time last thing yesterday. It's already charged out to you, so you just go right ahead and take it, dearie. It was 8.30 when Lucilla reached the office. When I need you, where are you? Gigi asked sourly. Learned last night that the top dog at Cary Carton Corporation is in town today, so they pushed that conference up from Friday to 10 this morning. If you'd been here early, or even on time, we might at least have gotten some of the information together. Lucilla laid the stack of material on his desk. I haven't had time to flag the pages yet, she said, but they're listed on the library request on top. We did 19 ads for KK last year and three of premium offers. I stopped by sales on my way in. Susie's digging out figures for you now. Hmm, said Gigi. Well, so that's where you've been. You could at least have let me know. There was grudging approval beneath his gruffness. Say, how do you know I needed this today, anyhow? Didn't, said Lucilla, putting her purse away and whisking the cover of her typewriter. Happenstance, that's all. Just happened to go down to the library, for no reason at all, withholding something. Get out of the way. The telephone's demand for attention overrode her thoughts. 
She reached for it almost gratefully. Mr. Hoskins' office, she said. Yes. Guess he knows about the ten o'clock meeting this morning. Thanks for calling anyway. She hung up and glanced at Gigi, but he was so immersed in one of the magazines that the ringing telephone hadn't even disturbed him. Ringing? The last thing she had did before she left the office each night was set the lever in the instrument's base to off, so the bell would have not disturbed Gigi if he worked late. So far today, nobody had set it back to on. It's getting worse, she said miserably to the pale blue ceiling. The phone didn't ring this morning. It couldn't have, but I answered it. Dr. Andrews said nothing at all. She let her eyes flicker sideways, but he was outside her range of vision. I don't like having you sit where I can't see you, she said crossly. Freud may have thought it was a good idea, but I think it's a lousy one. She clenched her hands and stared at nothing. The silence stretched thinner and thinner, like a balloon blown big, until the temptation to rupture it was too great to resist. I didn't see the truck this morning, nor hear it. There was no reason at all for me to slow down and pull over. You might be dead if you hadn't. Wouldn't you like that better? The matter-of-fact question was like a hand laid across Lucilla's mouth. I don't want to be dead, she admitted finally. Neither do I want to go on like this, hearing words that aren't spoken and bells that don't ring. When it gets to the point that I pick up a phone just because somebody's thinking, she stopped abruptly. I didn't quite catch the end of that sentence, Dr. Andrew said. I didn't quite finish it. I can't. Can't or won't. Don't hold anything back, Lucilla. You were saying that you picked up the phone just because somebody was thinking. He paused expectantly. Lucilla reread the ornate letters on the framed diploma on the wall, looked critically at the picture of Mrs. Andrews, whom she'd met, and her impish daughter, whom she hadn't, counted the number of pleats in the billowing drapes, ran a tentative finger over the face of her wristwatch, straightened a fold of her skirt, and could stand the silence no longer. All right, she said wearily. The girl at Carrie Carton thought about talking to me and I heard my phone ring. Even though the bell was disconnected, Gigi thought about needing backup material for the conference, and I went to the library. The truck driver thought about warning people, and I got out of his way. So I can read people's minds? Some people's minds? Some of the time, anyway? Only there's no such thing as telepathy. And if I'm not telepathic, then... She caught herself in the brink of time and bit back the final word, fighting for self-control. Then what? The peremptory question toppled Lucilla's defenses. I'm crazy, she said. Speaking the word released all the others dammed up behind it. Ever since I can remember, things like this have happened. All at once, in the middle of doing something or saying something. I'd find myself thinking about what somebody else was doing or saying. Not thinking, knowing. I'd be playing hide-and-seek, and I could see the places where the other kids were hiding, just as plainly as I could see my own surroundings. Or I'd be worrying over the answers to an exam question, and I'd know what somebody in the back of the room had decided to write down, or what the teacher was expecting us to write. Not always, but it happened often enough so that it bothered me, just the way it does now when I answer a question before it's been asked, or know what the driver ahead of me is going to do a split second before he does it, or win a bridge game because I can see everybody else's hand through his own eyes. Almost. Has it always... Bothered you, Lucilla? No. She drew the word out, considering, trying to think when it was that she hadn't felt uneasy about the unexpected moments of perceptiveness. When she was very little, perhaps, she thought of the tiny laughing girl and the faded snaps of the old album, and suddenly, inexplicably, she was that self, moving through remembered rooms, pausing to collect a word from a boyish father, a thought from a pretty young mother. Reluctantly, she closed her eyes against that distant time. Way back, she said, when I didn't know any better. I just took it for granted that sometimes people talk to each other and that sometimes they pass thoughts along without putting them into words. I was about six, I guess, when I found out it wasn't so. She slipped into her six-year-old self as easily as she'd been donned the younger Lucilla. This time she wasn't in a house, but high on a hillside, walking on springy pine needles instead of prosaic carpet. Talk, Dr. Andrews reminded her, his voice so soft that it could almost have come from inside her own mind. We were picnicking, she said. A whole lot of us. Somehow, I wandered away from the others. One minute the hill was bright with sun, and the next it was deep in shadows, and the wind that had been barely cool was downright cold. 
She shivered and glanced around, expecting her mother to be somewhere near, holding out a sweater or jacket. There was no one at all in sight. Even then, she never thought of being frightened. She turned to retrace her steps. There was a big tree that looked familiar and a funny rock behind it, half buried in the hillside. She was trudging toward it, humming under her breath. Then the worry thoughts began to reach her. Only a little creek, so I don't think she could have fallen in. Not really any bears around here, but she never gets hurt. Creek, bear, twisted ankle, dark, cold. She had veered from her course and started in the direction of the first thought. But now they were coming from all sides, and she had no idea at all which way to go. She ran wildly then, first one way, then the other, sobbing and calling. Lucilla! The voice sliced into the night, and the dark mountainside and the frightened child were gone. She shuddered a little, reminiscently, and put her hand over her eyes. Somebody found me, of course, and then Mother was holding me and crying, and I was crying too, and telling her how all the different thoughts at once frightened me and mixed me up. She she scolded me for, for telling fibs, and said that nobody except crazy people thought they could read each other's minds. I see, said Dr. Andrews. So you tried not to, of course. And any time you did it again, or thought you did, you blamed it on coincidence, or luck, and had that nightmare again. Yes, that too. Tell me about it. I already have, over and over. Tell me again, then. I feel like a fool repeating myself, she complained. Dr. Andrews made no comment. Oh, all right. It always starts with me walking down a crowded street, surrounded by honking cars and yelling newsboys and talking people. The noise bothers me, and I'm tempted to cover my ears to shut it out. But I try to ignore it, instead, and walk faster and faster. Bit by bit, the buildings I pass are smaller, the people fewer, the noise less. All at once, I discover there's nothing around at all but a spreading carpet of gray-green moss, years deep, and a silence that feels as old as time itself. There's nothing to frighten me, but I am frightened, and lonesome, not so much for people, but for a sound any sound. I turn to run back toward town, but there's nothing behind me now but the same gray moss and gray sky and dead silence. By the time she reached the last word, her throat had tightened until speaking was difficult. She reached out blindly for something to cling to. Her groping hand met Dr. Andrews, and his warm fingers clawed reassuringly around hers. Gradually, the panic drained away, but she could think of nothing to say at all although she longed to have the silence broken. As if he sensed her longing, Dr. Andrew said, You started having the dream more often just after you told Paul you wouldn't marry him. Is that right? No, it was the other way around. I hadn't had it for months, not since I fell in love with him. Then he got assigned to that Witch Tomorrow show, and he started calling me Lucky, the way everybody does, and the dream came back. She stopped short and turned on the couch to stare at the psychiatrist with startled eyes. But that can't be how it was, she said. The lonesomeness must have started after I decided not to marry him. Not before. I wonder why the dream stopped when you fell in love with him. That's easy, Lucilla said promptly, grasping at the chance to evade her own more disturbing question. I felt close to him, whether he was with me or not. The way I used to feel close to people back when I was a little girl, before... Well, before that day in the mountains, when Mother said, That was when you started having the dream, wasn't it? How'd you know? I didn't, not until just now. But yes, that's when it started. I'd never minded the dark or being alone, but I was frightened when Mother shut the door that night, because the walls seemed so, so solid now that I knew all the thoughts I used to think were with me that were just pretend. When I finally went to sleep, I dreamed and I went on having the same dream, night after night after night, until finally they called the doctor, and he gave me something to make me sleep. I wish they'd called me, Dr. Andrews said. What could you have done? The sleeping pills worked anyway, and after a while I didn't need them anymore, because I'd heard other kids talking about having hunches and lucky streaks, and I stopped feeling different from the rest of them, except once in a while, when I was so lucky it bothered me. And after you met Paul, you stopped being too lucky, and the dream stopped? No! Lucilla was startled at her own vehemence. No, it wasn't like that at all, and you'd know it if you'd been listening. 
With Paul, I felt close to him all the time, no matter how many miles or walls or anything else that was between us. We hardly had to talk at all, because we seemed to know just what the other one was thinking all the time, listening to music or watching the waves pound in or just working together at the office. Instead of feeling odd when I knew what he was thinking or what he was going to say, I felt good about it, because I was so sure it was the same way with him and what I was thinking. We didn't talk about it. There just wasn't any need to. She lapsed into silence again. Dr. Andrews straightened her clenched hand and stroked the fingers gently. After a moment, she went on. He hadn't asked me to marry him, but I knew he would, and there wasn't any hurry, because everything was so perfect anyway. But one of the company's clients decided to sponsor a series of fantasy shows on TV and wanted us to tie in the ads for next year with the fantasy theme. Paul was assigned to the account, and Gigi let him borrow me to work on it, because it was such a rush project. I'd always liked fairy stories when I was little, and when I discovered there were grown-up ones too, like those in Unknown Worlds and the old weird tales, I read them too. But I hadn't any idea how much there was, until we started buying copies of everything there was on the newsstands and then ransacking musty little stores for back issues and the ones that had gone out of publication, until Pa's office was just full of teetery piles of gaudy magazines, and everywhere you looked there were pictures of strange stars and eight-legged monsters and men in spacesuits. So what did the magazines have to do with you and Paul? The way he felt about them changed everything. He just laughed at the ones about spaceships and other planets and robots and things, but he didn't laugh when he came across stories about well, mutants and people with talents. Talents? Like reading minds, you mean? She nodded, not looking at him. He didn't laugh at those. He acted as if they were, well, indecent, the sort of thing you wouldn't be caught dead reading in public. And he thought that way, too, especially about the stories that even mentioned telepathy. At first, when he brought them to my attention in that disapproving way, I thought he was just pretending to sneer to tease me, because he, we, knew they could be true. Only his thoughts matched his remarks. He hated the stories, Dr. Andrews, and was just determined to have me hate them, too. All at once, I began to feel as if I didn't know him at all, and I began to wonder if I'd just imagined everything all those months I felt so close to him. And then I began to dream again, and to think about that lonesome, silent world, even when I was wide awake. Go on, Lucilla, Dr. Andrew said, as she hesitated. That's all, just about. We finished the job and got rid of the magazines, and for a little while it was almost as if those two weeks had never been, except I couldn't forget that he didn't know what I was thinking at all, even when everything he did almost made it seem as if he did. It began to seem wrong for me to know what he was thinking. Crazy, like my mother had said, and worse somehow. Not well, not even nice if you know what I mean. Then he asked you to marry him. And I said no, even when I wanted oh so terribly to say yes and yes and yes. She squeezed her eyes tight, shut to hold back a rush of tears. Time folded back on itself. Once again, the hands of her wristwatch pointed to 4.30, and the white-clad receptionist asked briskly, Doctor will see you now. Once again, from some remote vantage point, Lucilla watched herself brush past Dr. Andrews and cross to the familiar couch, heard herself say, It's getting worse, watched herself move through a flickering montage of scenes from childhood to womanhood, from past to present. She opened her eyes to meet those of the man who sat patiently beside her. You see, he said, telling me wasn't so difficult after all. And then, before she had decided on a response, What do you know about Darwin's theory of evolution, Lucilla? This habit of ending a tense moment by making an irrelevant query no longer even startled her. Obediently, she fumbled for an answer. Not much, just that he thought all the different kinds of life on Earth today evolved from a few blobs of protoplasm that sprouted wings or grew fur or developed teeth, depending on when they lived and where. She paused hopefully, but met with only silence. Sometimes what seemed like a step forward wasn't, she said, ransacking her brain for scattered bits of information. Then the species died out, like the saber-toothed tiger, with those tusks that kept right on growing until they locked his jaws shut, so he starved to death. 
As she spoke, she remembered the huge beast as he had been pictured in one of her college textbooks. The recollection grew more and more vivid, until she could see both the picture and the facing page of text. There was an irregularly shaped ink blot in the upper corner and severely heavily underlined sentences that stood out so distinctly she could actually read the words. According to Darwin, variations in general are not infinitesimal, but in the nature of specific mutations. Thousands of these occur, but only the fittest survive the climate, the times, natural enemies, and their own kind, who strive to perpetuate themselves unchanged. Taken one by one, the words were all familiar. Taken as a whole, they made no sense at all. She let the book slip unheeded from her mind and stared at Dr. Andrews in bewilderment. Try saying it in a different way. You sound like a school teacher humoring a stupid child. And then, because of the habit of obedience was strong, I guess he meant that tails didn't grow an inch at a time, the way dogs got cut off, but all at once. Like a fish being born with legs as well as fins. Or a baby saber tooth showing up among tigers with regular teeth. Or one ape in a tribe discovering he could swing down out of the treetops and stand erect and walk alone. He echoed her last words, and walk alone. A premonitory chill traced its icy way down Lucilla's backbone. For a second she stood on gray moss, under a gray sky, in the midst of a gray silence. He not only could walk alone, he had to. Do you remember what your book said? Only the fittest survive, Lucilla said numbly, because they have to fight the climate, and their natural enemies, and their own kind. She swung her feet to the floor and pushed herself into a sitting position. I'm not a, a mutation. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. And you can't say I am because I won't listen. I didn't say you were. There was the barest hint of emphasis on the first word. Lucilla was almost certain she heard a whisper of laughter, but he met her gaze blandly, his expression completely serious. Don't you dare laugh, she said nonetheless. There's nothing funny about... about... About being able to read people's minds, Dr. Andrews said helpfully. You'd much rather have me offer some other explanation for the occurrences that bother you so. Is that it? I guess so. Yes, it is. A brain tumor. Or schizophrenia. Or anything at all that could make me be cured, so I could marry Paul and have children and be like everybody else. Like you. She looked past him to the picture on his desk. It's easy for you to talk. He ignored the last statement. Why can't you get married anyway? You've already said why. Because Paul would hate me. Everybody would hate me. If they knew I was different. How would they know? It doesn't show. Now if you had three legs, or a long bushy tail, or outsized teeth. Lucilla smiled involuntarily, and then was furious at herself for doing so, and at Dr. Andrews for provoking her into it. This whole thing is utterly asinine, anyhow. Here we are, talking as if I might really be a mutant, and you know perfectly well that I'm not. Do I? You made the diagnosis, Lucilla, and you've given me some mighty potent reasons for believing it. Can you give me equally good reasons for doubting that you're a telepath? The peremptory demand left Lucilla speechless for a moment. She groped blindly for an answer, but then almost laughed aloud as she found it. But of course, I almost missed it, even after you practically drew me a diagram. If I could read minds, just as soon as anybody found it out, he'd be afraid of me, or hate me, like the book said, and you said too. If you believed it, you'd do something like having me locked up in a hospital, maybe, instead of... Instead of what, Lucilla? Instead of being patient and nice and helping me see how silly I've been. She reached out impulsively to touch his hand, then withdrew her own, feeling somewhat foolish when he made no move to respond. Her relief was too great, however, to be contained in silence. Way back the first time I came in, almost you said that before we finished therapy, you'd known me better than I knew myself. I didn't believe you. Maybe I didn't want to. But I began to think you were right. A lot of times lately, you've answered a question before I even asked it. Sometimes you haven't even bothered to answer. You've just sat there in your big brown chair, and I've lain here on the couch and we've gone through something together without using words at all. She had started out almost gaily, the words spilling over each other in their rush to be said, but bit by bit she slowed down, then faltered to a stop. 
After she had stopped talking altogether, she could still hear her last few phrases, repeated over and over like an echo that refused to die. Answered, before I even asked, without using words at all, without using words. She could almost taste the terror that clogged her throat and dried her lips. You do believe it, and you could have me locked up, only, only... Fragments of thought, splinters of words, and droplets of silence spun into a kaleidoscopic jumble, shifted infinitesimally, and fell into an incredible new pattern. Understanding displaced terror and was, in turn, displaced by indignation. She stared accusingly at her interrogator. But you look just like... just like anybody. You expected perhaps three legs or a long bushy tail or teeth like that textbook tiger? And you're a psychiatrist! What else? Would you have talked to me like this across a grocery counter, Lucilla? Or listened to me if I'd been driving a bus or filling a prescription? Would I have found the others in a bowling alley or a business office? Then there are... others? She let out a breath on a long sigh, involuntarily glancing again at the framed picture. Only I love Paul, and he isn't... he can't... Nor can Carol. His eyes were steady on hers. Yet she felt as if he were looking through and beyond her. For no reason at all, she strained her ears for the sound of footsteps or the summons of a voice. Where do you suppose the second little blob of protoplasm with legs came from? Dr. Andrews asked. And the third? If that ape who found he could stand erect had walked lonesomely off into the sunset like a second-rate actor on a late, late show, where do you suppose you'd be today? He broke off abruptly and watched with Lucilla as the office door edged open. The small girl who inched her way around it wore blue jeans and a ponytail rather than an organdy frock and curls. But her pixie smile matched that of the girl in the photograph Lucilla had glanced at again and again. You wanted me, Daddy? she asked, but she looked toward Lucilla. I thought you liked to meet someone with the same nickname as yours, Dr. Andrews said, rising to greet her. Lucky? Meet Lucky. Hello, she said, then her smile widened. Hello! But I don't have to say it, do I? I can talk to you just the way I talk to Daddy and Uncle Whitney and Big Bill. Hello yourself, said Lucilla. This time, when the corners of her mouth began to tick upward, she made no attempt to stop them. Of course you can, darling, and I can answer you the same way, and you'll hear me. Dr. Andrews reached for the open pack of cigarettes on his desk. Are you a private conversation, girls, or can I get in on it, too? It's impolite to interrupt, Daddy. He's not exactly interrupting. It was his conversation to begin with. Dr. Andrews' receptionist paused briefly beside the still open office door. None of them heard either her gentle rap or the soft click of the latch slipping into place when she pushed the door shut. Nor did she hear them. End of The Sound of Silence by Barbara Constant Field Trip by Jean Hunter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Field Trip by Jean Hunter Kyle was disgusted with the slow, cumbrous train. He disliked using this uncomfortable means of travel. But since he wanted to learn more about these strange creatures who were his ancestors, he had decided to try to become used to their ways. He was lonely in this strange, backward age, and when he unexpectedly saw another being like himself in the same coach, he hastened to make his presence known. He introduced himself and asked politely, Where are you from? Eight thousand, the other replied. Name's Broik. From Seven Galaxy. I'm from out nineteen way myself, Kyle said. Just a country boy. But eight thousand. That's only a period ahead of my own time. Maybe you could tell me. Ah, ah, the other admonished. Remember the first law of Thek. Ah, center, Kyle grumbled. I know. One may not divulge any scientific, technical, or social information to anyone from his own past whom he may meet at an equidistant point in a Thek travel. I forgot. Bad, Broik said. Then he added almost jokingly, You wouldn't want to be marooned in this dismal era, would you? 
Kyle shuddered. Of course not. But the laws seem so ridiculous. Not a bit, Broik said, warming up to the subject. It's very simple, really. Same principle that doesn't allow anyone to affect travel into the future. Look, I'm from 8,000. Say that I went into 12,000, where I memorized as much information as I could on some subjects such as medicine. So I returned to 8,000, retaining all such knowledge in my mind that's been learned in four periods. Therefore, I'd have knowledge that wasn't dreamed of in my own time, but was discovered sometime during the next four periods. But then it couldn't be discovered, because I'd brought it back to 8,000, and, well... I'm no logician, but you see my point. Oh, it's reasonable, I suppose, Kyle admitted. I realize the laws are really for our own good. By the way, I'm here on a field trip to gather material for my thesis on advanced therapeutical psychology and its development in, since the 20th century. What phase of this era are you here to study? Uh, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you that, Broig said. It's of a rather secret nature, and... You mean we might violate a law and be stuck here for good, is that it? Yes, in a way. Frightened, Kyle let the matter drop. His gaze wandered through the coach, examining the other passengers with interest. As time travelers from different space-time planes from their 20th century ancestors, he and Broik were naturally invisible to the fellow travelers. Two pompous old gentlemen were lighting cigars, and Kyle was about to remark on the habit of smoking when he noticed an even more remarkable phenomenon. A few seats ahead of them sat a good-looking young couple, oblivious to others about them. Look, Kyle cried excitedly. Lovers! Honeymooners! I've read about such things. Isn't it disgusting? Oh, I don't know, Broig said a little wistfully. I sometimes think it was a mistake for Center to do away with sex. It must have been interesting. <sighs> Atavist, Kyle snapped in horror. Had his people's emotional makeup provided for blushing, Kyle would have undoubtedly have turned beet red. Broik's words had caused him acute embarrassment. As he sat reflecting upon his strange companion, he suddenly began to feel a sensation he had often heard about, but never before had experienced. Terror and dismay filled him, as he sought to throw off the probing finger that was penetrating his mind. He looked at Broik. There was the faintest notion of a smile on the other's face as he said, Yes, Kyle, I am a telepath. Kyle's mind reeled. He felt himself on the brink of some gigantic abyss, and then, as suddenly as it had come, the searching sensation faded away. Since you are unable to enter my mind, Broik said calmly, it's only fair that I tell you about myself. You were right. I'm an atavist. Even in period 8000, such things can happen. Always such creatures are destroyed after their first psychotests. But my case was different. The controller who bred me was only a dabbler in such things. I was a failure, but he took a fancy to me. I was allowed to mature secretly. Few people knew of my existence. When I reached my majority, my presence became dangerous, and I was sent back into time to try and find the proper place for myself. And I think I found it. Here. Kyle was a very amazed young man. But such a barbarous age, he complained. Sex and atom bombs and everything. Remember, Broik smiled. These people are the forebears of the geniuses who created Center and the Galactic Empire. They'll survive despite their barbarism. The existence of Center is proof. It's rather horrible to contemplate, Kyle said thoughtfully, calmer now. And yet this might really be a great age. In a way, I almost envy you. Of course you do, Broig said. You have certain tendencies. They bother you, although you manage to hide them well. I discovered them when I took the liberty of telepathing you. Artificial genetics isn't perfect even in our time, perhaps because we originally sprang from man. Perhaps we'll never be quite perfect because of that, 
even after thousands of periods of breeding. Kyle took another look at the loving young couple. It, it might be fun after all, Roy laughed. You needn't envy me at all, you know, Kyle frowned. I'm telling you about myself, Roy went on. I have also told you of a specific condition existing a period ahead of your own time. Remember the first law? Center. We're marooned in the 20th century. You have to accept it. But what will we do? Kyle's mind was reeling again. Since we've already broken the first law, Boyk said, we may as well just break the second. No tech traveler may enter the body of a native of a foreign space-time. The young lovers kissed again, and this time there seemed to be an added zest, even to their passionate embrace. End of Field Trip by Jean Hunter The Obedient Servant by S. M. Tanishaw This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. John Gardner made up his mind to buy his wife a very unusual present, one she could not resist. So he asked the salesman to show him The Obedient Servant by S. M. Tenishaw. They quarreled at breakfast. This was not strange because they quarreled often, but it bothered him after he'd called for his car and was on his way to his office, he realized she was the only one left. The realization came suddenly, and now he was frightened. This strange man who needed friends, as a spider needs flies, in order to survive. His wealth had drawn them, of course, a fact he refused to believe. But even unlimited resources could not hold them and insult and abuse drove them all finally away. Yet he continued to insult and abuse, while painfully seeing them leave, because that was the kind of man he was. Until now they were all gone, the dear ones, the relatives, even the fawners, and he realized in panic that only Dolores was left. But she will stay. There is no cause to worry. She will stay because she loves me, because she married me. But he was nervous. He knew this quarrel had to be patched up because he had too much at stake. And knowing only one way to patch a quarrel, he frowned and pondered. A gift, of course. But what? She had everything. Another diamond necklace? Another ruby ring? Somehow he felt neither would do the trick this time. The quarrel had been very bitter. Then he remembered and smiled and told his chauffeur, There is a store I noticed in the International Building, Camus and Company. Stop off there. He marched into the richly decorated showroom and said, I'm John Gardner of Gardner Industries. I understand you've got something new. The clerk almost snapped his spine, bowing. John Gardner, Mr. Billions himself. If he could get him on the customer list, it would be a tremendous prestige boost. Indeed we have, sir. I imagine you're referring to our new unit. Domestic, too? I don't know what you call it, but it's the servant robot you people have spent millions publicizing. Will it actually do what you claim? Oh, yes, our advertising is underplay, if anything. You see, Mr. Gardner, robots have been found quite satisfactory for assembly work, manufacturing operations and the like, where they function merely as automatons. I know, Gardner said coolly. I use 700 of them in a small parts assembly. But only now has Kamas been able to individualize the robot and endow it with a real intelligence. The process involves a new sensitizer we develop. This device is motivated by a microwave control individualized to the unit itself. The result, Mr. Gardner, is basic intelligence 
and unswerving devotion. Each unit is, you talk too much, Gardner growled with his usual tact. Trot one of the things out and let me look it over. Certainly, sir, and the clerk scurried away, fearful of offending this powerful man. A few moments later, the drapes parted, and a robot walked into the room. Gardner scowled at it. He was disappointed. Rather tall, isn't it? The clerk, following close behind the robot, said, True, but its dimensions are the result of exhaustive scientific research. The height is nine feet three and one quarter inches. The arm span six feet two inches. The body and the appendages are well padded with our new vinyl live plasticine, almost a flesh equivalent. The hands, you will note, sir, are absolute masterpieces of human ingenuity. The unit can powder a rock or pick up a pin. Let me demonstrate. It's about time, Gardner growled. The demonstration was spectacular. The robot took a one-inch steel bar in its hands and formed a loop. It threaded an old-fashioned sewing needle. Then it picked up a fragile vase and moved it tenderly across the room. The clerk beamed with justifiable pride. Tell the gentleman your qualifications, Raymond. The robot looked at Gardner through two blue electronic eyes and said, I can perform any task a human servant can perform, and I will be more devoted and loyal than a human servant could possibly be. Your commands will be obeyed without question. Your wishes will always be fulfilled to the limit of my power. You and you alone will be my god. The salesman coughed apologetically. A little flowery, I'm afraid, but our advertising and sales engineers demanded it. Where does the voice come from? Another Comus innovation. An ultrasonic selector draws the words from a storage wire, attuned to, Enough chatter, I'll take one. The salesman beamed. Where would you like it delivered, sir? I'll take it with me. I plan it to be a surprise gift for my wife. The salesman's smile vanished. Then perhaps you could bring the lady here to our establishment? No, Gardner scowled. Why should I? As I was endeavoring to explain, sir, the units are, of necessity, completely individualized. The controlling factor is the electronic wavelength of the owner's brain. As you know, the frequency of every human brain varies. No two are alike. That is the key to the whole concept of domestic two. We... Will you quit babbling and get to the point? Gardner bellowed. Tell me, in simple words, why I can't take the robot with me. Because, sir, the clerk answered in a frightened voice, to be of any value to your wife, the unit will have to be keyed to her brain frequency. Gardner stopped the floor. Then you've wasted my time. We can't do business. My wife would never come down here. But the adjustment takes only a few minutes. We had a quarrel, you fool. She won't even unlock her bedroom door for me. The whole idea of this thing was something to surprise her out of her anger and to bring about a reconciliation. Gardner was striding toward the door. The clerk was frantic. This sale would have got him company recognition. In desperation, he hurried after Gardner. May I make a suggestion, sir? Gardner turned. All right, make it. It occurred to me that you might have the unit attuned to your own frequency, temporarily, that is. You could present it to the lady, then, at her leisure, she could call here and have the frequency changed to correspond to her own. Gardner scowled. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? How long does this adjustment take? Only a few minutes, the clerk said eagerly. If you will just step this way, sir. Come, Raymond. Raymond sat hunched behind the chauffeur, who was a trifle nervous. But the chauffeur hid his agitation because John Gardner paid well, 
and had been known to discharge chauffeurs who displeased him and leave them standing on the street corners without jobs. Gardner ordered him to turn and go back home. As they rode, Raymond stared straight ahead, a pleasant light glowing in his blue eyes. When the car stopped under the portico, Gardner said, Get out and open the door, Raymond. The robot said, Yes, master, and obeyed instantly. The chauffeur, shouldered by the robot, looked worried. Gardner noted this and enjoyed adding to the man's discomfort. Maybe they built one that will drive a car. In that case, I won't be needing you much longer. Inside, the robot gently lifted Gardner's coat from his shoulders, hung it in the closet, then returned to Gardner's side. Have you any further wishes, master? Aladdin's genie come true, Gardner thought, and amused himself for a few minutes, putting the robot through a series of grotesque duties. Amazing! Perhaps he would get one of these units for himself also. Then he turned his mind to Dolores. She was no doubt still in her room. But this new toy would make her forget their quarrel, all right. He visualized her laughing interest. He could already see her clapping her hands like the child she was, and rushing into his arms. Gardner turned to the robot. Raymond, go up the stairs and knock on the first door to your right. It is your mistress's room. Tell her I am waiting. Bring her to me. The robot nodded, and Gardner thought a look of adoration glowed in its eyes. It said, Yes, master, and moved toward the stairs. Gardner sat down. He smiled to himself, anticipating the reunion. It wasn't every wife whose husband could go out and buy her a thirty-thousand-dollar toy. There was a crash of rending wood. The sound chilled Gardner, froze him so that the angry scream that followed was anticlimax. But it brought movement back into his legs, and he lunged toward the stairs. He bellowed an order. Too late. The robot was already descending. It carried the dead body of Dolores in its steel arms. Her head hung limply on a horrible twisted neck. She refused to come, Aster, the robot said. The End of The Obedient Servant by S. M. Tenishaw Sound of Terror by Don Barry this is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Blakely. Sound of Terror by Don Barry. The day was still no more than a ragged streak of red in the east. The pre-dawn air was sharply cold, making Johnny Young Bear's face feel slightly brittle as he dressed quietly in the gray bedroom. He sat down on the bed pulling on his boots, and felt his wife stir sleepily beneath the covers. Suddenly, she stiffened, sat upright in the bed, startled into wakefulness. Johnny put one dark, bony hand on her white shoulder, gently reassuring. After a moment, finding herself, she turned away and lit a cigarette. Johnny finished pulling on his boots and stood, his hawk-like face unreadable in the cold gray light streaming through the huge picture window. Johnny, said his wife hesitantly, he murmured in acknowledgment, watching the bright flare of color as she drew on the cigarette. Her soft, dark hair was coiled loosely around her shoulders, very black against the pale skin. Her eyes were invisible in shadow, and Johnny could not read their expression. He turned away, knowing she was watching him. Be careful, she said simply. Try, he said. Then he shrugged. Not my day, anyway. I know, she said, but be careful. He left the house and walked out into the chill desert dawn. He turned his face to the brightness in the east, trying to catch a little warmth, but could not. He warmed up the jeep, listening to the engine grumble protest until it settled to a flat, banging roar. He swerved out of the driveway with the screaming of tires. 
Reaching the long ribbon of concrete that led out into the desert, he settled down hard on the accelerator, indifferent to the whining complaint of the jeep's motor. It was eight miles from his sprawling house to the Mesa Dry Lake launching site, due east into the sun. He pulled to the top of Six Mile Hill and stopped in the middle of the highway. Two miles ahead was launching base one, throwing long, sharp shadows at him in the rosy dawn light. A cluster of squat, gray block houses, a long runway tapering into the distance with an Air Force B-52 motionless at the near end. That was all, except the ship. The ship towered high, dominating the desert like a pinnacle of bright silver. Even silhouetted against the eastern sky, it sparkled and glistened, and passive it stood, graceful, seeming to strain into the sky, anxious to be off and gone. The loaded gantry was a dark, spidery framework beside the ship, leaning against it, drawing strength from its sleek beauty. Johnny watched it in silence for a moment, then turned his eyes up to the sky. Somewhere up there, a tiny satellite spun wildly about the Earth, a little silver ball in some celestial roulette wheel. Gradually, it would spiral closer and closer, caught by the planet's implacable grasp, until it flared brightly like a cigarette in the heavens before dissolving into drops of molten metal. But it would have served its purpose. In its short life, it would have given man knowledge, knowledge of space, knowledge enough that he could go himself, knowing what he would find at the emptiness between the earth and the moon, or knowing nearly. What's it like out there? The satellite answered partly. The ship would answer more. Johnny slammed the jeep into gear, hurtled down the other side of Six Mile Hill, through his mind ran the insistent repetition of an old song he knew, and he hummed it tunelessly through closed teeth. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. The jeep skidded to a halt beside control. Mitch Campbell's green station wagon was already there, creaking and settling as the motor cooled. Control was full of people. Air Force brass, technicians, observers, enlisted men of indiscernible purpose. The room hummed with the muted buzz of low, serious conversation. Mitch Campbell sat in one corner, apparently forgotten in the confusion. He had nothing to do. Not yet. He was already in flight dress, holding the massive helmet in his hands morosely, turning it over and over, staring at it as though he thought he might find his head inside if he looked carefully enough. "'Morning, Colonel,' said Johnny, forcing his voice to be casual and cheerful. "'You up early this morning.' "'Morning, Colonel, yourself,' said Mitch, looking up. "'Big date today? Well, yeah, you might say so,' Mitch said, smiling faintly with the obvious effort. "'Thought I might go once around lightly,' he said, hooking his thumb upwards. "'Upwards through the concrete ceiling, into the air, through the air, "'up where there was no air for a man to breathe. "'Once around lightly. "'Around the world, lightly. "'Tell you what, Mitch.' "'Okay, tell me what,' he said. "'You like the movies?' Johnny asked. "'You like to get a little adventure in your soul? "'You like a little vicarious thrill now and then?' "'Yeah, I like that. "'Tell you what, we'll go.' No, don't thank me. We'll go. Tonight. Eight o'clock. You come by. Wives and everybody? Mitch asked. Why not? Johnny said. They're cooped up in the house all day. They both knew the wives would be in control in an hour, listening to the radio chatter, waiting, eyes wide, shoulders stiff and tight. Fine, said Mitch. Fine. A crew chief came up and touched Johnny's shoulder. Colonel Young Bear, he said. Observation is going up. Johnny stood and looked out the tiny window at the red-painted B-52. See you tonight, Mitch. Eight o'clock? Don't forget. Westerns. See you, said Mitch. He looked back down at the helmet and was turning it over and over again when Johnny left. The observation B-52 climbed, screaming. Johnny lit a cigarette and watched out the port of the contrails rolling straight and white behind the jets. He sat by the radio man, a sergeant, ignoring the rest of the officers in the converted bomb bay. Hope he makes it, Colonel, said the sergeant. He'll make it, Johnny said flatly, irritated. Relenting, he added in a gentler tone. The pilot section breaks away. If he gets in serious trouble, he can dump it and ride the nose down, like a bird. He'll make it. There was a raucous buzz, and a squawk box said, On my mark, it will be zero minus four minutes. Mark! The voice of control, 35,000 feet below. The B-52 swung ponderously onto the base leg of its circle, and there was a creaking of stretching metal inside. Minus two minutes. 
Not my day, anyway, Johnny thought. He lit another cigarette. Control, said a new voice. This is Red Leader. Red Leader. Red Flight is in position. Rog, Red Leader, Control acknowledged. The observation flight of jet fighters was waiting to. Minus five, four, three, two, one. Mark. Silence. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. There was another rattle of the speaker, and Mitch's voice came through, grunting, heavy, as the acceleration of the ship laid a heavy hand on his chest. Acceleration? 8G? Controls respond? Silence. There he is, someone said. A wavering trail of smoke was barely visible below. A thread of white coming up fast, blown erratically by winds into distorted tiny snake. Altitude, said Mitch's voice. Forty thousand. Acceleration? Dropping. The white snake wriggled up to their level, rose above them. Johnny could not see the silver head. Altitude. Sixty-five thousand. I have a loud, very high buzz in my headphones. I'm going to... There, it's gone now. Went out of my range. His voice sounded wrong to Johnny, but he couldn't pin it down. Altitude. A hundred and five thousand. Beginning orbital correction. Beginning... Beginning... I can't... I'm... I'm... The voice became unintelligible. It was pitched very high, like a woman's, and it sounded as if his teeth were chattering. Mitch? Johnny pleaded softly. Mitch, baby? Dump it, boy. Come on home now. Dump it. There was no more for the speaker. A confused babble broke out in the bomb bay. The sergeant fiddled with his dials frantically, spinning across wavelengths, trying to find a word. The confusion ceased when the speaker rattled again, seeming hours later. Uh, hello, Control? This is Red 3. Do you read me? One of the fight or flight. Rog, Red 3, go ahead, came Control's voice from below. Uh, Control, I have a flash and smoke cloud on a bearing of 37 degrees. Red 3, what altitude? What altitude? None, said the fighter pilot. On the deck. After a moment, Johnny climbed unsteadily to his feet in the midst of a booming silence. He made his way back along the catwalk to the head, where he retched violently until the tears came to his eyes. Three weeks later, Johnny sat in Dr. Lambert's office. He watched the lean, graying psychologist turn off the tape recorder, watched him methodically tamp tobacco in his pipe. That's all she wrote, Johnny, said Lambert finally. That recording of Mitch's voice is just about all we have. The ship was under full power when it hit. There wasn't much left. Johnny looked absently out the window at the gleaming needle of Ship 2 besides the flimsy-looking gantry. Full power was a lot of power. The psychologist followed Johnny's eyes. Beautiful, he said, and the word brought to him Johnny's mind the wide-eyed pale face of Mitch's wife, staring at him. That ship is the best we can make her, Lambert said. Engineering is as certain as they can be that there was no structural failure in Ship 1. So, Johnny said, still staring at the ship. Even at this distance, he could almost believe he could see his own lean face reflected in the shiny metal. So we look somewhere else for the cause of failure, said Lambert. Where? said Johnny. He turned back, saw that the psychologist was putting a new reel on the tape recorder. The weak link in the control system, Lambert said. There weren't any. One. What? Mitch Campbell. Johnny stood angry. Mitch was good. Damn good. The psychologist looked up, and his eyes were tired. I know it, he said calmly. Listen to this. He started the machine playing the new tape. Johnny listened to it through. The voice that came out was high and wavering. It shook. It chattered. Words were undistinguishable. It was thin with tension, and it rang in Johnny's ears with unwanted familiarity. What's it sound like to you? Lambert asked when he had finished. Like Mitch's voice, Johnny admitted reluctantly. It did to me, too. What do you think that is? Don't know, said Johnny shortly. Might be a pilot whose plane is shaking apart. No. I don't know. Lambert sat back down behind his desk and sucked on his pipe stem. He regarded Johnny impassively, seeming to consider some problem remote from the room. Abruptly, he stood again and went to the window, watching the ant-like activity around the base of Ship 2. That was a madman's voice, he said. I made the recording while I was interning at a state institution. So? 
Mad with fear, Lambert said. Pure, simple, unadulterated. That was the sound of terror you heard, Johnny. Terror such as few humans have ever known. That man knew such fear he could not remain sane and live with it. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. You think, Mitch, you said yourself the voices were alike, Lambert pointed out. I don't believe it. Don't have to, said Lambert, turning from the window. But I'll tell you something, Johnny. That ship, he hooked his thumb out the window, is a very big toy. Maybe too big. Meaning? Meaning it's possible we've reached beyond man's limitations. Meaning it's possible we've built something too big for a man to handle and stay sane. Maybe we've finally gone too far. Maybe. I don't insist it's true, said the psychologist. It's an idea. Fear. Fear of the unknown, maybe. Too much for fear to hold. You think I'll crack? asked Johnny. The psychologist didn't answer directly. It's an idea, as I said. I just wanted you to think it over. I will, said Johnny. He stood again, his jaw held tight. Is that all? Yes, Colonel, that's all, said Lambert. When Johnny left, the psychologist sat in brooding silence, staring morosely at a trail of blue smoke rising from his pipe bowl. He sat there until the afternoon light faded from the desert base. Then he stood in the darkened office, sighed, lit his pipe, and went home. He was very tired. Six weeks later, Johnny Young Bear walked out of the control blockhouse into the cold desert morning, carrying his helmet under his arm. He ran his eyes swiftly up the length of ship two, trying to forget those other eyes staring at his back from the blockhouse. The ship rippled and gleamed, alive, eager, the thundering power in her belly waiting to be born. Oh, you bitch, you beautiful bitch, Johnny thought, pregnant with power like a goddess with a god's child. Bitch, bitch, bitch. I love you. I hate you. You kill me. The crew chief walked by his side. Nice morning, Colonel, he said. Very, said Johnny. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. For you, you beautiful bitch. Say something, Colonel, asked the crew chief. No. The song running through my head, he explained. Yeah, the other man chuckled. I know how it is. They strapped him into the paddock control chair. The controls arranged around him in a neat semicircle, easy to reach. This is my day. They left him, alone, once around lightly. The loneliness was in his belly, aching like a tumor. Read me, Control's voice in his earphones. Loud and clear, he said absently. Minus two minutes. Mark, a different voice. So many different voices. They knew him. They talked to him. But he was alone with his bitch. I had a true wife, but... Minus one minute. Mark, this is my day. I had a true wife. Three, two, one, Mark. There was the sound of the world dying in his mind. The sound of thunder. The sound of a sun splitting. The sound of a goddess giving birth. With pain, with agony, and loneliness. A giant's fist came from out of nothingness and smashed into his body. His chest was compressed. His face was flattened. He could not get enough air to breathe. The heavy sludge of acceleration crushed him back into the padded chair, inexorable, implacable, relentless, heavy. His vision clouded in red, and he thought he would die. Instead, he spoke into the lip mic, resenting it bitterly. Acceleration, 9G. He looked at the gauge that shimmered redly before him, disbelieving. Altitude, 20,000. He blacked out, sinking helplessly into the black push night of unawareness. I had a true... I had, I had, awakening to pain, he glanced at the gauges. He had been gone only a split second. Altitude 28,000. Acceleration pressure dropping. His face began to resume its normal shape as the acceleration dropped. 6G, he said, and his breathing was easier. The giant reluctantly began to withdraw his massive fist from Johnny's face. He tipped a lever, watched the artificial horizon tilt slightly. Air control surfaces respond, he said but soon there would be no air for the surfaces to move against, and then he would control by flicking the power that rumbled behind him. Altitude, 40,000. 85,000. 100,000. The sky was glistening black. He was passing from the Earth's envelope of air into the nothingness that was space. Now. Now. Now it was time to change angle. Flatten the ship out. Bring it into position to run around the Earth. Once around, lightly. There was a high-pitched scream in his earphones. He remembered it had been there for a long and wondered if he had told control. 
He flicked the switch that ignited the powerful steering rockets, and the whine grew louder, unbearably loud. It sang to him. His bitch sang. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. He began to feel light tingle over his body, tiny needles delicately jabbing every inch. His face became wooden, felt prickly. He tried to lick his lips and could feel no sensation there. His vision fogged again, and he knew it was not from acceleration this time. It was something else. Something else. What's it like out there? His belly told him. Fear. He reached out his hand to touch the control panel, and his arm did not respond. It was shaking, uncontrollably, and moved off to the right of where he wanted it to go. When he tried to correct, it swung too far to the left, waving as if it were alive. It hung there before him as in a dream oscillating back and forth. He could not control his body, and the realization nurtured the tiny seed of panic that lay heavily in his belly. Dump it. What did that mean? Dump it. Go home now, baby. I had a true decision. There was a decision he had to make, but he was too frightened to know what it was. He had been born in fear and lived in fear, and his body was full of it, quivering to the lover's touch of fear. Falling, darkness, the fear of dying, the unknown, the unimaginable always lurking just out of the corner of his eye. He wanted to scream, and the fear choked it off. His hands were at his sides, limply useless, dangling at the seat. He had to hang on to something. His hand found a projection at the side of the seat. He clutched it desperately. He knew he would fall, down, spiraling, weightless, off the cliff as in a dream, off the ladder, the tree. He was a child, and his toes were tingling as he stood too near the edge of the cliff, knowing he might fall. He clutched tightly, putting every ounce of his strength into holding on to the lever, the single solid reality in a world of shifting unreality. He was going to fall. He was falling. I love you. I hate you. I had a true wife. There was softness beneath his back, and he moved his hands, feeling the crispness of sheets. There was a low murmur of voices. He raised his hands to his eyes, and the voices stopped. There were heavy bandages on his eyes. Colonel, came a questing voice, and Johnny realized it was Dr. Lambert. Awake? I can't see. Why can't I see? You'll be all right. It's all right. What happened? How much do you remember? asked the voice. The blast off. Yes. Yes, I remember that. The orbit? The landing? No, he said. Not that. You did it, said the voice. You made it. This is my day. Once around lightly. Johnny, said the voice, I don't know just how to say this. We know what was wrong with ship one and why it killed Mitch. We know, hell, we don't even begin to realize what we have at our fingertips now. It's so big it's impossible to evaluate. What? I don't... Sound, Johnny. Sound. Or rather, vibration. It's something we're just beginning to learn about. We know a few things. We know you can boil water with sound if the frequency is high enough, and you can drill metal with it, and it does things to the human body. There are frequencies of sound which can act directly on human nerves, directly on the human brain. It means that if we know the right frequency, we'll be able to produce any state we want in a man, any emotion, fear, anguish, anything. When the steering rockets were cut in, the ship began to vibrate. It generated frequencies so high that ordinary human senses couldn't detect them, and when your nerves were exposed to those vibrations, it produced fear, pure and absolute fear. Motor control went, rational processes went, all the nervous functions of the body went out of control. Your body became a giant tuning fork, and the frequency to which it vibrated was fear. I can't remember. Sanity went too, Johnny, said the man softly. You could not stand that fear and remain sane, so something cut off. That was what happened to Mitch. How did I get back? We don't know. The films show your face suddenly going blank. Then you flew. That's all. We hoped you could tell us. No, no. I don't remember. There was something in you so strong it overrode everything else, even the fear. We'd like to know what it is. We'll find out, Johnny, and it will mean a lot to the human race when we do. This is my day. Is my wife here? There was a cool hand on his forehead. Yes, Johnny. Well, he said helplessly. Well, how are you? I'm fine, Johnny, she whispered, and there was the sound of tears in her voice. 
I'm just fine. He felt the warm softness of her lips on his. I had a true wife, but I left her. Oh, oh, oh. And then he came home again. End of Sound of Terror by Don Barry. Duel on Certis by Paul Anderson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Lawley Jones. Duel on Certis by Paul Anderson. Bold and ruthless, he was famed throughout the system as a big game hunter. From the fire drakes of Mercury to the ice crawlers of Pluto, he'd slain them all. But his trophy room lacked one item, and now Riordan swore he'd bagged the forbidden game that roamed the red deserts. A Martian. The knight whispered the message. Over the many miles of loneliness it was borne, carried on the wind, rustled by the half-sentient lichens and the dwarfed trees, murmured from one to another of the little creatures that huddled under crags, in caves, by shadowy dunes, in no words but in a dim pulsing of dread which echoed through Krieger's brain, the warning ran, They are hunting again. Krieger shuddered in a sudden blast of wind. The night was enormous around him, above him, from the iron bitterness of the hills to the wheeling, glittering constellations light years over his head. He reached out with his trembling perceptions, tuning himself to the brush and the wind and the small burrowing things underfoot, letting the night speak to him. Alone, alone, there was not another Martian for a hundred miles of emptiness. There were only tiny animals and the shivering brush and the thin, sad blowing of the wind. The voiceless scream of dying travelled through the brush, from plant to plant, echoed by the fear pulses of the animals and the ringing, reflecting cliffs. They were curling, shriveling and blackening as the rocket poured the glowing death down on them, and the withered veins and nerves cried to the stars. Krieger huddled against a tall, gaunt crag. His eyes were like yellow moons in the darkness, cold with terror and hate and a slowly gathering resolution. Grimly he estimated that the death was being sprayed in a circle some ten miles across, and he was trapped in it, and soon the hunter would come after him. He looked up to the indifferent glitter of the stars, and a shudder went along his body. Then he sat down and began to think. It had started a few days before, in the private office of the trader Wispy. "'I came to Mars,' said Riordan, "'to get me an owlie.' Wispy had learned the value of a poker face, and peered across the rim of his glass at the other man, estimating him. Even in godforsaken holes like Port Armstrong, one had heard of Riordan, heir to a million-dollar shipping firm which he himself had pyramided into a system-wide monster— he was equally well known as a big game hunter. From the fire drakes of Mercury to the ice crawlers of Pluto, he'd bagged them all. Except, of course, a Martian. That particular game was forbidden now. He sprawled in his chair, big and strong and ruthless. Still a young man. He dwarfed the unkempt room with his size and the hard-held dynamo strength in him, and his cold green gaze dominated the trader. It's illegal now, you know, said Wispy. It's a twenty-year sentence if you're caught at it. Bah! The Martian commissioner is at Ares, halfway round the planet. If we go at it right, who's ever to know? Riordan gulped at his drink. I'm well aware that in another year or so they'll have tightened up enough to make it impossible. This is the last chance for any man to get an owly. That's why I'm here. Wispy hesitated looking out the window. Port Armstrong was no more than a dusty huddle of domes, interconnected by tunnels, in a red waste of sand stretching to the near horizon. An earthman in an airsuit and a transparent helmet was walking down the street, and a couple of Martians were lounging against a wall. Otherwise, nothing. A silent, deadly monotony brooding under the shrunken sun. Life on Mars was not especially pleasant for a human. 
You're not falling into this owly loving that's corrupted all earth, demanded Riordan contemptuously. Oh, no, said Wispy. I keep them in their place around my post, but times are changing. It can't be helped. There was a time when they were slaves, said Riordan. Now these old women on earth want to give them the vote, he snorted. Well, times are changing, repeated Wispy mildly. When the first humans landed on Mars a hundred years ago, Earth had just gone through the hemispheric wars. The worst wars man had ever known. They damn near wrecked the old ideas of liberty and equality. People were suspicious and tough. They'd had to be, to survive. They weren't able to... to empathize the Martians, or whatever you call it. Not able to think of them as anything but intelligent animals. And Martians made such useful slaves... They need so little food or heat or oxygen, they can even live fifteen minutes or so without breathing at all. And the wild Martians made fine sport, intelligent game that could get away as often as not, or even manage to kill the hunter. I know, said Riordan. That's why I want to hunt one. It's no fun if the game doesn't have a chance. It's different now, went on Wispy. Earth has been at peace for a long time. The liberals have gotten the upper hand. Naturally, one of their first reforms was to end Martian slavery. Riordan swore. The forced repatriation of Martians working on his spaceships had cost him plenty. I haven't time for your philosophizing, he said. If you can arrange for me to get a Martian, I'll make it worth your while. How much worth it? asked Wisby. They haggled for a while before settling on a figure. Riordan had brought guns and a small rocket boat, but Wispy would have to supply radioactive material, a hawk, and a rock hound. Then he had to be paid for the risk of legal action. Though that was small, the final price came high. Now, where do I get my Martian? inquired Riordan. He gestured at the two in the street. Catch one of them and release him in the desert? It was Wispy's turn to be contemptuous. One of them? Ha! <laughs> town lounges. A city dweller from Earth would give you a better fight. The Martians didn't look impressive. They stood only some four feet high on skinny, claw-footed legs, and the arms, ending in bony, four-fingered hands, were stringy. The chests were broad and deep, but the waists were ridiculously narrow. They were viviparous, warm-blooded, and suckled their young, but grey feathers covered their hides. The round, hook-beaked heads with huge amber eyes and tufted feather ears showed the origin of the name Owly. They wore only pouched belts and carried sheath knives. Even the liberals of Earth weren't ready to allow the natives modern tools and weapons. There were too many old grudges. The Martians always were good fighters, said Riordan. They wiped out quite a few Earth settlements in the old days. The wild ones agreed Wisby, but not these. They're just stupid labourers, as dependent on our civilization as we are. You want a real old-timer, and I know where one's to be found. He spread a map on the desk. See, here, in the Hrafnian Hills, about a hundred miles from here. These Martians live a long time, maybe two centuries. And this fellow Krieger has been around since the first Earthmen came. He led a lot of Martian raids in the early days, but since the general amnesty and peace, he's lived all alone up there, in one of the old ruined towers. A real old-time warrior who hates Earthman's guts. He comes here once in a while with furs and minerals to trade, so I know a little about him. Wisby's eyes gleamed savagely. You'll be doing us all a favour by shooting the arrogant bastard. He struts around here as if the place belonged to him, and he'll give you a run for your money. Riordan's massive dark head nodded in satisfaction. The man had a bird and a rock hound. That was bad. Without them, Krieger could lose himself in the labyrinth of caves and canyons and scrubby thickets, but the hound could follow his scent, and the bird could spot him from above. To make matters worse, the man had landed near Krieger's tower. The weapons were all there, now he was cut off, unarmed and alone, save for what feeble help the desert life could give. Unless he could double back to the place somehow, but meanwhile he had to survive. 
He sat in a cave, looking down past a tortured wilderness of sand and bush and wind-carved rock, miles in the thin clear air to the glitter of metal where the rocket lay. The man was a tiny speck in the huge barren landscape, a lonely insect crawling under the deep blue sky. Even by day, the stars glistened in the tenuous atmosphere. Weak, pallid sunlight spilled over rocks, tawny and ochreous and rust-red, over the low, dusty thorn bushes and the gnarled little trees and the sand that blew faintly between them. Equatorial Mars Lonely or not, the man had a gun that could spang death clear to the horizon. And he had his beasts. And there would be a radio in the rocket boat for calling his fellows. And the glowing death ringed them in a charmed circle which Krieger could not cross without bringing a worse death on himself than the rifle could give. Or was there a worse death than that? to be shot by a monster and have his stuffed hide carried back as a trophy for fools to gape at? The old iron pride of his race rose in Krieger, hard and bitter and unrelenting. He didn't ask much of life these days, solitude in his tower to think the long thoughts of a Martian and create the small exquisite artworks which he loved. The company of his kind at the gathering season, grave, ancient ceremony, an acrid merriment, and the chance to beget and rear sons. An occasional trip to the earthling settling for the metal goods and the wine which were the only valuable things they had brought to Mars. A vague dream of raising his folk to a place where they could stand as equals before all the universe. No more. And now they would even take this from him. He rasped a curse on the human and resumed his patient work, chipping a spearhead for what puny help it could give him. The brush rustled dryly in alarm. Tiny hidden animals squeaked their terror. The desert shouted to him of the monster that strode toward his cave. But he didn't have to flee right away. Riordan sprayed the heavy metal isotope in a ten-mile circle around the old tower. He did that by night, just in case patrol craft might be snooping around. But once he had landed, he was safe. He could always claim to be peacefully exploring, hunting leapers or some such thing. The radioactive had a half-life of about four days, which meant that it would be unsafe to approach for some three weeks, two at the minimum. That was time enough, when the Martian was boxed in so small an area. There was no danger that he would try to cross it, the Owlies had learned what radioactivity meant back when they fought the humans, and their vision, extending well into the ultraviolet, made it directly visible to them through its fluorescence, to say nothing of the wholly unhuman extra senses they had. No, Krieger would try to hide, and perhaps to fight, and eventually he'd be cornered. Still, there was no use taking chances. Riordan set a timer on the boat's radio. If he didn't come back within two weeks to turn it off, it would emit a signal which Wispy would hear, and he'd be rescued. He checked his other equipment. He had an air suit designed for Martian conditions, with a small pump operated by a power beam from the boat to compress the atmosphere sufficiently for him to breathe it. The same unit recovered enough water from his breath so that the weight of supplies for several days was, in Martian gravity, not too great for him to bear. He had a forty-five rifle built to shoot in the Martian air that was heavy enough for his purposes. And, of course, compass and binoculars and sleeping bag. Pretty light equipment, but he preferred a minimum anyway. For ultimate emergencies, there was the little tank of suspensine. By turning a valve, he could release it into the air system. The gas didn't exactly induce suspended animation, but it paralysed efferent nerves and slowed the overall metabolism to a point where a man could live for weeks on one lungful of air. It was useful in surgery and had saved the life of more than one interplanetary explorer whose oxygen system went awry. But Riordan didn't expect to have to use it. He certainly hoped he wouldn't. It would be tedious to lie fully conscious for days, waiting for the automatic signal to call Wispy. He stepped out of the boat and locked it. No danger that the Owly would break in if he should double back. 
it would take Tordonite to crack that hull. He whistled to his animals. They were native beasts, long ago domesticated by the Martians and later by man. The rockhound was like a gaunt wolf, but huge-breasted and feathered, a tracker as good as any terrestrial bloodhound. The hawk had less resemblance to its counterpart of Earth. It was a bird of prey, but in the tenuous atmosphere it needed a six-foot wingspan to lift its small body. Riordan was pleased with their training. The hound bayed, a low, quavering note, which would have been muffled almost to inaudibility by the thin air and the man's plastic helmet had the suit not included microphones and amplifiers. It circled, sniffing, while the hawk rose into the alien sky. Riordan did not look closely at the tower. It was a crumbling stump atop a rusty hill, unhuman and grotesque. Once, perhaps ten thousand years ago, the Martians had had a civilization of sorts, cities and agriculture and a Neolithic technology. But according to their own traditions, they had achieved a union or symbiosis with the wildlife of the planet and had abandoned such mechanical aids as unnecessary. Riordan snorted. The hound bayed again. The noise seemed to hang eerily in the still cold air, to shiver from cliff to crag and die reluctantly under the enormous silence. But it was a bugle call, a haughty challenge to a world grown old. Stand aside, make way, here comes the conqueror. The animal suddenly loped forward. He had a scent. Riordan swung into a long, easy, low-gravity stride. His eyes gleamed like green ice. The hunt was begun. Breath sobbed in Krieger's lungs, hard and quick and raw. His legs felt weak and heavy, and the thudding of his heart seemed to shake his whole body. Still, he ran, while the frightful clamour rose behind him, and the padding of feet grew ever nearer. Leaping, twisting, bounding from crag to crag, sliding down shaly ravines and slipping through clumps of trees, Krieger fled. The hound was behind him, and the hawk soaring overhead. In a day and a night they had driven him to this, running like a crazed leaper with death baying at his heels. He had not imagined a human could move so fast or with such endurance. The desert fought for him. The plants with their queer, blind life that no earthling would ever understand were on his side. Their thorny branches twisted away as he darted through and then came back to rake the flanks of the hound, slow him. But they could not stop his brutal rush. He ripped past their strengthless clutching fingers and yammered on the trail of the Martian. The human was toiling a good mile behind, but showed no sign of tiring. Still, Krieger ran. He had to reach the cliff edge before the hunter saw him through his rifle sights. Had to, had to, and the hound was snarling a yard behind now. Up the long slope he went. The hawk fluttered, striking at him, seeking to lay beak and talons in his head. He battered at the creature with his spear and dodged around a tree. The tree snaked out a branch from which the hound rebounded, yelling till the rocks rang. The Martian burst onto the edge of the cliff. It fell sheer to the canyon floor, five hundred feet of iron-streaked rock tumbling into windy depths. Beyond the lowering sun glared in his eyes. He paused only an instant, etched black against the sky, a perfect shot if the human should come into view, and then he sprang over the edge. He had hoped the rockhound would go shooting past, but the animal braked itself barely in time. Krieger went down the cliff face, clawing into every tiny crevice, shuddering as the age-worn rock crumbled under his fingers. The hawk swept close, hacking at him and screaming for its master. He couldn't fight it, not with every finger and toe needed to hang against shattering death, but... He slid along the face of the precipice into a grey-green clump of vines, and his nerves thrilled forth the appeal of the ancient symbiosis. The hawk swooped again, and he lay unmoving, rigid as if dead, until it cried in shrill triumph and settled on his shoulder to pluck out his eyes. Then the vines stirred. They weren't strong, but their thorns sank into the flesh, and it couldn't pull loose. 
Krieger toiled on down into the canyon while the vines pulled the hawk apart. Riordan loomed hugely against the darkening sky. He fired once, twice, the bullets humming wickedly close. But as shadows swept up from the depths, the Martian was covered. The man turned up his speech amplifier, and his voice rolled and boomed monstrously through the gathering night. Thunder such as dry Mars had not heard for millennia. Score one for you, but it isn't enough. I'll find you. The sun slipped below the horizon, and night came down like a falling curtain. Through the darkness, Krieger heard the man laughing. The old rocks trembled with his laughter. Riordan was tired with the long chase and the niggling insufficiency of his oxygen supply. He wanted his smoke and hot food, and neither was to be had. Oh, well, he'd appreciate the luxuries of life all the more when he got home, with the Martian's skin. He grinned as he made camp. The little fellow was a worthwhile quarry, that was for damn sure. He'd held out for two days now, in a little ten-mile circle of ground, and he'd even killed the hawk. But Riordan was close enough to him now so that the hound could follow his spoor, for Mars had no water courses to break a trail, so it didn't matter. He lay watching the splendid night of stars. It would get cold before long, unmercifully cold. But his sleeping bag was a good enough insulator to keep him warm with the help of solar energy stored during the day by its gurgon cells. Mars was dark at night, its moons of little help. Phobos, a hurtling speck. Deimos, merely a bright star. Dark and cold and empty. The rock hound had burrowed into the loose sand nearby, but it would raise the alarm if the Martian should come sneaking near the camp. Not that that was likely. He'd have to find shelter somewhere, too, if he didn't want to freeze. The bushes and the trees and the little furtive animals whispered a word he could not hear chattered and gossiped on the wind about the Martian, who kept himself warm with work. But he didn't understand that language, which was no language. Drowsily, Riordan thought of past hunts. The big game of earth, lion and tiger and elephant and buffalo and sheep on the high sun-blazing peaks of the Rockies. Rain forests of Venus and the coughing roar of a many-legged swamp monster crashing through the trees to the place where he stood waiting. Primitive throb of drums in a hot, wet night, chant of beaters dancing round a fire, scrambled along the hell plains of Mercury with a swollen sun licking against his puny insulating suit, the grandeur and desolation of Neptune's liquid gas swamps and the huge, blind thing that screamed and blundered after him. But this was the loneliest and strangest and perhaps most dangerous hunt of all, and on that account the best. He had no malice towards the Martian. He respected the little being's courage as he respected the bravery of the other animals he had fought. Whatever trophy he brought home from this chase would be well earned. The fact that his success would have to be treated discreetly didn't matter. He hunted less for the glory of it, though he had to admit he didn't mind the publicity, than for the love. His ancestors had fought under one name or another, Viking, crusader, mercenary, rebel, patriot, whatever was fashionable at the moment. Struggle was in his blood, and in these degenerate days there was little to struggle against save what he hunted. Well, tomorrow. He drifted off to sleep. He woke in the short grey dawn, made a quick breakfast, and whistled his hound to heel. His nostrils dilated with excitement, a high, keen drunkenness that sang wonderfully within him. Today, maybe today. They had to take a roundabout way down into the canyon, and the hound cast about for an hour before he picked up the scent. Then the deep-voiced cry rose again, and they were off. More slowly now, for it was a cruel, stony trail. The sun climbed high as they worked along the ancient riverbed. Its pale, chill, washed, needle-sharp crags and fantastically painted cliffs, shale and sand and the wreck of geological ages. The low, harsh brush crunched under the man's feet, writhing and crackling its impotent protest. Otherwise, it was still, a deep and taut and somehow waiting stillness. The hound shattered the quiet with an eager yelp and plunged forward. 
Hot scent. Riordan dashed after him, trampling through dense bush, panting and swearing and grinning with excitement. Suddenly the brush opened underfoot. With a howl of dismay, the hound slid down the sloping wall of the pit it had covered. Riordan flung himself forward with a tigerish swiftness, flat down on his belly with one hand barely catching the animal's tail. The shock almost pulled him into the hole, too. He wrapped one arm around a bush that clawed at his helmet and pulled the hound back. Shaking, he peered into the trap. It had been well made, about twenty feet deep, with walls as straight and narrow as the sand would allow, and skillfully covered with brush. Planted in the bottom were three wicked-looking flint spears. Had he been a shade less quick in his reactions, he would have lost the hound and perhaps himself. He skinned his teeth in a wolf grin and looked around. The owly must have worked all night on it. Then he couldn't be far away, and he'd be very tired. As if to answer his thoughts, a boulder crashed down from the nearer cliff wall. It was a monster, but a falling object on Mars has less than half the acceleration it does on Earth. Riordan scrambled aside as it boomed onto the place where he had been lying. Come on! he yelled and plunged towards the cliff. For an instant, a grey form loomed over the edge, hurled a spear at him. Riordan snapped a shot at it and it vanished. The spear glanced off the tough fabric of his suit and he scrambled up a narrow ledge to the top of the precipice. The Martian was nowhere in sight, but a faint red trail led into the rugged hill country. Winged him, by God! The hound was slower in negotiating the shale-covered trail. His own feet were bleeding when he came up. Riordan cursed him and they set out again. They followed the trail for a mile or two, and then it ended. Riordan looked around the wilderness of trees and needles which blocked view in any direction. Obviously the owly had backtracked and climbed up one of those rocks from which he could take a flying leap to some other point. But which one? Sweat which he couldn't wipe off ran down the man's face and body. He itched intolerably and his lungs were raw from gasping at his dole of air. But still he laughed in gusty delight. What a chase! What a chase! Krieger lay in the shadow of a tall rock and shuddered with weariness. Beyond the shade, the sunlight danced in what to him was a blinding, intolerable dazzle, hot and cruel and life-hungry, hard and bright as the metal of the conquerors. It had been a mistake to spend priceless hours when he might have been resting working on that trap. It hadn't worked, and he might have known that it wouldn't. And now he was hungry, and thirst was like a wild beast in his mouth and throat, and still they followed him. They weren't far behind now. All this day they had been dogging him. He had never been more than half an hour ahead. No rest, no rest. A devil's hunt through a tormented wilderness of stone and sand, and now he could only wait for the battle with an iron burden of exhaustion laid on him. The wound in his side burned. It wasn't deep, but it had cost him blood and pain and the few minutes of catnapping he might have snatched. For a moment the warrior Krieger was gone, and a lonely, frightened infant sobbed in the desert silence. Why can't they let me alone? A low, dusty green bush rustled. A sand runner piped in one of the ravines. They were getting close. Wearily, Krieger scrambled up on top of the rock and crouched low. He had backtracked to it. They should, by rights, go past him towards his tower. He could see it from here, a low, yellow ruin worn by the winds of millennia. There had only been time to dart in, snatch a bow and a few arrows and an axe. Pitiful weapons. The arrows could not penetrate the earthman's suit when there was only a Martian's thin grasp to draw the bow, and even with a steel head the axe was a small and feeble thing. But it was all he had, he and his few little allies of a desert which fought only to keep its solitude. Repatriated slaves have told him of the earthlings' power. Their roaring machines filled the silence of their own deserts, gouged the quiet face of their own moon, shook the planets with a senseless fury of meaningless energy. 
they were the conquerors, and it never occurred to them that an ancient peace and stillness could be worth preserving. Well, he fitted an arrow to the string and crouched in the silent, flimmering sunlight, waiting. The hound came first, yelping and howling. Krieger drew the bow as far as he could, but the human had to come near first. There he came running and bounding over the rocks, rifle in hand and restless eyes shining with taut green light, closing in for the death. Krieger swung softly around. The beast was beyond the rock now, the earthman almost below it. The bow twanged. With a savage thrill, Krieger saw the arrow go through the hound, saw the creature leap in the air and then roll over and over, howling and biting at the thing in its breast. Like a grey thunderbolt, the Martian launched himself off the rock, down at the human. If his axe could shatter that helmet! He struck the man, and they went down together. Wildly, the Martian hewed. The axe glanced off the plastic. He hadn't had room for a swing. Riordan roared and lashed out with a fist. Retching, Krieger rolled backward. Riordan snapped a shot at him. Krieger turned and fled. The man got to one knee, sighting carefully on the grey form that streaked up the nearest slope. A little sand snake darted up the man's leg and wrapped about his wrist. Its small strength was just enough to pull the gun aside. The bullet screamed past Krieger's ear as he vanished into a cleft. He felt the thin death agony of the snake as the man pulled it loose and crushed it underfoot. Somewhat later, he heard a dull boom echoing between the hills. The man had gotten explosives from his boat and blown up the tower. He had lost axe and bow. Now he was utterly weaponless, without even a place to retire for a last stand. And the hunter would not give up. Even without his animals, he would follow more slowly, but as relentlessly as before. Krieger collapsed on a shelf of rock. Dry sobbing racked his thin body, and the sunset wind cried with him. Presently, he looked up, across a red and yellow immensity, to the low sun. Long shadows were creeping over the land, peace and stillness for a brief moment before the iron cold of night closed down. Somewhere, the soft trill of a sand runner echoed between low, wind-worn cliffs, and the brush began to speak, whispering back and forth in its ancient, wordless tongue. The desert... The planet and its wind and sand under the high cold stars, the clean, open land of silence and loneliness and a destiny which was not man's, spoke to him. The enormous oneness of life on Mars, drawn together against the cruel environment, stirred in his blood. As the sun went down and the stars blossomed forth in awesome, frosty glory, Krieger began to think again. He did not hate his persecutor, but the grimness of Mars was in him. He fought the war of all which was old and primitive and lost in its own dreams against the alien and the desecrator. It was an ancient and pitiless as life, that war, and each battle won or lost meant something, even if no one ever heard of it. "'You do not fight alone,' whispered the desert. "'You fight for all Mars, and we are with you.' Something moved in the darkness, a tiny warm form running across his hand, a little feathered mouse-like thing that burrowed under the sand and lived its small, fugitive life and was glad in its own way of living. But it was part of a world, and Mars has no pity in its voice. Still, a tenderness was within Krieger's heart, and he whispered gently in the language that was not a language. "'You will do this for us?' You will do it, little brother? Riordan was too tired to sleep well. He had lain awake for a long time, thinking, and that is not good for a man alone in the Martian hills. So now the rockhound was dead too. It didn't matter, the owly wouldn't escape. But somehow the incident brought home to him the immensity and the age and the loneliness of the desert. It whispered to him, the brush rustled and something wailed in darkness, and the wind blew with a wild, mournful sound over faintly starlit cliffs, and it was as if they all somehow had voice, as if the whole world muttered and threatened him in the night. Dimly, he wondered if man would ever subdue Mars, if the human race had not finally run across something bigger than itself. 
But that was nonsense. Mars was old and worn out and barren, dreaming itself into slow death. The tramp of human feet, shouts of men, and roar of sky-storming rockets were waking it, but to a new destiny, to man's. When Ares lifted its hard spires above the hills of Sirtis, where then were the ancient gods of Mars? It was cold, and the cold deepened as the night wore on. The stars were fire and ice, glittering diamonds in the deep crystal dark. Now and then he could hear a faint snapping borne through the earth as rock or tree split open. The wind laid itself to rest, sound froze to death, there was only the hard, clear starlight falling through space to shatter on the ground. Once something stirred. He woke from a restless sleep and saw a small thing skittering toward him. He groped for the rifle beside his sleeping bag, then laughed harshly. It was only a sand mouse. But it proved that the Martian had no chance of sneaking up on him while he rested. He didn't laugh again. The sound had echoed too hollowly in his helmet. With the clear bitter dawn, he was up. He wanted to get the hunt over with. He was dirty and unshaven inside the unit. Sick of iron rations, pushed through the airlock, stiff and sore with exertion. Lacking the hound, which he'd had to shoot, tracking would be slow, but he didn't want to go back to Port Armstrong for another. No, hell take that Martian. He'd have the devil's skin soon. Breakfast and a little moving made him feel better. He looked with a practiced eye for the Martian's trail. There was sand and brush over everything. Even the rocks had a thin coating of their own erosion. The owlie couldn't cover his tracks perfectly. If he tried, it would slow him too much. Riordan fell into a steady jog. Noon found him on higher ground, rough hills with gaunt needles of rock reaching yards into the sky. He kept going, confident of his own ability to wear down the quarry. He'd run deer to earth back home, day after day, until the animal's heart broke, and it waited, quivering for him to come. The trail looked clear and fresh now. He tensed with the knowledge that the Martian couldn't be far away. Too clear. Could this be bait for another trap? He hefted the rifle and proceeded more warily. But no, there wouldn't have been time. He mounted a high ridge and looked over the grim, fantastic landscape. Near the horizon, he saw a blackened strip, the border of his radioactive barrier. The Martian couldn't go further, and if he doubled back, Riordan would have an excellent chance of spotting him. He turned up his speaker and let his voice roar into the stillness. Come out, Owley! I'm going to get you. You might as well come out now and be done with it. The echoes took it up, flying back and forth between the naked crags, trembling and shivering, under the brassy arch of the sky. Come out, come out, come out. The Martian seemed to appear from thin air, a grey ghost rising out of the jumbled stones and standing poised not twenty feet away. For an instant, the shock of it was too much. Riordan gaped in disbelief. Krieger waited, quivering ever so faintly, as if he were a mirage. Then the man shouted and lifted his rifle. Still, the Martian stood there as if carved in grey stone, and with a shock of disappointment, Riordan thought that he had, after all, decided to give himself to an inevitable death. Well, it had been a good hunt. So long, whispered Riordan, and squeezed the trigger. Since the sandmouse had crawled into the barrel, the gun exploded. Riordan heard the roar and saw the barrel peel open like a rotten banana. He wasn't hurt, but as he staggered back from the shock, Krieger lunged at him. The Martian was four feet tall and skinny and weaponless, but he hit the earthling like a small tornado. His legs wrapped around the man's waist and his hands got to work on the air hose. Riordan went down under the impact. He snarled tigerishly and fastened his hands on the Martian's narrow throat. Krieger snapped futilely at him with his beak. They rolled over in a cloud of dust. The brush began to chatter excitedly. Riordan tried to break Krieger's neck. The Martian twisted away, bored in again. With a shock of horror, the man heard the hiss of escaping air as Krieger's beak and fingers finally worried the air hose loose. An automatic valve clamped shut, but there was no connection with the pump now. Riordan cursed and got his hands about the Martian's throat again. 
Then he simply lay there, squeezing, and not all Krieger's writhing and twistings could break the grip. Riordan smiled sleepily and held his hands in place. After five minutes or so, Krieger was still. Riordan kept right on throttling him for another five minutes, just to make sure. Then he let go and fumbled at his back, trying to reach the pump. The air in his suit was hot and foul. He couldn't quite reach around to connect the hose to the pump. Poor design, he thought vaguely. But then, these air suits weren't meant for battle armor. He looked at the slight, silent form of the Martian. A faint breeze ruffled the grey feathers. What a fighter the little guy had been. He'd be the pride of the trophy room back on Earth. Let's see now. He unrolled his sleeping bag and spread it carefully out. He'd never make it to the rocket with what air he had, so it was necessary to let the suspensine into his suit. But he'd have to get inside the bag, lest the knights freeze his blood solid. He crawled in, fastening the flaps carefully, and opened the valve on the suspensine tank. Luckily, he had it, but then a good hunter thinks of everything. He'd get awfully bored, lying there till Wispy caught the signal in ten days or so and came to find him, but he'd last. It would be an experience to remember. In this dry air, the Martian skin would keep perfectly well. He felt the paralysis creep up on him, the waning of heartbeat and lung action. His senses and mind were still alive, and he grew aware that complete relaxation has its unpleasant aspects. Oh well, he'd won. He'd killed the wiliest game with his own hands. Presently, Krieger sat up. He felt himself gingerly. There seemed to be a rib broken. Well, that could be fixed. He was still alive. He'd been choked for a good ten minutes, but a Martian can last fifteen without air. He opened the sleeping bag and got Riordan's keys. Then he limped slowly back to the rocket. A day or two of experimentation taught him how to fly it. He'd go to his kinsman near Sirtis. Now that they had an earthly machine and earthly weapons to copy. But there was other business first. He didn't hate Riordan, but Mars is a hard world. He went back and dragged the earthling into a cave and hid him beyond all possibility of human search parties finding him. For a while, he looked into the man's eyes. Horror stared dumbly back at him. He spoke slowly in halting English. For those you killed and for being a stranger on a world that does not want you, and against the day when Mars is free, I leave you. Before departing, he got several oxygen tanks from the boat and hooked them into the man's air supply. That was quite a bit of air for one in suspended animation. Enough to keep him alive for a thousand years. End of Duel on Certis by Paul Anderson Recording by Paul Lawley-Jones Mystery at Mesa Flat by Ivar Jorgensen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman a small desert town didn't seem a likely place to encounter murder, especially one that had been planned on a world light years away. Mystery at Mesa Flat by Ivar Jorgensen The murder was committed ten minutes before the Octaran ship lifted for the long trip back to Mother Planet. It was discovered ten minutes after blastoff. The killer a great lout of an upper hill man, signed on at the last moment to fill a sudden vacancy, bragged of the killing to his sergeant. Bragged grinning. He was crouching behind a rock peeking out at the ship. I came behind him, very quiet. I broke his neck and... and did other things. He never knew what happened. The guard was rushed immediately before the commander, into the dread presence. The commander's eyes were terrible, but his voice remained soft. You know by what a slim thread our invasion plan hangs? Yes, commander. 
You know that utter secrecy has been our key from the start. Yes, Commander. I just wanted to make sure before I execute you, in the name of the Supreme Octarian Council. Yes, Commander. The Commander drew his gun and aimed accurately. The guard died bravely. And that was that. But there was worry. The Commander consulted the second. It would be wise to return. The second calculated the time. It would be high noon back there before we could set down. We could wait for darkness. True. But fifteen hours of daylight would have elapsed. It is a lonely place. But if a trap were set, the second considered. When the body is discovered, what will it reveal? Nothing definite. No chain of logic could point to us. The commander frowned. But success depends so completely upon secrecy. If the experiment is successful, it will be, sir. I hope so. Hold your course for home. The body of Max Stiles was found at two o'clock that afternoon by Tom Brazer and Frank Brooks in a secluded spot on the Arizona desert. After he hadn't reported in, they had gone out in a jeep to check up. They saw a Max jeep nosing up out of a pocket as though peering at a white alkali flat just beyond. They rounded the pocket and found Mac, and both of them got suddenly sick and strove to hide their shock from each other. Brazier said, Jesus! The word was both a curse and a prayer. What could have hit him? Look at his legs! Broken, mangled, like through a machine! A gorilla could do that. Brazier forebode the obvious retort and walked out into the alkali flat. He stopped in its center and turned slowly, his eyes searching. He found nothing. He went to the edge of the flat and began circling it slowly. In four places there were marks in the dust. The marks formed the four corners of a huge square. Something might have sat down there, but you couldn't be sure. Probably dust marks left by the swirling dust devils that danced across the desert like miniature cyclones. There's a town out there. Tom Brazier looked up quickly. Frank Brooks had come to stand by his side and was pointing off through the declivity in the rocks. Damned if there isn't. Ever seen it before? I think so. Isn't it the same town that lies about two miles off the Notch Butte Road? The direction's about right. Uh-huh. They were security men from the camp forty miles southwest. Brazier the senior gave the orders. As they started back toward the jeep, he said, Call in and make the report. We aren't waiting? No, we'll move on to the town. But we looked it over a week ago. Brazier frowned. I know, but... But what? There's something funny about that town. Something wrong. I can't see anything wrong with it. Tom Brazier's eyes were vague. I had it checked. This surprised Brooks. You didn't mention it before. No, nothing to mention, really. Something I can't put my finger on. Looks like a pretty old settlement. It is. It began as a mining town in 1890. Some silver veins out in the hills. They ran out, though, and the place became a ghost town shortly afterward. A short life and a happy one. Short, anyhow. After the silver piddled out, they all left except one or two old sand fleas. Since then... It became a stopover place for casuals. But there must be forty or fifty people there now. Where did they come from? Drifted in in the last few years, I suppose. If you have any suspicions, we ought to check, even if they can't be from outer space. I took a spot check, Brazier said grimly. 
The old coot who runs the hotel came originally from El Paso. A couple of old uranium hunters rang true to background. There was a pause as they climbed the slope. Then Brazier's frown deepened. But it isn't the people. They're not what bothers me. Then what? Brazier's voice was sharp. I don't know, damn it. Brooks was surprised. All right, all right. Don't bite me about it. I'll send the message. They were silent as Brooks turned the jeep and nosed it over the broken country toward the village. Silent, but each occupied with his own grim thoughts. Thoughts which concerned things the nation had not been told, that the flying saucer joke was no longer that, but a very serious matter. Certain facts had come to light, and had been discussed in high-level conference, and they added up to a good reason to panic. Creatures from outer space were hovering over the planet. They were hostile, and they wanted to take Earth over. All the revelations were not catastrophic, however, if considered comparatively. Fortunately, the aliens, while advanced and of superior intelligence, had physical characteristics which set them apart. They could not put down and lose themselves among the planet's population. Also, they did not appear able to overwhelm with superior weapons. Still, they were vicious, crafty, and their coming could mean the end of Terran freedom. Brooks rolled the jeep past the tiled sign reading Mesa Flat, Population 21. The lettering, very old, was almost obliterated. Another ancient sign, hanging over one of the false fronts, said, Elkhorn Hotel. Brooks pulled up, and the two security men climbed out. Two ancient desert specimens sat in tilt-back chairs on the porch. One of them stirred enough ambition to turn his head. The other went on chewing tobacco and stared out across the desert. Inside, an equally leather-faced oldster presided behind the desk. He said, Howdy, men, and extended a battered pencil across the register. Tom Brazier signed. Frank Brooks looked about, trying to find something wrong. Failing in this, he tried to conjure up the uneasy feeling that something might be wrong. He failed again. He said, How long have you been running this place, Pop? Nigh on to ten years now, and the name's Frank Sibley, son. Never did get me a wife, so of course ain't nobody's Pop. Frank Brooks grinned. But, as there was no rancor in the oldster's tone, he didn't apologize. "'How is the food in the restaurant?' Tom Brazier asked. "'Fair to middlin'. Frijoles and beans. Ain't nobody can spoil frijoles and beans.' "'That's what you think,' Brooks said. "'Stayin' long?' "'A couple of days, maybe,' Brazier told him. "'Though we might scout the hills. If the area looks right, we might bring in some small uranium equipment. Good luck. Your room's at the head of the stairs, second door on the right. Thanks. They went out and moved slowly down the street. There were people, but they seemed used to strangers. There were desert-worn women, sun-blackened children, leather-faced men. The two security men had been silent. Now Frank Brooks spoke suddenly. If you're thinking about quizzlings or traitors, Tom, it just doesn't make sense. These people aren't intelligent enough. An invader would have to go where... I'm not thinking about that. Let's eat. They went into the restaurant and were served by a fat woman who waddled back and forth from the kitchen, wedging herself through the doorway each time. The food was acceptable, exactly what could be expected in a place like this. Outside again, Tom Brazier stopped suddenly in the middle of the hot street. "'What's wrong?' Brooks added. "'Damn it! Damn it all to hell! I don't know, and I should know. 
I came back here to find out, and I still know something's wrong, but I can't spot it. Frank Brooks was concerned. Tom, are you sure you're not just all tightened up about this whole deal? No, I'm not. Look here. Don't you ever go through a place and remember it later as being, well, not quite right? Something you missed, maybe? I'm afraid I'm not the sensitive type, but I get what you mean. Then again, though, it might be an illusion of some kind. You might have the place mixed up subconsciously with another place of this kind you've seen. Maybe let's take a walk around the whole town, look at it from all the angles. They walked. They climbed into the jeep and rode the slopes and the arroyos. No one paid any attention to them. No one bothered them. They spent the day and returned to town and ate again in the bleak little restaurant. The same woman pushed endlessly through the too narrow doorway. When they went to their room, the lamp cast such an unsatisfactory light that they put it out and went to bed. This arrangement satisfied Frank Brooks completely. He was bone-tired and sound asleep as soon as he hit the bed. But not for long. He was awakened almost immediately, it seemed, by a prodding hand. He rolled over. What's the matter? I've got it. You've got what? Tom Brazer did not appear to hear him. Brazer stood tensely beside the bed, holding a lighted lamp. His eyes were bright and hard. They couldn't have been left here alone without any kind of guidance, some means of command. There has to be something. Get your clothes on. Brooks was out of bed, dragging up his pants. Okay, okay. If you're going nuts, I might as well go with you. But what the hell will we be looking for? I don't know. Some kind of machine, maybe. They were in the hall, moving quietly through the darkness. Anything like that would probably be in the cellar or basement somewhere, wouldn't it? You'd think so. Under the biggest building, I imagine. That's right here, the hotel. Let's look for a door. They hunted quietly, making the sparsest use of the pocket flashes they carried clipped to their breast pockets. But they found no cellar door, no basement entrance, and ascertained, finally, that the building stood on solid ground. We have to check the other ones, Fraser said. They found what they were looking for, under the restaurant. They broke in through the back door and found a trap beneath the counter. Brazer lifted it. A soft blue glow lit the narrow stairway, and they went downward into a steel-walled room, in the center of which stood a shining machine. Though inanimate, the bright metal monster seemed to possess a life force. Electrical impulses chuckled and muttered behind the glowing bulbs and dials that created mysterious profiles on its surface. "'Well, I'll be damned,' Frank Brooks muttered. "'You figured it was here. We looked for it and found it. Now what I want to know is—' "'We've got to make a report. Let's just hope we get out of here alive.' Brooks felt no great concern on this score. He was sure they had not been seen. He closed the trap and followed Tom Brazer out the back door and stopped short. They were all there, the inhabitants of Mesa Flat, the young, the old, the men, and the women. They stood in a quiet semicircle around the rear of the building. There was no indignation upon their faces, no anger in the group. No fury in the desert town. Only a silence that chilled Frank Brooks. Quiet, set faces, bodies that began to move slowly forward, tightening the semicircle. Frank Brooks saw Tom Blazer's hand go under his coat, and Brooks still couldn't believe it. Not shoot them down. Brazer fired point-blank at the nearest man. 
In a seeming daze, Frank Brooks stared. Two slugs dead set her in the chest, but the man came on. Shuddered slightly from the impact, but came on. Then Brazer was bellowing, For Christ's sake, don't stand there, defend yourself! And Frank Brooks came out of his daze, and was also firing, at people who kept coming on, until it was all nothing but a nightmare. Brazer's target was now reaching forth a pair of steady arms, reaching with hands that would grip and kill. Razor fired desperately. They've got to be vulnerable somewhere, he yelled, somewhere you wouldn't expect. He found the spot by chance. A desert rat's hands were upon him when his gun exploded for what would have been the last time. The slug went downward. The desert rat stopped, then crumpled slowly to the ground. The left side, cried Brazer. That's where the control is. Shoot for their left hip. Brooks stopped the fat woman from the restaurant as her hands tightened on his throat. He shook his head to clear his brain and found Brazer had blasted a path through the solid mass in front. Run, Brazer shouted. And hell with the jeep. Just run. They ran. They dissected one of the bodies at the camp, standing around in a silent group, stunned by the complete reality of the thing. It even has a kind of blood, the commanding officer said. The analysis will be interesting. Frank Brooks pointed at the body. That's not actually flesh, not skin or bones. Yes and no, the commanding officer said. They're synthetics but possibly as good as our own. Putting the control unit in the leg was a master touch, Tom Brazier said. The commanding officer, noting the tight faces about him, laid down his scalpel and said, This throws a grave light on the situation, of course, but it isn't as bad as it seems. In fact, the discovery turns the tide in our favor. Obviously, they came down some years ago and did away with the residents of Mesa Flat, when there was probably only a handful of people in the village. These they recreated in the form of androids, through a process we are not familiar with, and then began adding to the population by feeding in more androids. Maybe there were more than just a few natives in the beginning, because our spot check caught four authentic backgrounds. But if they created human beings, Frank Brooks said, the main thing is they evidently cannot destroy us by frontal assault. This is an attempt at infiltration. Obviously, the project is in its experimental stage, and knowing what to look for, we can take it from here. The commanding officer smiled at Frank Brooks and Tom Brazier. Good work, you two. But I had nothing to do with it, sir, Frank Brooks said. The meetings adjourned. Outside, Frank Brooks turned to his partner. I had no right to any of the credit. Why didn't you let me say it? You said it, Fraser grinned. Besides, it was a team job. Like hell, I don't even know what tipped you off. You had no reason to jump out of bed in the middle of the night and go hunting for the machine. Or did you? Remember when I said there was something wrong with that town? I remember, but... Figure it out. The original life of the town was only a few months, so up to that time it had a right to be without one. Without one what? But a continuous population for ten years... It certainly should have had one. One what, damn it? A graveyard. Brooks' mouth dropped open. Say, that's right. There wasn't a tombstone anywhere around. Tom Brazer was grinning. So these super-intelligent aliens defeated themselves by being too meticulously careful. They destroyed the bodies of the natives they killed and tripped themselves up when all they had to do to really camouflage the layout 
was to bury them. They ought to give you a medal, man, Frank Brooks said fervently. I'll settle for a cup of coffee. Come on. The End of Mystery at Mesa Flat by Ivar Jorgensen